So, in our uh, last session, we started with section 9. In section 9, we completed section 9, 4 and 9, 5. 9, 4, promoter or builder who is making invert supply from an unregistered person. And 9, 5, supply of notified services through an e-commerce operator. Liability to pay GST is on e-commerce operator. Now, we are going to discuss 9, subsection 3. That is, there are some list of services so, which are notified under notification number 13 of 2017 with respect to those notified services, notified goods we do not have per syllabus, notified services only we have with respect to those notified services under notification 13 2017, liability to pay GST is on recipient that is 9 subsection 3. So, whenever we are referring to 9 subsection 3, we need to give a reference of one notification. What is that notification number? 13 of 2017, just write down there, notification number 13 of 2017. So, therefore, whenever you are giving the justification as per section 9 subsection 3, read with notification number 13 2017, like that we need to write, okay. Now, so there are total like uh, Sir CG got salads, like these are the list of services. With respect to this list of services, liability to pay GST is on the recipient. Now, first we need to remember what is the service, who is the supplier, who is the recipient and what are the conditions for RCM. Thereafter, after completing this, then we will link it with the exemptions. Okay? So, first we are seeing what are the list of notified services under RCM. First one is security lending services. Security lending service who is the supplier of service, lender of securities and who is the recipient of service, borrower of securities. Say for example, I am lending the securities to you and you are borrowing the securities. So, how this lending and borrowing happens? This will happen through stock exchange. Okay? So, intermediary stock exchange through stock exchange. Directly you will not know me, I will not know you. But this, this particular transaction will happen through a stock exchange. So, therefore, why you will be borrowing the securities, maybe you will place a sale order and the order gets executed and you need to deliver the shares. If you are not delivering the shares, then you will have a huge penalty. You place the sale order, but you do not have those shares in your DMAT account. So, now you need to definitely deliver that shares. For the sake of that, you will temporarily borrow the shares from me and you will complete the delivery and once the delivery is completed, at a later point of time, you will place the buy order you will buy those shares and you will replace those shares. Just like, uh, you know, I have some commodities, you are taking the commodity on rent and you are returning that commodity, just like that only, okay. So, in case of this borrowal, so you have to pay me a lending fee. On that lending fee, I will not pay GST, you will pay GST under RCM. You understood the first service? What is the first service, Pa? Security lending services. Who is the supplier, lender of securities? Who is the recipient? Borrower of securities. Borrower of securities will pay a lending fee. On that lending fee, GST payable under RCM. Is there any conditions for this RCM? No. That's it. This much only you need to remember for the first transaction. Done? Then second transaction. Second transaction is import of services. All these list of services are with a keyword. So, sir, S-I-R-R, C-G, got salads. In that yes, we completed. What is yes? Security lending services. I for import of services. Import of services. So, who is the supplier? A person located outside India. Who is the recipient? A person located in India. And liability to pay GST is on the person located in India. Is there any conditions for RCM? No, we do not have any conditions for RCM. Is there any non-applicability of RCM? Yes. In one case, import of service will not come under RCM. It will come under FCM. That is, import of OIDAR services. OIDAR means online information database access and retrieval services is known as OIDAR services, which means a service which is mediated through internet and it is automated is known as OIDAR services. Example, you are streaming in OTT platforms, OTT, lot of OTT platforms are there today. So, Z5 or Hotstar or Amazon Prime, Netflix like this, these OTT platforms and all will come under OIDR services. 
Why? Because is it mediated through internet? Without internet, can we watch? No. And it is automated. Anytime we can watch. So, therefore, that will come under OIDR service. Suppose if I am taking online live classes, will it come under OIDR service? No. It will not come under OIDR. Why? Even though it requires internet, but so it is not automated. If I am not there, you will not be able to attend the class. So, therefore, it is not OIDR. Suppose if it is recorded classes, if I put in my app and if you watch it online, so then will it come under OIDR service? Yes, because it is require it requires internet and it will be automated. So, that will come under OIDR service. Same way, you download a mobile game and you play that game. So, will that come under OIDR service? Yes. So, because that some games requires internet, without internet you cannot play the game. There are many such games, okay, Call of Duty or uh, Sniper 3D, these games and all. So, you definitely requires internet and it is automated. Suppose, if it is like uh, some other person is required, like Minecraft or uh, some other games, wherein opposite one person is required. So, then only we can play like that collaborative gaming, even Rummy Circle, online Rummy, etc. So, will it be coming under OIDR? No, because it is not automated. It requires internet, but it is not automated because we need an opposite one person to play the game. So, therefore, now you understood what is OIDR service. What is OIDR service? Full form, online information, database, access and retrieval services. In case of OIDR services, imported by non-taxable online recipient, it will not come under RCM, it will be FCM. Generally, import of services, generally import of services, RCM. But exception, only one case, import of service will not come under RCM. What is that? Import of OIDR services by non-taxable online recipient. OIDR service means a service which is mediated through internet. Somewhere you write down there, OIDR service means a service which is mediated through internet. OIDR service means a service mediated through internet and is automated. A service which is mediated through internet and is automated and is automated. A service which is mediated through internet and is automated. Okay. Then, who is non-taxable online recipient? Any unregistered person. Pa. Any unregistered person importing services for other than business or commerce is called as non-taxable online recipient. For example, you are subscribing for Netflix and say you are paying 199 rupees per annum Per annum, per month, per month, okay. Per month, uh, because now I am not watching in uh, OTT, pa. I will watch in Telegram, so that's why I don't know. So, therefore, you are paying that 199 per month and you are subscribing for Netflix, pa. Now, is it import of service? Yes, it is import of service. Now, you are importing it for personal purpose or for connecting it in projector and playing a movie and all personal purpose, correct, other than business or commerce. So, you will be coming under non-taxable online recipient. Therefore, in this case, liability to pay GST is not on you. You are importing service, not on you, but on the supplier. Who is that supplier? Netflix. So, they have to pay GST under FCM. Understood? So, now, what is the first one? Yes, yes for security lending. In security lending, who is the supplier? Lender of securities, recipient. Borrower of security. So, borrower will pay GST under RCM. Then I, I for import of services, supplier outside India, recipient in India, liability to pay GST is on recipient, exception, only one case, OIDR services by non-taxable online recipient. Good. Then R for renting of motor vehicles. In case of renting of motor vehicles, so who is the supplier, owner of the motor vehicle? Who is the recipient? The one who is taking the motor vehicle on rental basis. And RCM will be applicable if three conditions are satisfied. Pa. Condition number one, supplier should be other than body corporate. And recipient should be body corporate. And the rate of GST is 5%. If these three conditions are satisfied, then only it will come under RCM. Supplier should be 
other than body corporate. Recipient should be body corporate. Rate of GST 5%. Who is a body corporate? Body corporate means private limited company or public limited company or body established under any law for the time being in force. RBI, body corporate, yes. SEBI, body corporate, yes. ICI, body corporate, yes. You understood. Any body established under any law for the time being in force is called as body corporate. Somewhere you write down. Body corporate means private limited company or public limited company. Body corporate means private limited company or public limited company or body established under any law. Or body established under any law. Private limited company or public limited company or body established under any law is known as body corporate. Okay. So, supplier should be other than body corporate. Recipient should be body corporate. And what should be the rate of GST mentioned in the invoice? 5%. Means some other rate is also there. Yes, some other rate is also there. They have 18%, 12%, etc. But the, all those things we don't have to remember because rates and all we don't have for exam. But what you need to know is that if rate is 5%, then only it will be RCM. Okay. So, what is that ARPA? Renting of motor vehicles. And uh, who is the supplier? Owner of motor vehicle. Who is the recipient? The one who take motor vehicle on rent. Conditions for RCM? Come on, please respond. Supplier, other than body corporate, recipient body corporate, rate of GST 5%. Then it will be RCM. Then next one, next to R. Yesterday we already discussed that. Renting of residential property for residential purpose. Correct? Ah? To whom? Registered person. So, therefore, it is what? Renting of residential property. And for what purpose it is given on rent? Residential purpose. To whom it is given? Registered person. Means supplier is owner of the property. Recipient is tenant. And the tenant should be registered. Then only it will be covered under RCM. Is it residential property or commercial property? Residential property. What if it is commercial property? It is not covered under RCM. You understood? So, only residential property is covered. That is R, that is an amendment. Renting of residential property for residential purpose to a registered person. So, RRR. You remember this. Okay. Then next. Not that I am a fan of that movie and all. So, because it got Oscar and all. Nah. So, therefore, uh, we can remember. Ultimately, we need to remember some way to write the exam. Okay. Then next. Copyright services. Copyright services means temporary transfer of IPR. Temporary transfer of IPR. So, will be coming under RCM with respect to four IPRs. What are those four IPRs? So, original literary. Original literary. Original literary means an author who is writing uh, books or novels, etc. So, liability to pay GST is on the recipient, not on the author. So, then number two. Dramatic. Dramatic means story, screenplay, etc. That is dramatic. And then artistic, making some drawings, designs, paintings, sculptures, etc. Then musical, that is composing music, background score, etc. So, these are the four copyrights which are covered under RCM. What are the four copyrights covered under RCM? Original literary, dramatic, artistic, musical. Okay, any order you remember, but these four are only covered under RCM. And who will pay GST? Recipient will pay GST. Recipient can be any person. Pa. Recipient only will pay GST. Usually recipient will be in case of author, publisher or any other person also. And in case of artistic, musical works, producer of the movie. So recipient will pay GST. However, in case of that author, we have one option. What is that? Author can opt to pay GST under FCM. But if author opts to pay GST under FCM, there is a lock-in for one year, which means for the next one year, author only will pay GST under FCM. Understood or not? So, therefore, why author will opt to pay GST under FCM? Because whenever my outward supply is covered under RCM, it will be treated as exempted supply for the purpose of availing ITZ, which means when my outward supply is covered under RCM, I am not paying GST, you are paying GST. So, for me, it will be treated like, actually it is taxable only, but for me, it will be treated like 
exempted. So I cannot take ITs on inward supply. Author will have some inward supply now. They will buy a laptop. They will be receiving some DTP services or some softwares, etc. On that, if they want to take ITC, they will opt to pay GST under FCM. But for all four, is there an option or only for the author there is an option? Only for author. And if they exercise the option for FCM for the next one year from the date of exercising the option, they need to pay GST under FCM. So FCM to RCM, is it possible immediately? No. One year lock-in period. Okay. RCM to FCM, is there any lock-in period? No. Anytime they can shift from RCM to FCM. But FCM to RCM only, there is a lock-in for one year. Understood? So tell me what is that copyright services you need to remember? Total four copyrights which are covered under RCM. What are they? Original literary, dramatic, artistic, musical works. Who will pay GST generally? Recipient will pay GST under RCM. But there is an exception, only one exception. In case of original literary, author can opt to pay GST under FCM for a period of one year. One year from the date of excising option is that one year one financial year one year from the date of excising the option one year from the date of excising that option then next one gta services goods transport agency services in case of goods transport agency services liability to pay gst is on the consignor or consignee who is liable to pay freight okay supplier is goods transport agency who is a goods transport agency you just write down there Goods transport agency means any person transporting goods by road. Any person transporting goods by road. GTA means any person transporting goods by road and issues a consignment note. And issues a consignment note. Any person transporting goods by road. So only road waste pa. If they are transporting goods by railways or waterways, we will not call them as GTA. So they should be engaged in transportation of goods by roadways and they should be issuing a consignment note. Will they be transporting goods belonging to one person? No. They will be transporting, uh, transporting goods belonging to different consignors to different consignees. So in that lorry, there will be parcels belonging to different, different people. All these parcels are transported in a single lorry. So that's how it works. And this goods transport agency service, so GTA is liable to pay GST under FCM or RCM. There are two options. So either GTA can opt to pay GST under FCM or they can authorize their recipient to pay GST under RCM. Now there is an amendment to amendment I am discussing, concentrate. So GTA can opt to pay GST under FCM or the recipient, consignor or consignee can pay GST under RCM. If but when they need to decide this, when they need to decide this previously, with respect to each invoice, they can decide. But now there is amendment. In a financial year, they need to decide. And that financial year, either FCM option or RCM option. Is it clear or not? Previously, they can jump like anything. FCM to RCM, RCM to FCM like that. But now, for one financial year, they need to follow either FCM or RCM. That they need to select that they need to select in the portal. By when they need to select that in the portal? So, before, before prior to 15 days, 15 days before commencement of the quarter, uh, commencement of the financial year. So, which means what literally somewhere like before March 16th, uh, 15 days. So, March, April 1st is the commencement of the financial year. 15 days prior means what? 15 days prior means somewhere like March 16th or before March 16th, they should have selected the option. Is it clear or not? Then whatever option they selected, that will be applicable throughout the financial year. Now suppose in the question, if they have not given FCM or RCM, because previously what we used to do, if it is 12%, we used to select as FCM. If it is 5%, we used to select as RCM. So previously we used to do that way. So rate 12% given a FCM. 5% RCM like that. But now you cannot choose that way because GTA is having both 12% and 5% under FCM. You understood or not? So under FCM itself, they can pay again two rates. What are the two rates? 
they can pay 12 percent or they can pay 5 percent, 12 percent with ITC, 5 percent without ITC. So therefore, based on rate, now you cannot categorize, means clearly it should be given in the question. If it is not given in the question, you can take any assumption here. So either FCM assumption or RCM assumption you can take, but 99 percent it will be given in the question itself, do not worry. If it is not given in the question, then you take any assumption and you write, okay. So, but the answer will be correct answer only. So, but 99 percent it will be given in the question. So, what are the two options available to GTA? Come on, FCM option, RCM option and they need to choose that for every financial year and FCM, what is the rate that they have? 12 percent, RCM and again in FCM they have one more rate also. So, GTA goods transport agency, goods transport agency they have, so two option, option one FCM, option one, so one second, wait, 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 you are writing this, uh, so somewhere in this uh, page number 45 you have some space there you write down, so GTA option one and option two, option two. So, option 1 is FCM, option 2 is RCM and RCM always at what rate? 5 percent. FCM again two rates they have, again two rates they have at 12 percent or at 5 percent. 12 percent will be with ITC, pa, with ITC, 5 percent will be without ITC, 5 percent will be without ITC. And they need to decide when? Decide at, so prior, decided 15 days prior, 15 days prior to commencement of financial year, to beginning, prior to beginning of financial year decided 15 days prior to beginning of financial year, option 1 versus option 2. Now, pa, whether they go for 12 percent or 5 percent, recipient can take ITC. So, this with ITC, without ITC is for whom? Supplier. So, if GTA opts for 12 percent with ITC, they can take ITC and they will charge us 12 percent. So, we can take 12 percent ITC. Suppose if GTA opts to pay at 5 percent means GTA cannot take ITC. Now they charge that 5 percent to us. Can we take ITC? Yes. Recipient can always take ITC with respect to that. So whenever we are receiving GTA service, let the GTA pay 12 percent or 5 percent, we will always take credit. The problem is for GTA only. So if they pay 12 percent, they can take ITC. If they pay 5 percent, they cannot take ITC. You understood or not? So that is this option 1 and option 2 and next uh, we have sir C G, we, G we have completed, C G we have completed. So, up to that can you tell me yes for security lending services, supplier, lender, recipient, borrower, liability to pay GST is on recipient, borrower, I, import of services and supplier outside India, recipient in India, any exception to RCM? Yes, OIDR services by non-taxable online recipient. Then R, renting of motor vehicles, supplier, owner, recipient who takes it on rent. Any conditions for RCM? Yes, three conditions, what are they? Supplier should be other than body corporate, recipient should be body corporate, rate of GST should be 5 percent, okay. Then next R, Renting of residential property by owner of the property, supplier, recipient, tenant, who is liable to pay GST, tenant and for that one condition is there, the tenant should be registered person, okay. Then C for copyright, what are the four copyrights? Original literary, dramatic, artistic, musical, then who will pay GST, recipient, any exception? author, in case of original literary, they can opt to pay GST under FCM and that is lock in for a period of one year from the date of excising the option. Then next one, 
So G, GTA services, supplier, GTA, recipient, consignor or consignee who will pay freight. And whether it is RCM, yes. But we have option 1, option 2, option 1, FCM, option 2, RCM. GTA should decide it when, 15 days prior to commencement of the financial year. And if it is FCM rate, 12% with ITC, 5% without ITC. RCM, 5%. All these can be taken as ITC by the recipient? Yes. Now look into the next one, government services. So government, in our last class we discussed, so government services, only four activities of government is covered under supply. What are the four activities of government? Department of post. Airport or port services, transportation of goods or passengers, and services to business entities. Now, the fourth point we are discussing, that is only covered under RCM. First three not covered under RCM, only fourth activity. What is that fourth activity? Services provided by government to business entity is covered under RCM. So, who is the supplier here? Government. When I say government, I mean to say central government, state government, local authority, or union territory, that is government. Who is the recipient? Business entity. Business entity is the recipient. And generally it will be covered under RCM. Business entity will pay GST under RCM. But one exception is their part. That is renting of immobile property by government to business entity. If that business entity is unregistered, government only will pay GST under FCM. Again I am repeating, government service to business entity is always RCM pa. But only one case, FCM it will come. What is that one case? Renting of immobile property to unregistered person. But sir, you said renting of immobile property to unregistered person is exempted. As a residential property, pa, I am talking about services to business entity. Why for business entity they will give residential property? Definitely it will be a commercial property. Did I say commercial property exempted like that? Commercial property always Renting of commercial property always. So therefore, here recipient is unregistered. So government only will pay GST under FCM. So therefore, what you need to remember in case of government services, come on, supplier is government. Recipient is business entity. Always covered under RCM. But exception one exception, what is that? Renting of immobile property to unregistered person. Okay. Then next, uh, O for overseeing committee services to RBI in relation to restructuring NPAs. NPAs means non-performing assets. You just write down there, non-performing assets, non-performing assets. What is non-performing asset? When a person takes loan and not repay the loan and run away to some other country, so then that person is called as a non-performing asset, that loan is called as a non-performing asset. It is receivable only, but the person is not paying. That's why it is non-performing asset. It's asset only, but the asset is not performing, you understood. And in that case, so what will happen, RBI will appoint one overseeing committee. For example, Vijay Malia is there. Vijay Malia has taken lot of loans and he did not repay the loan to SBI. Now, what will happen? RBI's head will roll. Why? Because if SBI bank, tomorrow what SBI bank will say? Okay, sir. So, he has taken loan. Therefore, I don't have money. I cannot pay to the depositors. Then who will be affected? Public at large will be affected. Now, public under what trust has deposited money in bank? RBI. Correct or not? So, therefore, tomorrow RBI has to make the payment. So, that's the reason why RBI appointed one overseeing committee. This overseeing committee, there will be n number of overseeing committee. For one one NPA, one one overseeing committee they will appoint. So, this overseeing committee will restructure the NPAs. What they will do? So, they will follow up with uh, Vijay Malia, whichever country he is in. They will speak to that country. They will ensure that he is arrested there and he will be brought to India and somehow the road will be recovered. So, he will have money. Every person who borrows money, so what they will do is that they will definitely keep that money somewhere. So how they can spend pa? So definitely not possible. You would have seen Tunibu movie na, na pa? Or not? You did not see? 
Hey, movie is good, pa. I'm not talking about hero, pa. Where I said about hero, I said about movie. The concept is good. Actually, that is the real concept. These business people, they borrow the loan and they will be purchasing or they will be transferring that money to some other person and it will be there somewhere. So therefore, somehow this restructuring will be done to recover that money from these people. So for this purpose, that overseeing committee will get some commission from RBI. On that commission, overseeing committee is not required to pay GST because overseeing committee has to register and then pay GST. That is a headache for them. That's the reason why. Who is paying commission to them? RBI. So RBI will pay GST under RCM. Is it clear or not? So in case of overseeing committee, who is the supplier? Overs nah, overseeing committee. Who is the recipient? RBI. And on the commission, who will pay GST? RBI. Any exceptions, etc.? No, that much only. Then T. T for TDR, FSI, long-term lease. So yesterday I discussed that na, TDR, FSI, long-term lease. Again, I am explaining carefully. Listen. FSI refers to floor space index. Now, I am a landowner. I have some land. And on that, I constructed only ground floor. And two more floors can be constructed. But I have not constructed. I don't have money to construct. I don't want that. Because for my family, one floor only enough. So now, you are a builder. You are approaching me. Sir, two more floors can be constructed. Why are you not constructing? So can I construct it for you? So then I will ask, I cannot pay one rupee also to you. No worry, sir. You don't have to pay me money. You just allow me to construct two floors on the top of that. And I will give you some money for that. So what is happening here? I am not paying money. And I am getting money. So, but those two floors are mine. Huh? No, the two floors will belong to the builder. Then what builder will we do with that? The builder will sell those one floor, two floors to some other person and get the money. So he incurred the cost on construction. Huh? Now I will ask, okay, give me one crore. He will give me one crore. I did not sell my land. I did not sell my building. I am staying in the same house. But unutilized FSI I transferred for which I got 1 crore rupees. You understood or not? So therefore, for this 1 crore, so what builder, how builder will recover that 1 crore? He will invest some 50 lakhs extra in construction and he will make some 2 floors. 2 floors means say 2 properties. Each property he will sell for 1.5 crore and he will get 3 crores. You understood or not? So in this case, I am transferring what land? Ah. I am transferring building. Ah. Then what I am transferring? The unutilized space or unutilized FSI I am transferring. For which he gave me 1 crore. On that 1 crore, who will pay GST? The builder will pay GST. For you don't know the power of land power. That is the power of land. That too when you are in cities and all. So you have lot of FSI given by the government. And you don't need that much. So that's where if you see Annanagar, T Nagar, Mailapur, Adayar, these places and all, what they will do, they will go on a joint development model with the builder. So they will give their house and the builder will construct superbly one apartment. So they will be getting their house, one floor, whatever they are having, plus one more extra flat also they will get, some money also they will get. So if you have land, that will take care of you. So, people used to say that you should invest in land and gold. That is true. So, today, people who are having land, even if they are not educated also, they are minting money like anything. This is one such case. I am having, I did not invest one rupee also, but I got one crore. What I sacrifice? My unutilized FSI I sacrifice, for which I got one crore. On that one crore, I will not pay GST. The recipient will pay. That to builder will pay GST under RCM. Then TDR. TDR is like a virtual land. So why this virtual land will be given by government? Government has to, suppose if the government demolishes, you know, so recently even I also got a TDR, practically I am telling you, I also got a TDR. So in somewhere in my town, so in Andhra Pradesh somewhere, so even I too don't know that. And uh, the place I know, but my grandfather used to have one place and the road widening has happened in my place. And in that road widening, they have demolished my grandfather's property. 
when they demolish my grandfather's property so they have not given the compensation they have given two options to people so either you need compensation we will give you per square feet 5000 rupees so some 1000 square feet got demolished 5000 rupees per square feet or we will give you tdr like that and so no one so like uh, no one was there belonging to that property so therefore government gave tdr why government will give TDR? What is the advantage to government? Compensation means cash outflow. Compensation means cash outflow. TDR means no cash outflow. Just one paper they will give. And that paper was submitted in the registrar office. And I got a letter asking me to go and collect the TDR. And I went and collected the TDR. When I collected the TDR, so that TDR is having 1000 square feet which can be used for construction of any building above the FSI to the extent of 1000 square feet. Now, in town and all, no one will do the construction. If it is in city, that would have got super demand. But maybe after 10 years, what will happen? So, the town will become a city one day. So, at the time, some builder will be constructing some big commercial complex there. At the time, he will cross the FSI. Because in Chennai, you can construct only 4 or 5 floors. But if you see 10 floors, 20 floors are also constructing. Correct or not? Go and see by many main roads and all. So, 10 floors buildings are also there. How they are able to construct 10 floors? Because they would have procured the TDR. So, now someone after 10 years will come and ask me to sell the TDR to them. I will sell. At the time, I will quote 20,000 rupees per square feet. Today, if I have collected, I would have collected only 5,000 rupees. And after 10 years, definitely 20 or 25,000 rupees also I can sell. Are you understanding this? So, that is about TDR, a virtual land. Now, say I am selling the TDR to some person. I get the money. Definitely that money what I receive is more than what government is going to pay as compensation. So, therefore, it is win-win situation for everyone. So, therefore, now I get some money from the builder now by transferring this virtual land TDR. On that I will pay GST or the builder will pay GST. Builder will pay GST under RCM. Understood about TDR? Then, long term lease of land. Long term lease of land means, say, so a big land is there, some 4000 square feet, 5000 square feet land is there. I do not want to sell the land. And this land is somewhere in the outskirts. No agriculture. It is agriculture also not possible. I do not want to sell that land also. Now, I will be giving this land on a lease model to one industry to set up their factory there. Are you understanding? To one industry or to one warehouse to open a warehouse over there. And what is called as a long term lease? Lease for a period 30 years or more is only called as long term lease. What is long term lease? Pa? Lease for a period 30 years or more. Now I gave the lease now land on lease. Now I get what? Lease rentals. On that lease rentals, I will not pay GST. The one who is taking, that is the builder, etc., who is taking that on rent, lease, he will pay GST under RCM. So, what are the three things? TDR, FSI, long term lease. TDR full form, transferable development right. FSI full form, floor space index. Long term lease means, no, 30 years or more, greater than or equals to 30 years. Now, in these three cases, who is the supplier? Landowner. Landowner. Who is the recipient? Promoter or builder. So, who will pay GST? Promoter or builder. That's it. Pa. Next. So, sir, CG got. We completed. Now, salads. In that, yes, sir. Sponsorship services. In sponsorship service, who is the supplier and who is the recipient? Organizer of the event or organizer of the place is called as the sponsor like a supplier and the one who give the money sponsorer is the recipient you understood say one cricket event is going to happen IPL match is going to commence now nah? so for that definitely you know Vivo or Oppo or some brand name will be giving no money who pa Tata wa? this time Tata okay Tata so now who is the supplier? Who is the recipient here? IPL board is the supplier, organizer of event. And who is the recipient? Sponsor. Tata is the recipient. Now, who is having liability to pay GST on the recipient if condition is there? If the recipient is body corporate or firm. 
if the recipient is body corporate or firm liability to pay gst is on recipient what if the recipient is not body corporate or from some other person then fcm okay but generally 90% of the cases the recipient will be body corporate or firm only rarely the recipient could be other than body corporate or firm then it will be fcm okay so sponsorship service who is the supplier organizer of event who is the recipient sponsor who is having liability to pay gst sponsor condition for rcm recipient should be body corporate or firm okay then next one a a for agent service total five agents are covered there insurance agent to insurance company so insurance agent is providing service to insurance company supplier is insurance agent recipient is insurance company and supplier will get the insurance commission so on that commission liability to pay gst is on insurance company under rcm that is first one second recovery agent to bank financial institution or nbfc recovery agent what work recovery agent will be doing he will recover the loans for recovering the loans so bank will be paying him commission on that commission who will pay gst bank will pay gst under rcm then direct selling agent who is direct selling agent those who do marketing for the banking products so we get call na you need credit card you need loan etc and all so in a day at least four five spam calls i will be getting so every time i will block and when i block again next day again some other number it will come pa and it is like got to this bajaj finance torture cities so what they do is that they call i'll say i don't need loan and i will not get loan also whatever i am asking i will not get if possible give some 2 3 crores like that i will ask but they will not be giving okay so they will give 5 lakhs loan 10 lakhs loan what to do with that that 2 3 crores na some commercial complex i will buy and i will construct four five shops give it on rent happily i will retire you understood or not but you know they will not give that but they will be giving 5 lakhs 10 lakhs credit card you need credit card is one stupid thing so already i have credit card no sir again take you get this offer that offer like that they will be telling these people are called as direct selling agents so why they follow up that much because for selling the bank product they get a commission on that commission who will pay gst bank will pay gst but for that what is the condition for rcm please see supplier should be other than body corporate or firm pa recipient illa supplier supplier the direct selling agent should be other than body corporate or firm what if direct selling agent is body corporate or firm it will be covered under fcm only so supplier should be other than body corporate or firm see this other than supplier should be other than body corporate or firm then only it will be covered under rcm then number 4 business facilitator to banking company who is this business facilitator basically they are money remittance agents money remittance agents for example in a place where there is no atm center so some people will be appointed as business facilitator what they will do they will pay the money to us and they will collect our account number and otp and in our bank account money gets debited for doing this money remittance they will get some 10 rupees or 20 rupees per transaction as commission what is the advantage of this to the bank bank don't have to set up a atm center atm center means one place they need to take on rent ac they need to fix if they fix ac then lot of people donkeys monkeys will come and sleep there so therefore one security they need to keep you understood or not these are all cost so that's the reason why they will be appointing this business facilitators so business facilitators will do money remittance activities for which they get a commission from the bank and on that commission who will pay gst again bank will pay gst under rcm then fifth one agent of business correspondent to business correspondent business correspondents are again agents of bank so what they do is that account opening loan processing this kind of activities which the bank manager has to do so those job will be done by business correspondents these business correspondents are not covered under rcm business correspondent service is not covered under rcm read there carefully 
agent of business correspondent there is an agent of business correspondent who is providing services to business correspondent on the commission liability to pay gst is on business correspondent understood or not so what are the five agents can you tell me first insurance agent to insurance company any conditions no then second recovery agent to bank financial institution nbfc any conditions no third direct selling agent to bank financial institution any condition for rcm yes supplier should be other than body corporate or firm very good then next business facilitator to banking company any conditions no then next agent of business correspondent to business correspondent good pa so these five cases liability to pay gst is on recipient agent services then l refers to legal service by individual advocate or firm of advocate so this individual advocate or firm of advocate provides services to whom business entities so who will pay gst advocate will pay or business entity will pay business entity will pay that's it okay then next one arbitrator what is the difference between advocate and arbitrator advocate will settle the case through the court of law arbitrator will settle the case out of the court okay so this arbitrator services again to whom they will provide service to business entity it is covered under rcm so what is l legal service who is the supplier individual advocate or firm of advocate who is the recipient business entity so who will pay gst business entity will pay and in case of a a for arbitrator service who is the supplier arbitrator recipient business entity who will pay gst business entity will pay who is a business entity any person engaged in business is known as business entity pa is it clear just write down there don't get confused between body corporate and business entity business entity means any person engaged in business any person engaged in business is known as business entity any person any person means even individual also will come under business entity yes individual firm llp every person will come under business entity so whether i am business entity yes so therefore i do business i do business so when i do business definitely i will be coming under business entity suppose if i am receiving services for my personal purpose say suppose if my divorce case example lampa yeah so for example okay if my divorce case i appoint one advocate appa service provided to business entity other than business entity yeah. other than business entity okay so just for example only you don't create any story there okay so just for example or i stabbed one person okay so one criminal case so now in that case so suppose if one advocate is arguing then it will be coming under service provide to business entity or other than business entity so other than same person same person for business purpose it will become business entity for personal purpose it will become other than business entity so but what is covered under rcm here business entity then so l a we have completed then two more d and s d for director services director is providing services to whom company or body corporate for that purpose director will be receiving some money so sitting fees etc on that on that liability to pay gst is on company but in this you need to remember one important point director should not be an employee of the company if director is employee of the company then it is dash covered under supplier excluded from supplier excluded from supplier which point employee to employer in the course of employment very good so therefore director should not be an employee of the company and how do you know whether director is an employee or not an employee of the company for that purpose one circular has been given as to based on companies act or based on income tax act you will be able to identify so suppose you check the contract with which the company has entered into with director so director and company will have a contract that contract you see 
is it contract of service or contract for service if it is contract of service then there exists a employer employee relationship or a master servant relationship you understood or not so generally generally we will be able to identify from the contract itself so contract of service or contract for service contract of service means employer employee relationship contract for service contract for service means principal to principal okay so wherein we are concerned only about work not about the time so i have to do this work either i can do at my place or i can do at your place but i have to complete this work example audit audit is a contract for service because i have to do the audit i need to submit you the audit report but audit i can do at my place or your place partly my place partly your place correct or not so therefore that is contract for service but if you are working for a organization on a full time employment basis it is contract of service whether you do work or not morning you need to go evening till evening you should be there and so some work will be there some work will not be there but here it is not about the work it is about the timing and the dedication you understood or not so that is contract of service generally we will be able to find there if that is not possible then you check the tds so money is remitted by the company to the director now on that money remitted by company to director whether company has computed tds under 192 or 194j if the company has computed tds under 192 then the money received by the director will come under which head income from salaries therefore employer employee relationship therefore it is excluded from supply suppose if the company is remitting the money to the director and on that the company is deducting tds under 194j then the money so received by the director from the company will be covered under which head pgbp or ifos so therefore it will be covered under supply and chargeable to gst but who will pay gst in that case the company or body corporate will pay gst under rcm is it clear pa so first you are checking contract of service or contract for service contract of service means excluded from supply contract for service means covered under supply and chargeable to gst in the hands of company or income tax act tds under 192 then it is income from salaries so excluded from supply tds under 194j then it will be income under pgvp ifos covered under supply chargeable to gst under rcm and so that is with respect to this director services related to this director services one illustration i have given see the next page page number 45 Arpan Singhania is a director in Narayan Limited. The company paid him the sitting fee amounting to twenty-five thousand for the month of January. Further, salary was paid to Arpan Singhania amounting to one point five lakhs for the month of January, on which TDS was also deducted as per the applicable provisions under Income Tax Act. So, first twenty-five thousand is what sitting fees. Is this sitting fees covered under salary? No, that sitting fees is not covered under salary. It is normal contract for service. So therefore, that will be covered under supply. Yes. So on that sitting fee twenty five thousand, who will pay GST? Arpan Singhani or Narayan Limited? Narayan Limited will pay GST under RCM. Then this Arpan Singhani has received one and a half lakhs as salary, and on that salary TDS was also deducted, which means. it will be coming under 192 tds salary tds deducted means what 192 so therefore it will be covered under supply or excluded from supply excluded from supply under employee to employer in the course of employment then tapas and associates in which arpan singhania is a partner supplied certain professional services to narayan limited in the month of january for an amount of 2 lakhs what about this 2 lakhs is it services first of all services provided by director to company no because here who is providing the services tapasya and associates in that tapasya and associates 
this Arpan Singhania is a partner. So, whether the firm is providing or the director is providing service, firm is providing service means it is not director services to company, so it is not covered under RCM. Only director services to company is covered under RCM. So, this is not covered under RCM, then this will be FCM. So, liability to pay GST is on Tapasya and Associates only under FCM. Is it clear? So, that is the answer for these three situations. Then, last one, security agency services. See the previous page. In that, sir, CG got salads. So, yes, last yes, security agency services. So, what security agency will do? They will supply security personnel for banks or uh, hospitals, educational institutions, shopping malls, etc. So, they will be supplying the security personnel. So, these security personnel or security agency will come under RCM if conditions are there. Pa. Supplier should be other than body corporate. Means that security agency should be other than body corporate. And the recipient should be <coughs> registered. Recipient should be registered. And recipient is not opting for composition scheme or not registered only to deduct TDS under GST. Means other than these two. So, recipient should be registered, but they should not be opting for composition scheme. What if recipient is registered and opting for composition scheme, it will not come under RCM. Okay. Recipient is registered only to deduct TDS under GST. Even then, it will not be covered under RCM. So, when it will come under RCM, the recipient should be registered and not opting for composition scheme or not registered only to deduct TDS, then it will come under RCM. So, see this list. Supplier is body corporate. No need to check anything. Always FCM. Why? First condition is what? Supplier should be other than body corporate. Now, second, supplier is other than body corporate, but recipient is unregistered. Then also FCM. Why? Supplier is other than body corporate. Correct. First condition satisfied. But the second condition, recipient should be registered. But here recipient is unregistered. So, therefore, RCM not applicable. Okay. Third one, supplier other than body corporate, recipient is registered, but opting for composition scheme. Again, FCM. Supplier is other than body corporate, recipient is registered and registered only to detect TDS. Then also FCM. Then last case, supplier other than body corporate, recipient is registered other than above, then only it will be covered under RCM. So, in case of security agency service, who is the supplier? Security agency. Who is the recipient? The one who received the security agency service, security personnel. Then, here, what are the conditions for RCM? Supplier should be other than body corporate. Recipient should be registered, not body corporate, registered. And they should not be registered for composition scheme or not registered only to deduct TDS. Now, just tell me, what is the list of services which are covered under RCM? Sir, CG got salads. Yes, for security lending. I for import of service. R for renting of motor vehicles. Another R, renting of residential property. C, copyright services. G, GTA services. Another G, government services to business entities. O, overseeing committee to RBI. T, TDR, FSI, long term lease. Then, yes, salads. Yes. Sponsorship services, A, agent services, L, legal services by advocate or form of advocate. Then another A, arbitrator services, D, director services to company or body corporate. Last, yes, security agency services. Okay. Now, in this, which places we have conditions for yes, no condition, I, no condition. R, ah, three conditions are there for renting of motor vehicles. What are the three conditions? Supplier should be other than body corporate. Recipient should be body corporate. Rate of GST, 5%. Another R also, there is a condition. Renting of residential property. Recipient should be registered. Then C, no conditions. And then uh, G, GTA service, no conditions. Then, government service, no conditions. Exceptions are there, but conditions not there, okay? So, then O, no conditions. T also, no conditions. Yes, ha. Huh. Sponsorship service, we have condition. What is that? Recipient should be body corporate or firm. Again, in agents, direct selling agent only, we have condition. What is that? 
supplier should be other than body corporate or firm and thereafter we don't have condition anywhere last yes alone we have condition what is that supplier should be other than body corporate recipient should be registered not opting for composition scheme not registered to deduct tds then exception so there are three places where supplier will pay gst recipient will not pay gst even though covered here what are they import of service which service import of oidr service by non taxable online recipient then another place author author can opt to pay gst under fcm for a period of 1 year then again gta gta also can opt to pay gst under fcm so for financial year one more point government government providing services renting of immobile property to unregistered person it will be covered under fcm correct so this is about 9 subsection 3 9 4 and 9 5 we have completed so we have completed this segment number 3 liability to pay gst now we are moving on to exemptions here because this rcm is connected to exemptions because in exam what they do they combine these exemptions and rcm together and they will be asking questions so i am skipping this value of supply and i am moving on to even input tax credit also i am skipping moving on to exemptions under gst segment 7 page number 104 this exemptions chapter you need to focus more because there are lots of amendments in exemptions so you might have studied the old provisions and there are some provisions which are not at all applicable also because it is omitted so please be attentive in the class listen fully focus on to this so whatever we are learning are exemptions so remaining cases will be taxable okay first agriculture related services in agriculture related services we are not talking about agriculture we are talking about service in relation to agriculture or agricultural produce means one person is doing agriculture or there is some agricultural produce any service in relation to agriculture or any service in relation to agricultural produce is exempted that is the first exemption you can see any service in relation to agriculture or agricultural produce is exempted okay so someone you are doing agriculture pa and i am providing service to you now my service is exempted you have agricultural produce pa for that i provide the service that is exempted can you give me examples of service in relation to agricultural produce storage packing correct a warehousing that's what storage or warehousing packing then even so with respect to like uh, segregating quality grading okay all these are service in relation to agricultural produce can you give me examples of service in relation to agriculture renting of tractors renting of equipments for plowing etc and then so we are providing harvesting service for that manpower supply we are providing then seed testing soil testing so all these are examples of service in relation to agriculture now any service in relation to agriculture or agricultural produce is exempted now first we need to know what is the meaning of agriculture agriculture means cultivation of plants what plants is it related to food or even not related to food not related to food also example tea wood plantation tea wood plantation is for food da no then we have tobacco plant plantation food da no flower floriculture flowers flower plantations is it for food no rubber plantation not for food so plantation can be for any purpose it will come under agriculture pa so that plantation may be for food or not for food it will come under agriculture so cultivation of plants then rearing of all life forms of animals except rearing of horses for food fiber fuel raw material or other similar products so rearing of life form of life forms of animals for food what is the example of rearing of life forms of animals for food so poultry 
poultry, fisheries, etc. are example of food. Then fiber sericulture, silkworm farming, silkworm sheep farming is for fiber. That is raw meat like uh, this uh, uh, silk wool, etc. Then fuel, cattle farming. So cow or cattle farming for what purpose? We use that as fuel for ploughing instead of tractors. We use the cattle for ploughing. So therefore fuel. Raw material, example honey bee farming. Honey bee farming is for creating the honey that is a raw material for many products. Honey bee farming or any other similar products like uh, pig farming or sheep farming, goat farming, all this will be coming under rearing of all life forms of animals except rearing of horses. Why? Because horses are not used in agriculture. Food? No. Fiber? No. Fuel? No. Fuel related to agriculture. We will not use horses for ploughing. Okay. Cannot use power. Cattle we can use. Horses and all. So some 2-3 two, two, acres it will plough. Okay. And so that is not possible. Horses, you, you cannot control the horses for ploughing purpose. So no way connected to fuel. Then raw material or other similar products. Then why only horses are excluded? Why not other animals? So lion, tiger, etc. and all. That is not allowed for rearing power. Rearing means taking care of re for reproduction. Taking care of for reproduction is known as rearing. Is it allowed? Tiger and all you can keep at home and rear it? No. Not possible pa. Okay. It will kill you, eat you and go. So, no. So, it is not allowed for rearing. So, those animals which are allowed for rearing, in that horses is excluded. Okay. So, all other animals are covered. Okay. Then. So, what is the meaning of agriculture? Tell me because whenever you see renting of agro machinery 20 lakhs, answer is what? Renting of agro machinery 20 lakhs, answer is exempted. But why it is exempted we need to write. So, we need to write any service in relation to agriculture or agricultural produce is exempted. Agriculture means cultivation of plants and rearing of life forms of animals for food fiber, fuel, raw material or any other similar product. In the present case, renting of agro machinery is for agriculture. Therefore, it is exempted. Like that we need to write. Understood? So, next. So, can you tell me agriculture definition once? Cultivation of plants and rearing of life forms of animals. For what purpose? Food, fiber, fuel, raw material or any other similar produce or similar products. Then, any service in relation to agricultural produce is also exempted. So, what is agricultural produce? The primary produce out of agriculture on which no processing is done or some processing as is usually done by a cultivator which does not alter its essential characteristics. Example, so tender coconut, is it agricultural produce? Tender coconut, yes. The primary produce out of agriculture. So, tender coconut is agricultural produce. Now, the tender coconut, we dry it for some days and remove a layer and we get a coconut. So, some process is done. Who is doing this process? Cultivator. So, what they do? They keep it for some 10 days or 15 days. They peel off a layer and inside we get the coconut. So, therefore, that coconut is still agricultural produce. Why? So, agricultural produce means a primary produce out of agriculture on which no processing is done or some processing as is usually done by a cultivator which does not alter its essential characteristics. After removing a layer in the tender coconut, whether we got apple, no, coconut only. So, therefore, essential characteristics are not changed. Now, that coconut, we dry, sun dry it for some more days, the water content is absorbed and we open the shell we get the copra, dry coconut. So, even that is also agricultural produce. So, because still it is a process which is done by a cultivator which does not alter its essential characteristics. If that copra, we extract the oil out of it. So, because once the water content is absorbed, so then when you crush it, we get the coconut oil. So, that coconut oil 
will be coming under agricultural produce no essential characteristics have been changed so that is not an agricultural produce then is sugar can agricultural produce what about jaggery and sugar no that is process that is not agricultural produce is tomato agricultural produce tomato ketchup that is not agricultural produce then tea tea no tea leaves is agricultural produce tea is processed coffee coffee berries is agricultural produce but coffee is processed rice no then what is agricultural produce paddy why rice is not an agricultural produce because it is not usually done by the cultivator correct such processing is done as is usually done by a cultivator or producer usually usually who will do paddy to rice usually paddy to rice who will do conversion rice mills not by the cultivator My, like exception is there sometimes cultivators will do but usually who will do usually who will do rice mills that's the reason why rice is not an agricultural produce paddy is an agricultural produce but rice is not an agricultural produce understood or not then in relation to rice even though rice is not an agricultural produce but in relation to rice we have some activities which are exempted what are they loading unloading packing and storage of rice is exempted four activities what about these four activities for agricultural produce any how exempted not only these four activities any activity in relation to agricultural produce is exempted as rice is not an agricultural produce separately these four activities are given okay what are the two points you need to remember come on any service in relation to agriculture or agricultural produce is exempted second exemption loading unloading packing and storage or warehousing of rice is exempted now only four exemptions we have so two we have completed now three third point artificial insemination of livestock is exempted through injections we make the reproduction so that egg or broilers or even cattle injections we give for reproduction that is known as artificial insemination this artificial insemination is not service in relation to agriculture but it is connected to agriculture that's the reason why separately exemption is given then fourth point service by way of storage of previously big list of goods is was there cereals and pulses jaggery raw vegetable fibers such as cotton flax jute etc like that list was there but now everything is omitted now only storage and warehousing of cereals and pulses and minor forest produce is exempted all other goods will be taxable previously storage and warehousing of cotton etc was exempted even tea and coffee exempted nuts and spices exempted now everything is removed so which means it will be taxable so now storage and warehousing of what is exempted whether cereals and pulses are agricultural produce partly yes partly no because if you take the whole grain for example channa if you take black channa or white channa that is agricultural produce from the plant we get it and we dry it with the sun so that is what this you no know, kabuli channa black color one or white color ones and this particular channa if you process it again so if you remove the husk and you split it polish it etc we get the tur dal and gram dal so therefore pulses can be partly agricultural produce partly not agricultural produce that's why fully they have given as exemption storage and warehousing of agricultural produce is anyhow exempted but cereals and pulses even though not agricultural produce separately it is exempted same way minor forest produce minor forest produce is also not agricultural produce minor forest produce means so ayurvedic herbs bamboo or honey forest honey these are all available in the forest no one is going there and cultivating so it will not come under agricultural produce even though it is not agricultural produce but its storage is exempted so these are the four points that we have with respect to agriculture related service previously lot of points were there slaughtering of animals exempted like that one point was there now it is omitted now it is taxable and then 
fumigation in a warehouse to keep agricultural produce like that one point was there that is also not taxable so in relation to agriculture service what are the only four exemptions that we have come on any service in relation to agriculture or agricultural produce exempted number two rice for rice loading unloading storage a packing okay third artificial insemination of livestock four storage and warehousing of cereals and pulses minor forest produce okay pa apart from this for any other service in relation to agriculture is taxable then banking and other financial services next one in banking and other financial services previously for rbi any service provided by rbi was exempted now that exemption is omitted means rbi everything will be taxable service provided by rbi taxable service provided to rbi is taxable in relation to rbi everything is taxable is it clear so now amendment is that all activities of rbi is taxable service provided to rbi or services provided by rbi but only in two places it will come under rcm what are those two places come on superior overseeing committee to rbi then import of service by rbi import of service by rbi because in case of import of service by rbi import of service is also covered under rcm na so only these two previously import of service in relation to management of forex reserves was exempted one exemption was there that also omitted so now for rbi what is that you need to remember updated provisions all services provided by rbi and to rbi will be taxable in that case overseeing committee service to rbi and import of service by rbi is only covered under rcm its remaining and all is covered under fcm can you remember this year then next transaction in money transaction in money is divided into two for separate consideration or without consideration if transaction in money is without consideration is it treated as goods or services no neither goods nor services we studied na yesterday goods definition and service definition excludes money so transaction in money without consideration is neither goods nor services but transaction in money for a separate consideration is treated as supply of service but then also two considerations will be exempted what are they interest or discount is exempted and any other consideration will be taxable what about interest on credit card taxable or exempted interest on credit card taxable so any other consideration including interest in case of credit card is taxable interest on housing loan exempted discount on bill of exchange exempted interest on personal loan exempted interest on credit card taxable okay now then finance charges documentation charges processing fee nft rtgs charges debit card credit card charges you understood so any other consideration will be taxable including interest in case of credit cards and we don't have any rcm in this case fcm only then number 3 services provided by banking company to basic savings deposit account holders under pradhan mantri jan dhan yojana under pm jdy scheme lot of nil balance accounts were opened pa for that nil balance accounts why why it is mainly open is to transfer the lpg subsidy now lpg subsidy is not there okay and even then those accounts are there but these account holders will be receiving some services from the bank with respect to those services bank will collect some amount that amount collected by bank is exempted what if these amounts are collected from normal savings account holders taxable so only from savings account holders under which scheme pm jdy scheme then the money collected from them is exempted is it clear so what is the third point services provided by bank to savings deposit account holders under pradhan mantri jan dhan yojana then number 4 forex transactions 
including money changing, foreign exchange transactions including money changing that is conversion from one currency to another currency. Then if it is this between banks, between forex dealers, between banks and forex dealers it is exempted. So then when it will be taxable if the said activity is between bank or forex dealer and the customer then only it will be taxable under FCM. Okay. So forex transaction between banks exempted, between forex dealers exempted, between bank and forex dealers also exempted, only one case taxable which case pa? Bank or forex dealer and the customer then it will be taxable under FCM. Then looking to the next point, point number 5. Processing fee, that is whenever you make a card payment, so in the swiping machine, when you use your card and make the payment, so whether full amount is received by the vendor, you go to a shop, you swipe your card and you make the payment. Now whatever payment you made, full amount will be received by the vendor, no. Usually that uh, POS device, the point of sale device whomsoever supplied, that bank will be collecting some processing fee. That processing fee will be between 1% to 3%. On that processing fee, there is GST. Is it clear? On that processing fee, there is GST. Why? Because that processing fee is other consideration. Am I right? That processing fee is other consideration. So, on that processing fee, GST is there. However, if the transaction amount is 2000 rupees, then also processing fee will be there. But on that processing fee, GST is exempted. Is it clear? Sir, whenever you make the card payment, the money will be credited, debited in your account and credited to vendor account. But when it is credited in vendor account, some processing fee will be deducted. But that particular processing fee will be chargeable to GST. However, if the swipe amount does not exceed 2000 rupees, even then processing fee will be there. But that processing fee is exempted from GST. Is it clear? Now, say, Payment gateways are there. For example, I have a website. In that website, I am listing the book. Price of the book, say 500 rupees. Now, 500 rupees does not exceed 2000. Now, you make the payment through Paytm or Razorpay, etc. You will make the payment. Whether I will receive full 500 rupees, no. So, there will be processing fee. Whether GST on this processing fee is taxable or exempted. Taxable, taxable because only in case of card payment, only in case of card payment, this exemption is applicable, not in case of e-commerce payments, okay. Using your mobile online payments you make, na, there this exemption is not applicable. This is only in case of card payment. Is it clear? So, exemption not applicable in case of e-commerce payment, underline that card. Debit card, credit card, charge card or any other card service. Only in case of card payments, this service exemption is applicable. GST on processing fee for a transaction up to 2000 is exempted. What if the payment is through online payment gateway? Then there will be processing fee. Even though the amount does not exceed 2000, even then it will be taxable. That is GST payable on that processing fee. In case of UPI payment, sir, UPI payment, there is no processing fee. If it is like uh, number of limited number of transactions in a year, there is no processing fee. So, therefore, there is no question of GST on that. You understood? Generally, GP and all when you pay, there won't be any deduction, processing fee, full amount. If you scan and pay 500, full 500 rupees will be credited to me. So, therefore, UPI payment you should make, okay. So, so, therefore, why people encourage UPI payment is because of that. Why GPA, UPI payments they encourage is this reason. There is no processing fee and all there. But now, they have given some limited number of transactions. This many transactions only without processing fee. Thereafter, there is processing fee like that. Then once the processing fee comes, whether GST is applicable on the processing fee? Yes, always, whatever may be the amount. But exception is this place. What is that? If it is a card payment, and in that card payment, if the amount does not exceed 2000, then processing fee will be there. But on that processing fee, there is no GST. Are you understanding? Up or respond here. Then, next one, business facilitator to banking company in rural area. That is, we have discussed in RCM, business facilitator 
to banking company. Now, if that business facilitator is working in rural area branch, the commission earned by the business facilitator is exempted. For example, see this. There is a business facilitator, Mr. A, who is appointed for the rural area branch. Now, he provides services to the rural area branch and receives a commission. That commission is exempted. Now, Mr. A will appoint a sub-agent, Mr. X. Who is this Mr. X? Agent of business facilitator. Now, he gets the commission. That commission is also exempted. So, if the main agent's commission is exempted, sub-agent's commission is also exempted. Then, what if they are appointed as agent of business facilitator in urban area branch? For example, if Mr. B is appointed as business facilitator for urban area branch and Mr. B provides services to urban area branch and gets some commission, whether this commission will be taxable? Yes. But on this commission, who will pay GST? Bank or financial institution? Because we studied now five agents. In that five agent, business facilitator to banking company is covered under RCM. So, bank will pay GST under RCM. Now, Mr. Y is appointed as agent of Mr. B. Now, Y will provide service to Mr. B and gets a commission from B. As B's commission is taxable, Y's commission is also taxable. If the main agent's commission is taxable, sub-agent's commission is also taxable. But is this covered under RCM? No. Agent of business facilitator to business facilitator not covered under RCM. Only agent of business correspondent to business correspondent. What are the five agents covered under RCM? Please respond. Insurance agent to insurance company. Recovery agent to bank financial institution NBFC. Then direct selling agent to bank. Business facilitator to bank. Agent of business correspondent to business correspondent. But agent of business facilitator to business facilitator, is it there? No. Means it will be FCM. So who will pay? Agent of business facilitator will pay. From this chart, what is that you can remember? In two simple points. Business facilitator, agent of business facilitator, earning commission from rural area is exempted. And business facilitator shall never pay GST on their outward supply and inward supply. Correct? Ah? Check, check. On outward supply, who will pay? Bank. On inward supply, who will pay? Agent. Means business facilitator shall never pay GST on their outward supplies and inward supplies. So, please write down that. Two points you need to remember from this chart. Business facilitator or agent of business facilitator earning commission from rural area rural area is exempted earning commission from rural area is exempted business facilitator or agent of business facilitator earning commission from rural area is exempted. Second point, business facilitator shall never pay GST, shall never pay GST on inward and outward supplies, on inward and outward supplies. Business facilitator shall never pay GST on inward and outward supplies. On inward supplies, who will pay GST? Okay. So, never pay GST to government. Pa. Never pay GST means you will think that it has exempted. No, no. So, whenever it is taxable, whenever it is taxable, so who will pay GST? So, for outward supplies, bank. For inward supply, agent. Okay. Then, same way business correspondent you see. There is a business correspondent. What is the difference between business facilitator and business correspondent? Business facilitators are mere remittance agents. They will not do any other work. But business correspondent do lot of banking operations. Okay. Now, business correspondent, Mr. A is appointed for rural area branch. Now, provide service to rural area branch and gets a commission. Taxable or exempted? Exempted. Just like business facilitator. Same way Mr. A appoints Mr. X as the agent of business correspondent. As the main agent commission is exempted, sub-agent commission is also exempted. 
and suppose if Mr. B is appointed as business correspondent for urban area branch and gets a commission, that commission will be taxable and is it covered under RCM? Why it is not covered under RCM? Because business correspondent to bank is not covered under RCM, so FCM, who will pay GST? Business correspondent shall pay GST. Then Mr. Y is providing services to Mr. B for which B gives commission. As B's commission is taxable, Y's commission is also taxable. So if the main agent's commission is taxable, sub-agent's commission is also taxable. And whether this is covered under RCM, yes, because agent of business correspondent to business correspondent, it is covered under RCM. So what are the two points you can remember here? Come on. Business correspondent or agent of business correspondent earning commission earning commission from rural area earning commission from rural area is exempted rural area is exempted then next point business correspondent shall always pay gst to government on inward supply outward supply check on inward supply they are paying a on output supply also they are only paying. So business correspondent shall always pay GST, shall always pay GST to government, to government on inward and outward supplies, on inward and outward supplies. So for this two, what is that you need to remember? Business correspondent, business facilitator services. Total four points you need to remember. Come on. Business facilitator, agent of business facilitator, earning commission from rural area exempted. Business facilitator shall never pay GST to government on outward supplies and inward supplies. Then for business correspondent, business correspondent, agent of business correspondent, earning commission from rural area is exempted. Then, business correspondent shall always pay GST to government on inward supplies and outward supplies. Okay? So, we completed banking and other financial service. So, two services we completed. Service in relation to agriculture and banking and other financial service. So, have a look into healthcare services. See, in relation to healthcare services, previously we had four exemptions and they have omitted two exemptions. That is, cord blood banks, cord blood banks which used to preserve stem cells and they will collect some amount. Previously it was exempted and now that is omitted, which means it will become taxable. Same way, biomedical waste treatment operators, so previously that service was exempted and now it is omitted, which means it will be taxable. So now we have only two exemptions. One is healthcare service in relation to human beings is exempted. Healthcare service in relation to animals or birds is exempted. Only two exemptions. What are they? Healthcare service in relation to human beings. Then healthcare service in relation to animals or birds. Now, what is the meaning of healthcare service? Healthcare service means treatment, treatment, that is, so surgery or operation, etc., treatment. And before treatment, what they do? Diagnosis. And after treatment, what they do? Care. So these three, diagnosis, treatment, and care. For what? For any disease, illness, injury, pregnancy. In any recognized system of medicine. So what is recognized system of medicine? Usually it will be given in the question itself. So even otherwise, you should be knowing that allopathy, Homeopathy, Siddha, Ayurvedic, Unani, all these are considered as recognized system of medicine. Even yoga is also considered as recognized system of medicine. Including transportation in an ambulance, but does not include, healthcare service does not include cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery and hair transplantation. These three will not come under healthcare services. However, these three will come under healthcare service if it is to restore the body parts affected due to congenial defects, developmental abnormalities, injury or trauma. So, 
listen cosmetic surgery plastic surgery and hair transplantation will not come under healthcare services but if these three are carried out to restore the anatomy of body parts affected due to congenital defects congenital defects means by birth by birth if there is any issue for that if they receive cosmetic for example a baby born with a cleft lip cleft lip means broken lip so then cosmetic surgery will be done so that will be coming under healthcare service yes then a person met with a fire accident and fully the skin is burnt so then plastic surgery is done so will it be coming under healthcare service yes then developmental abnormalities during the growth stage there could be some imbalances between the left leg right leg left shoulder right shoulder etc some cosmetic surgery is done will that also be coming under healthcare service yes so what is the meaning of healthcare service you have to remember the definition very important so healthcare services means diagnosis treatment and care for what any disease illness injury pregnancy in any system of medicine but healthcare service do not include three things cosmetic surgery plastic surgery and hair transplantation but these three also will come under healthcare service when if carried out to restore the anatomy of body parts affected due to congenital defects developmental abnormalities injury or trauma okay then includes ambulance service also and healthcare services provided in a clinical establishment by an authorized medical practitioner or by a paramedics including ambulance service is exempted this ambulance service is covered separately as well as in the healthcare service what is the difference whether the ambulance service is part of healthcare or not part of healthcare if it is used for transportation of the patient it is exempted for example renting of ambulance taxable or exempted taxable it is not for transportation of patient i am giving the ambulance on rent to you and you pay the rental charges it is not taxable suppose if i am transporting a patient in ambulance but i am not providing the healthcare service just ambulance rent ambulance is used for transportation of passenger uh, transportation of patient then exempted for example i have a medical center pa in my medical center i am not providing treatment to that patient but i have provided the ambulance facility for transporting that patient i collected some money am i going to provide any healthcare service no so now in that case taxable are exempted exempted so this is not a part of healthcare now one hospital is providing ambulance service that is also exempted but renting of ambulance or transportation of passengers in ambulance one ambulance is taking a patient drop the patient in the hospital return it has to come empty so therefore they have boarded five people and collected each person 100 rupees 500 rupees taxable are exempted appa taxable that is not transportation of a patient so apart from transportation of patient any other ambulance service will be taxable understood only transportation of a patient in ambulance is exempted then who is a authorized medical practitioner so any person with a minimum mbbs degree and is registered with medical council is called as a authorized medical practitioner or paramedics who will be paramedics those who assist the authorized medical practitioner like nurse lab technician physiotherapist compounder they will be called as paramedics their service is also exempted and where this service should be provided in a clinical establishment clinical establishment means hospital nursing home clinic or any other place where healthcare service is provided will become a clinical establishment if a doctor comes to your house and do the treatment and collect money will that also be exempted yes so any place where even patients house where the doctor visits and they collect money that will also be treated as exempted okay so therefore what is a healthcare service that is exempted pa healthcare service provided in a clinical establishment or by an authorized medical practitioner or paramedics including ambulance service is exempted okay then healthcare service in relation to animals or birds is exempted these are the two exemptions now we have some special points in relation to this previously room charges was fully exempted but now in relation to room charges they have brought some taxability 
this is an amendment pa previously room charges was fully room charges collected by hospital was fully exempted but now if it is icu charges if it is icu charges intensive care unit charges or critical care unit charges or intensive critical care unit charges or neonatal intensive care unit charges this is for kids pediatrics okay neonatal so all these four are icu charges in single icu charges icu charges will be exempted whatever may be the charges per day it can be 1 lakh rupees per day or 50000 per day or 10000 per day fully it is exempted but other room charges will be exempted if the charges does not exceed 5000 rupees per day if the charges exceeds 5000 rupees per day entirely it will be taxable so very very important definitely this can be tested so hospital collecting room charges for providing room to the patients now if that room charges is 4000 rupees per day what is your answer exempted 5000 rupees per day exempted 6000 rupees per day entirely taxable entirely taxable then next one food supply to inpatients so who are inpatients those who are admitted in the hospital is known as inpatients is part of healthcare service and it is exempted okay what about food supply to outpatients outpatients means those who come for consultation outpatients or visitors or staff etc that will be taxable only food supply to inpatients is part of healthcare service that is exempted then service provided by consulting doctors to hospitals is also exempted generally when we go to a hospital to have a consultation outpatient consultation we pay to the hospital some 500 rupees and out of that 500 rupees hospital will share 300 rupees with the doctor 200 rupees hospital will retain so now that 300 rupees collected by doctor also exempted and that 500 rupees collected by hospital also exempted so but the doctor is a employee there na sir no doctor is not a employee there doctor is a freelancer there which means he is not a employee but every time patient comes out of the money collected from the patient a percentage will be given to the doctor so that money collected by doctor also exempted under which ground services provided by authorized medical practitioner then money collected by hospital also exempted under which ground services provided by clinical establishment okay then next services provided by rehab professionals these rehab professionals will mainly provide the counseling care and counseling to patients who are having some you know kind of addiction towards drugs or depressed or some kind of mental issues so for them so this rehab professionals will provide the services so where this rehab professionals will provide service either in medical establishments or in educational institutions or in rehab centers medical establishments if they are providing services that service will be exempted let that medical establishment be a government medical establishment or trust or a private medical establishment it is exempted clear if suppose that rehab professionals is working in educational institutions let it be government or trust or private fully it is exempted but if they are working in rehab centers mainly in rehab centers so addictions like uh, smoking or alcohol addiction or drug addictions etc so these rehab centers if it is a government or trust owned rehab center then that rehab professional service is exempted if it is a private rehab center then this rehab professional service will be taxable so when it comes to medical establishments and educational institutions let it be government or trust or private it is exempted but when it comes to rehab centers only trust or government rehab center exempted private rehab center rehab professional service will be taxable then next there is a hospital which provided food to the inpatients so that food supply to inpatients inpatients means those who are admitted there is it taxable or exempted exempted suppose if the food is supplied to outpatients visitors or staff then taxable now hospital is giving their premises on rent to an outdoor caterer whether that renting is healthcare service no 
so that renting will be taxable now this outdoor caterer will supply food to home to the outpatients so therefore that will be taxable then hospital is giving their premises on rent to sell the medicines to a pharmacy now that renting will be taxable now this pharmacy selling medicines to inpatients exempted selling medicines to outpatients that will be taxable basically outdoor caterer is not allowed to supply food to the inpatients but if outdoor caterer is supplying food to the inpatients it is treated as sold to outpatients only and it will be taxable is it clear so generally outdoor caterers because hospital only should supply food to the inpatients when they give the premises on rent to an outdoor caterer that outdoor caterer is not supposed to supply food to the inpatients even if that outdoor caterer supply food to the inpatients that will be treated on par with supply to outpatients and that will become taxable understood then we completed healthcare service look into the next one entry tickets there are some entry tickets which are exempted irrespective of the ticket price and some entry tickets are exempted only if the ticket price does not exceed 500 now first uh, irrespective of the ticket price we have eight entry tickets which are exempted so first three related to animals three related to animals zoo tiger reserve and wildlife sanctuary three related to animals zoo tiger reserve wildlife sanctuary these three related to animals then three places three places that is museum then national park and entry to protected monuments okay three places what are those three places museum national park entry to protected monuments protected monuments like taj mahal red fort etc so entry to protected monuments then two sporting events two sporting events that is fifa women's world cup 2020 and afc women's asia cup 2022 so total eight tickets which are exempted irrespective of ticket price so tell me what are the first three related to animals zoo tiger reserve wildlife sanctuary then three places museum national park protected monuments then two sporting events fifa women's world cup 2020 AFC Women's Asia Cup 2022. These were already happened. So, but this point may be given in exam, may not be given in exam. If it is given in exam, we should know. That's why we discussed. Then, there are nine entry tickets which are exempted. If the ticket price does not exceed 500 rupees, what are they? Four performance related. Four performance related. That is, so dance theatrical performance concert and musical performance these four performance related so dance music so music then music also includes concert and theatrical performance that is drama stage shows etc then we have four events four events circus award function then pageant and sporting event pageant means beauty show then sporting event it can be any sporting event recognized or unrecognized sporting event four events what are they circus award function pageant and sporting event and one place that is planetarium now what about cinema theater whether it will be exempted if the ticket price is 400 rupees why not given in this list therefore it will be taxable what about stand up comedy show stand up comedy show Ticket price does not exceed 500. Taxable or exempted? Exempted. It comes under theatrical performance. So, theatrical performance includes not only drama, any kind of theatrical performance. So, even stand-up comedy is also a theatrical performance. So, that is also coming under exempted. Then, entry to theme park, national park, etc. Entry to national park exempted irrespective of ticket price entry to water park theme parks taxable so that is not given in the list understood here yeah? so what are the nine entry tickets exempted uh, ticket price does not exceed 500 for performance related dance music concert theatrical performance then 
four events circus so award function pageant sporting event and one place that is planetary the next uh, pension services contribution under atal pension yojana or any state government operated pension fund is exempted there are lot of people who are providing the pension services so private people also lot of people are there so definitely the future lot of people who are future oriented will be doing this pension services so what is this pension services we have a active life up to 55 years and during that active life we need to invest and after 55 years that is not a active life so still we will be able to generate the income so for that lot of people like icici even uh, you know zero the or brokerage companies banks financial institutions insurance companies lot of people are doing but only two pension services is exempted what are they atal pension yojana that is central government scheme and like that any state government pension scheme these two pension schemes is only exempted one is central government and there is state government central government pension scheme name is atal pension yojana or any pension scheme of state government then so what they will do monthly they will collect some contribution up to your retirement age and after retirement so every month they will pay out of that contribution so therefore this monthly they are collecting now na the amount collected will be exempted what if a private company or a insurance company is collecting this amount will it be taxable or exempted taxable then insurance services total five insurance services which are exempted group life insurance services group life insurance services means so like group of people will form a insurance fund so monthly they contribute that group will contribute some amount towards the insurance fund and if any member in that group dies then out of that group insurance fund amount will be paid to that member that is known as group insurance fund we have group insurance fund for every person so like uh, every professional traders all traders will have one group insurance fund all chartered accountants are having one icci benevolent fund like that cost accountants company secretaries so doctors like that any group of people group of professionals or group of people can have a group insurance fund but not all group insurance funds are exempted only the specified group insurance funds are exempted what are they army navy air force coastal guard central armed police forces five group insurance funds are exempted what are they army navy air force coastal guard central armed police forces then next point services of general insurance business there is a insurance company that insurance company can be government insurance company or a private insurance company that insurance company is providing general insurance services but that particular insurance scheme is notified by government so then the premium collected against that insurance policy will be exempted why government will notify the schemes definitely if it is related to agriculture and farmers or below poverty line or women and unemployed so therefore whenever you read that policy for example premium collected under hut insurance premium collected under hut insurance hut insurance to whom pa who will live in hut below poverty line therefore it is a notified insurance scheme therefore money collected premium collected will be exempted then coconut palm insurance coconut palm insurance premium collected under coconut palm insurance scheme now agriculture and farmers therefore money collected will be exempted then so premium collected with respect to suraksha bima yojana for self employed women then again exempted where it is for women you understood see definitely if they coin a question that should be on notified service only they cannot create a new service is it clear so therefore you just remember this there is a general insurance company that general insurance company is providing services under government notified schemes for which the premium is collected the premium collected is exempted you understood here this 
Then same way, there is a life insurance company. That life insurance company can be government life insurance company or a private life insurance company. But they provide the services under government notified schemes. How do you know that it is a government notified scheme? It will end with the word Yojana. Pradhana Mantri Bhima Yojana. Pradhana Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana. Aam Admi Bhima Yojana. This Yojana and all if you see, definitely it is a government scheme. Because private people and all will not keep this Yojana word. You understood or not? So it is a government scheme. So therefore money collected will be exempted. Then micro life insurance having some assured as 2 lakhs. Not all micro life insurance is exempted. First it should be a micro life insurance and the sum assured should not exceed 2 lakhs. What if it is a micro life insurance with sum assured 4 lakhs? Premium collected will be taxable. So it should be a micro life insurance and the premium collected should not exceed 2 lakhs. Then insurance services provided to government. So government will also want some property, government employees etc. So they will also take insurance now. So whenever an insurance company is providing insurance services to government, they collect premium from the government. That premium collected from the government is exempted. Let it be life insurance or general insurance. Then reinsurance of any exempted insurance service is also exempted. What is this? If the main insurance service is exempted, its reinsurance is also exempted. So insurance company will take reinsurance with another insurance company to mitigate their risk exposure. For example, government has taken insurance with respect to its airport. Airport is 200 crores. So 200 crores is the risk exposure. So now what an insurance company will do to reduce that risk exposure, they will try to take reinsurance with another insurance company and they will share the premium what they get with another insurance company. Whatever premium they get is exempted. Why? Under fourth point, insurance service to government is exempted. As insurance service to government is exempted, its reinsurance is also exempted. Understood? Then, charitable and religious service. In this charitable and religious service, there is a charitable trust registered under 12 AA or 12 AB of Income Tax Act. And they provide certain charitable activities. Those charitable activities is only exempted. First, public health. Public health means what? Creating awareness about the, you know, COVID virus or creating awareness about family planning, HIV. These are all examples of public health. Then, but anyhow, healthcare service is exempted now. Nah. Anyhow, healthcare service is exempted. So, this public health is also exempted. Then, number two, religion, spirituality, yoga. Advancement of religion, spirituality, and yoga. So, all these Babas and Swamiji's, so who make money by advancing religion, spirituality, yoga, the money earned by them will be exempted. Okay. So, one such person constructed one island itself. And he is applying for separate country also in UN. And UN also giving the status as a separate country. So, so, so religion, religion. Religion, spirituality, yoga. Advancement of religion, advancement of spirituality, yoga. Then, educational programs to, third one, educational programs to orphans, physically or mentally traumatized persons or prisoners and persons over 65 years residing in rural area. What if it is educational programs to persons over 65 years in urban area? Taxable. And, to orphans, there are some orphanages, pa. to that orphanages, some NGOs will go and will provide them education for which uh, those NGOs will get some money that is exempted. Physically or mentally traumatized persons also, some training will be provided to them, money collected will be exempted. Prisoners also, so a lot of uh, education will be provided because, you know, the people believe that, you know, those who are having uh, education will not do crime that's uh, a belief but actually it is not true 
people who are educated will do organized crime okay no one will know that and people who are not educated will do unorganized crime that is the only difference but for prisoners and a lot of uh, like uh, you know prison people will be doing graduation etc and all so therefore some ngos will go there and will provide the training to them and persons over 65 years residing in rural area really i don't know what education will be provided to them over 65 years residing in rural area so if we take dt idt class and all by the time the portion gets completed they will die also no pa 65 years pa they are so what education we will provide to them and that service is exempted then number 4 environmental preservation environmental preservation like uh, some wildlife preservation or environmental preservation that is also coming under charitable activity only four charitable activities for these four charitable activities if they collect money then it is exempted what are the four charitable activities number 1 public health number 2 religion spirituality yoga number 3 educational program to whom orphans prisoners mentally physically traumatized persons or persons over 65 years in rural area four environmental preservation apart from this one more point is also there if there is a central government state government or charitable trust run a old age home old age home and if they provide boarding and lodging services to the people aged 60 years or more against a consideration up to 25000 per month per member then it is exempted so that old age home should be run by central government state government or charitable trust to whom they should provide boarding and lodging services Age the sixty years or more. How much monthly they should collect? Twenty five thousand, all inclusive. Okay, then it will be exempted. If it crosses twenty five thousand, but it will not cross twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand is too high amount. Okay, so this is exempted. But actually, this exemption why government has given I don't know because ultimately the burden is on whom? Trust. Ah, trust will collect GST. Pa. if trust collects gst suppose if this is taxable the trust or government will collect gst and in turn the burden will be on whom so kids who send their parents to the old age home correct suppose sir if they are not having kids then the old age home will be free why old age home will be charging so old age home charging means definitely these parents are having kids so let the kids bear the burden with respect to those charges so they have given exemption with respect to this and next so what are the two chari like uh, charitable activities four but apart from that four one more point is exempted here that is if they run a old age home but this is not only for a charitable trust but also by central government or state government then service by person by way of conduct of religious ceremony who will conduct religious ceremony priest purohit etc so they conduct the religious ceremony and they collect some money for that that money collected by them will be fully exempted they are not required to pay any gst on that even if they cross 20 lakhs 30 lakhs 40 lakhs whatever may be the limit they are not required to pay gst okay it's fine because at least they you know put a effort and they earn money that is exempted but these donkeys in the name of religion spirituality and yoga do nothing and they earn money and they are exempted what logic it is pa so at least these people will go to some place and recite something and they will get the marriage done or get the social function completed fine some effort is there so for that effort fine we should give it exempted but these people sit in one corner and speak all shit enjoy with babes but they will be exempted okay so special services services by special organization for religious pilgrimage what are considered as religious pilgrimage only two are considered as religious pilgrimage kailash manasarovar yatra and haj yatra these two only considered as religious pilgrimage but not by all only by the special organization means it should be a government notified organization and if they provide this religious pilgrimage collect money that money collected will be exempted then services by specified organization so previously we had sebi 
SEBI in the list. Now SEBI is omitted. SEBI is not there. And IRDA was there in the list previously. That IRDA is also omitted. Previously SEBI and IRDA was a speci specified organization. If they receive any money, that will be exempted. But now that is omitted. Means SEBI earning money, taxable or exempted? Taxable. IRDA, Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority earning money, taxable or exempted? Taxable. Only these specified organizations, what are they? ESIC, Employee State Insurance Corporation, from whom they will collect money from the factories, which provides the insurance to their workers. Then, EPFO, Employee Provident Fund Organization, from whom they will collect money, employer and employee. In salaries, you would have studied, na? Employer, PF contribution, employee, PF contribution, that one. Then, like how EPFO is for normal employee provident fund contribution, like that, CMPFO is there for coal mines, people who work in coal mines, workers. Coal mine provident fund organization, same. EPFO and the CMPFO, both will provide the same service, that is provident fund. Monthly, they will collect from employer, employee, they will accumulate it and thereafter it will be given to the employee, okay, like a savings. Then NCCCD refers to National Center for Cold Chain Development. They will provide the technical assistance in relation to starting a cold storage. For that they collect some money that is exempted. Then NPS Trust, National Pension System Trust. So they collect some money for providing pension services as well as insurance services that is exempted. Then foreign diplomatic mission located in India. So who is foreign diplomatic mission? Specified agencies of UN, UNESCO, UNICEF, WHO, etc. And embassy, embassies will be there in India which provide the relationship between two countries, cordial relation between two countries. Then consulates which will process the visa to visit their country. So the specified agencies of UN, embassy and consulate are called as foreign diplomatic missions and they collect some money, they earn some money that is exempted. So their outward supply is exempted. So what are the specified organizations pa? ESIC, EPFO, CMPFO, Coleman Provident Fund Organization, NPS Trust and then NCCCD, National Center for Cold Chain Development and Foreign Diplomatic Mission. Okay. Then, in everywhere, whatever we are coming across in exemption, wherever there is a monetary limit, if you cross that monetary limit, entirely it is taxable. For example, we have come across one place where if uh, that is a swipe amount 2000 rupees, if it exceeds 2000, entirely taxable. Then entry ticket 500, if it exceeds 500, entirely it will be taxable. Are you understanding this? But in this place, incubating services, if it exceeds that limit, only that excess amount will be taxable. So we need to understand incubate, incubator and incubati. China government is incubator and in one laboratory, they have developed, they have made the scientist to develop a COVID vaccine. That laboratory in Wuhan is incubate, okay? That Wuhan is a laboratory. In that laboratory, so they have employed some scientists to create this, okay? Yes, it's a bio war. So, China will not agree to this, but we know that fact. So, COVID is not natural. It is a man-made virus. So, like that in future, lot of virus will be coming and... So, we have to face that, no other go, because gone are the days where they used atom bombs, etc. and all for going on a war. Now it is not. So, these are all waste, because weapons will be costly, but virus cheap, you understood or not, we can just release it and so therefore in Wuhan laboratory, they created this virus, so that laboratory is called as incubate. So, what is incubate? Incubate is a laboratory where research will be carried out. And the owner of the laboratory, who is the owner of the laboratory? China government, incubator. And the one who developed the, you know, like technology or any virus, etc., they will be called as incubati. That is the scientist who is working over there. Understood or not? So, incubate means what? A laboratory where research is done. 
Incubator is the owner of that laboratory. Incubate is the one who is working in that laboratory. Okay. Now, incubate receives money from the incubator. That money received from the incubator is exempted up to 50 lakhs. Means if it crosses 50 lakhs, excess amount only taxable. Up to 50 lakhs is exempted. If it crosses 50 lakhs, only the excess amount will be taxable. And for this, two conditions should be satisfied for this exemption. Condition number one, previous year their gross receipts does not exceed 50 lakhs and this exemption is available for a period of three years from the date of signing the contract. Understood? So, what are the conditions for exemption? Previous year aggregate receipts does not exceed 50 lakhs and this exemption is available for a period of three years from the date of signing the contract. Then, incubator services is always exempted provided that incubator is approved by government of India. What if they are not a government approved incubator, then it will be taxable. So, there should be government approved incubator. So, incubator service, what is the answer? Exempted if they are approved by government. Taxable if they are not approved by government. Incubate services, come on. Up to 50 lakhs exempted, beyond 50 lakhs taxable and this exemption is available if turnover during previous year does not exceed 50 lakhs and this exemption is for a period of 3 years from the date of signing the contract. Now see this illustration in the next page. A limited is an incubating. First year they got gross receipt 60 lakhs and how much is exempted? 50 lakhs is exempted. So what will be taxable? Only 10 lakhs. Second year will they get exemption? No, why they will not get exemption in the second year? Because previous year it exceeds 50 lakhs. So, second year they will not get exemption. Second year it is 40 lakhs. So, full 40 lakhs will be taxable. What about third year? Third year 70 lakhs. Whether they get exemption for the third year? Yes. Why? Because second year it does not exceed 50 lakhs. A second year it does not exceed 50 lakhs. So, therefore, third year they will get exemption. And therefore, 70 minus 50 remaining 20 lakhs will be taxable. Next year, fourth year will they get exemption? Why? The exemption is only for a period of three years, three years over. So, fourth year onwards, whatever may be the amount, they will not get exemption. Then, next one is education services. Education services. So, look into this uh, fifth point first part. Look into fifth point first. Service provided by an education institution to its students, faculty and staff is exempted. So, what is the meaning of an educational institution? Educational institution can be category 1 that is up to 12th standard. So, education starts where starting point can be any. It can be preschool or it can be play school etc. But what is category 1 up to 12th standard? Okay. Then category 2. Education for obtaining a qualification recognized by law. What will come here? UG, PG, professional education that will come here. Then category 3, approved vocational education that is skill based centers like polytechnic colleges, industrial training institute or industrial training center. So, which provides diploma that will be called as approved vocational education. Okay. So, what are the three educational institutions pa? Up to? 12th standard category 1 education as a part of curriculum for obtaining a qualification by law that is category 2 colleges etc then category 3 approved vocational education if these three educational institutions provide any service to whom student faculty and staff that service will be exempted now listen suppose if ICI is collecting exam fees and registration fees from you is it taxable or exempted? Why exempted? ICI is a second category education institution and they collect any money from you. So, that will be exempted. Is it clear? Now, if a private coaching center is collecting fees from you for providing coaching, will it be taxable or exempted? Taxable. Why? Because private coaching center is not an educational institution. Same way, a school Provi providing education and collecting school fees. So, not only school fees, book fees, not only book fees, uniform fees, not only uniform fees, extracurricular activities, bus fees, co-curricular activities, 
library fees, all these fees, ID card not wearing fees, so uniform not wearing fees, attendance not maintained fees, every kind of fees, hall ticket issuance fees, eligibility certificate issuance fees, then transfer certificate issuance fees, everything, mark sheet also if you are getting you need to pay some amount, every kind of fees collected by the school will be taxable or exempted, exempted because category 1 education institution. Now a college collecting money from the corporates for allowing the corporates to interview their students and select that students. Now whether the money received by the college from the corporate is taxable or exempted? Taxable because that is not services provided to students, faculty and staff that is services provided to others. So therefore it will be taxable then. Say there is a college which will be providing bus facility to its faculty and staff. Students they will provide. So faculty and staff, even that money collected is also exempted, yes. So in short what you need to remember pa, any service provided by education institution to its students, faculty and staff is exempted. Education institution means up to 12th standard, education as a part of curriculum for obtaining a qualification by law and approved occasional education. Then, now look into the first point. Generally, educational institutions will be conducting entrance exam and they will collect some fee for conducting entrance exam. Whether that entrance exam fee will be exempted because those people from whom they are collecting entrance exam fee are not at students of that educational institution. See, once they become the students of that educational institution, if any amount is collected from them, it is exempted. But they are not at students. They have to write the entrance exam. They need to qualify the entrance exam. Then only they will, give the, they will be given a seat there. Correct. Until that point of time, they are not students. Even then, the entrance exam fee collected by the educational institution is exempted. See the first point. Service provided by education institution by way of conduct of entrance examination. But who should conduct this entrance examination here? Educational institution. Against consideration in the form of entrance exam fee is exempted. Then second point, amount paid to training providers under Deen Dayal Upadhyaya Gramina Kausal Yojana, DDUGKY scheme. Under this DDUGKY scheme, so some training providers will go to the rural area and will be providing them some skills for the purpose of you know starting a small scale industry there like how to make paper bags, how to make paper cups etc or stitching, tailoring. So these kind of skills and all will be taught to them in rural area and based on this either they will get some job or they will set up one small scale industry and they will earn some money. So for that purpose, these training providers will be receiving some money from government of India. So that money earned by these training providers is exempted. Clear here? So under this DDUG KY scheme, what they do? These training providers do? They will provide training in relation to vocational education courses certified by NCVT. For doing this, they will get some money. That money earned by them will be exempted. Then number three, services provided with respect to a training program for which 75% or more of the total expenditure is borne by central government, state government or union territory. Say, we are providing CA foundation coaching to below poverty line students or minority students. This is 40,000 rupees and in this 40,000 rupees, government has given 30,000 rupees, student has given 10,000 rupees. As we are providing education to below poverty line or minority students, definitely government will come forward to pay the money. So now government has paid 30,000, student has paid 40,000. What is the government's share? How much government has given? What is the percentage given by government? 30,000 divided by 40,000. Please see how much? How much? Exactly. 75%. So now, what is exempted here? Exempted or not exempted? Exempted. What is exempted? The 30,000 receipt from government is exempted or entire 40,000 is exempted. Entire 40,000 is exempted. The training program is exempted. Can you remember this point? Pa? So please understand. 
here the exemption is not with respect to amount collected from the government the exemption is what exemption with respect to the training program so suppose in this example if 25000 is given by government and 15000 is given by the student then taxable or exempted or why because government contribution is how much less than 75% so what is taxable money received from student or both both will be taxable okay then any service provided by national skill development corporation this is one entity nsdc is one entity set up by government and below this nsdc there will be sector skill council and below this sector skill council there will be assessment agent or training partner these people will provide some skills like uh, you know stock market training basic computer education animations etc or tally like that this kind of skills are provided by these people so for that whatever money collected by them will be exempted so who are the four people pa nsdc national skill development corporation ssc sector skill council assessment agent or training partner if they collect money from the people for providing the training that money collected by them is exempted then look into the sixth point services provided to education institution this is not service provided by education institution what is the difference between fifth point and sixth point fifth point is service provided by education institution this is service provided to education institution service provided to education institution transportation of students faculty and staff so four activities pa so this is service provided to education institution there is a education institution to that education institution i am providing service what service i am providing transportation service i am providing security service i am providing housekeeping service i am providing catering service these four services are provided to education institution which education institution category 1 education institution now i collect some money from the education institution that will be exempted for example there is a college that college is providing food to their students now i supplied food to the college and got some money from the college taxable or exempted or taxable why because college is not a category 1 education institution suppose if the same food is supplied to a school and i get some money from the school whether it will be taxable or exempted exempted so what are the four activities provided to uh, provided to category 1 education institution is exempted come on transportation of students faculty and staff security and housekeeping services then catering services then this security and housekeeping service should be within premises this security and housekeeping service should be within premises within premises then only it will be exempted for example one school is conducting a annual day function in one auditorium pa one private auditorium now for that annual day function they received security services or housekeeping services whether that security and housekeeping service received by that school for that annual day function will be taxable or exempted taxable because that is not within the premises now in that auditorium they are conducting the annual day they need to provide food to the students so they received catering service whether that catering service will be taxable or exempted exempted why because catering service provided to category 1 can be anywhere it can be within the premises or it can be outside the premises it will be exempted but security and housekeeping service should be within premises then only it will be exempted then next one admission to or conduct of examination that is there is an education institution which is appointing some marketing agent that marketing agents will be doing marketing for bringing the admissions to that education institution for every admission that marketing agent will receive some money that money received by the marketing agents will be exempted so admission to education institution same way conduct of examination of that education institution that is i have a place and i gave this place on rent to education institution okay for conducting exam now i got some rent whether that rent will be taxable or exempted exempted this case why renting of property for what purpose conduct of examination now i set a question paper 
for setting question paper i get some money exempted i am invigilating i get some money exempted i am doing evaluation for doing evaluation i get some money exempted all this will come under conduct of examination that is exempted then online period whether this is exempted for all three category institutions yes then online periodicals and journals for which educational institution it is required online periodicals and journals only for category 2 logically that's why for category 2 only they have given exemption for category 1 if they receive taxable category 3 if they receive taxable now tell me what are the services provided to educational institution is exempted this point to educational institution transportation security housekeeping catering to category 1 in that security and housekeeping should be within the premises good and then next one admission to or conduct of examination all three category institutions it is exempted then next one online periodicals and journals only with respect to category 2 is exempted then next uh, training in recreational activities relating to arts and culture this should be by an individual say for example i started one dance uh, class okay so this uh, salsa like that one dance class this salsa is not classical let it be classical or western any kind of art okay it comes under art yes sir no dance school or dance classes will come under arts yes now i collected fees the fees collected by me will be exempted suppose if this dance school is owned by a partnership firm and if that partnership firm collect the money from the students for providing dance training in dance whether it will be taxable or exempted taxable because now there is an amendment that it should be by an individual so this training in recreational activities relating to arts or culture should be by an individual this is an amendment should be by an individual what if it is by any other person taxable arts means what will come under arts so all kind of extra curricular activities here recreational activities like dancing or singing classes music classes or painting classes then uh, even chess classes okay so all kind of arts will be coming there including martial arts karate classes then culture it is languages language or vedas upanishads etc then sports training in recreational activities relating to sports what is the condition here that sports academy should register as a trust that sports academy should register as a trust then only the money collected by them is exempted there is a abc cricket academy that abc cricket academy is registered as a trust now they will provide training in cricket for which they collect money taxable or exempted exempted mr cricket academy which is not a trust now they collect some money for training in cricket so whether the money collected by them is taxable or exempted taxable then services by assessment bodies under skill development initiative scheme skill development initiative scheme means so they will invite people from the industry to review the curriculum for reviewing the curriculum so because people from the industry better knows what kind of skills that are required so therefore they will review the curriculum for reviewing the curriculum these people from the industry get some money so those people from the industry is known as assessment bodies they get some money from government that money received by them is exempted then this point already we discussed educational program where at least 75% of the total expenditure is borne by government okay given this example only i gave ca coaching provided to bpl students for which greater than or equals to 75% of the fee is collected from state government such coaching is exempted then suppose if it is to students with disabilities if entire expenditure is borne by government then it will be exempted coaching services to students provided by coaching institutions and ngos under central sector scheme for scholarship for students with disabilities but here entire expenditure should be borne by government then the money collected will be exempted and related to education we have some circular spa that is there are some maritime training institutes this maritime training institutes will provide practical training on how to operate a ship 
what are the parts of the ship etc to marine engineering students so they have to undergo this practical training then only they will be provided a degree called as marine engineering okay so therefore is this maritime training institutes coming under education institutions only after training they will be given qualification correct which means it's a part of curriculum or not part of curriculum part of curriculum so this maritime training institutes are treated as education institution so therefore the fees collected by them will be exempted so see this maritime training institutes and their training courses are approved by dg directorate general of shipping which are duly recognized under the provisions of merchant shipping act and are educational institutions therefore fee collected by them will be exempted then next uh, anganwadi schools what are anganwadi schools uh, mainly what they do preschool play school so they provide the daycare facility and also they will provide food to the students food to the kids correct so now in this case they will cook food or they will buy food cook food some anganwadi schools may purchase the food also correct now there is an outdoor catering that outdoor caterer provided the food to the anganwadi schools and collected some money from anganwadi school is it taxable or exempted we have discussed services provided to education institution read that and tell me services provided to education institution read don't look at my face please look into the book so look into that services provided to education institution what are the four activities which is exempted to category 1 transportation security and housekeeping catering catering is there na and is anganwadi school category 1 education institution yes yes so because category 1 education institution is up to 12th standard it includes everything play school day care everything will be covered there so catering service provided to category 1 education institution is exempted so catering service provided to anganwadi school is also covered under exemption then next there are some examination boards this examination board job is just to conduct the exam and give the rank depending upon that rank the student will be joining in a college which accepts that rank for example neat you take neat exam national board of examination will be conducting neat exam so this neat exam when they conduct they give the rank but they will not give the admission into medical college now depending upon that rank this rank for example you got so 208 rank 208 rank some colleges will accept so therefore you can go and join in that college you got somewhere 26000 rank so 26000 rank means for that rank some colleges will accept so you need to go and join in that college you understood or not so therefore this examination board is it giving admission no means whether entrance exam fee collected by them will be taxable or exempted is the question here so now if it is an education institution the entrance exam fee collected by them is exempted that's the first point we studied please refer first point you see any entrance exam fee collected by an educational institution is exempted so is this examination board an educational institution or not yes it is an educational institution so therefore even though they are not providing any education but the entrance exam fee collected by them is called as exempted see this gst is exempted on services provided by central or state examination boards so the central or state examination boards will conduct only entrance exam and therefore based on this entrance exam we get admission to education institution so therefore whatever fee collected by these examination boards is also exempted then next one suppose if these examination boards receives any services for conducting the examination like printing of question papers or online exam services etc whether that service is also exempted please look into point number 6 conduct of examination of all category institution is exempted correct or not when i provide this service by way of conduct of examination of all category institution it is exempted so gst is also exempt on input service relating to admission to or conduct of examination of that examination boards 
then next uh, this is one other point there will be some guest anchors who will be invited so in tv channels for hosting the show for example big boss big boss show kamal hasan has hosted the show for which he will be receiving some money so actually for one episode he will be getting 1 and 1/2 crore okay for hosting one episode he will get 1 and 1/2 crore as the remuneration one episode means one week that is the count one week in the sense like two days so saturday sunday so 1 and 1/2 crore he will be getting pa taxable or exempted anywhere we studied like exempted like that no so that will be taxable see that services provided by guest anchors invited by the tv channels for participating in their shows in lieu of honorarium attracts gst liability however this guest anchors turnover does not exceed 20 lakhs hmm. 20 lakhs sir. so if it does not exceed 20 lakhs then they are not required to register and pay gst so definitely their turnover and all will cross pa 20 lakhs long back okay when he acted as child actor itself it would have crossed okay so see the next one generally toll charges generally toll charges is exempted pa generally toll charges is exempted what is toll charges means so whenever we are using some roads highways etc so we pay toll charges that's okay but who will collect the toll charges the person who laid down the road so listen carefully government actually should lay down the road but they don't have money because whatever money they have they constructed statues buildings and all so they don't have money to lay down the road then what government will do they will be giving this work of laying down the road to some builders so like uh, gmr properties or lnt etc these people what they will do they will lay down the road with their own money now they have invested now they need to recover that investment now how they will recover the investment by collecting the toll charges from the vehicles which are going in that route so this toll charges is actually recovery of investment therefore toll charges is exempted now if you are taking your car and going in a toll gate if you don't have fast tag you need to pay extra charges you know that if you have fast tag the regular toll charges if you don't have fast tag sticker then you have to pay double okay now this extra charges collected for not having a fast tag is the charges also exempted yes you read this point point number 6 the additional amount collected from the users of the road not having a functional fast tag is in the nature of toll charges and should be treated as additional toll charges therefore it is clarified that additional fee collected in the form of higher toll charges from vehicles not having fast tag is also toll charges and therefore it is exempted this is an amendment pa then next toll charges collected by way of annuity is also exempted listen carefully toll charges collected by way of annuity is also exempted what is this toll charges by way of annuity means i will be using my car on a daily basis because my house is in outside the toll gate and my office is this side of the toll gate so daily i will be coming and going so which means every time i have to pay toll charges which is actually costly for me therefore yearly i will pay some fixed amount that is known as toll charges by way of annuity rather than paying the toll charges every time i go in the road yearly i will pay so any n number of times i operate that toll gate i don't have to pay any extra toll charges is it clear or not this is known as what toll charges by way of annuity that toll charges is also exempted now there is one circular here that is government is asking a builder to lay down a road and collect not from the people but from the government toll charges by way of annuity you understood again i am repeating builder instead of collecting from the people they are collecting the annuities from whom government will it also be called as toll charges by way of annuity and is it exempted no 
only when the money is collected from the people, then only it is exempted. If money is collected from the government, this will come under services provided to government. Therefore, that will be taxable. See this circular. GST is applicable on annuities paid for construction of a road where certain portion of the consideration is received upfront while remaining amount is made through deferred payment annuity spread over years. So therefore, annuities, toll charges by way of annuities even though exempted, but when it will be exempted only when it is collected from general public, when it is collected from government, okay, when it is collected from government for construction of road, so then it will be taxable, okay. Next, one more circular path, this is a very very important one, liquidated damages. So this circular only in, uh, you know, your uh, supplementary study material, they have given for four pages. So just I have converted that entire circular into a half page information. So this half page, if you remember, that is sufficient, okay. So please concentrate, control uh, your outflow, etc. for some time and listen, okay. So anyhow, I am giving break for every two hours. Then also like in cinema theatre, you know, people are going pa. So control, no, at least two hours, sugar problem you have or what. So for every two hours, I am giving a break, okay. And that too, I inquired, so toilets and all also, lot of toilets are there. So then what is your problem? The time is not sufficient. Huh? So, okay, fine. So, but this is important area. Please control outflow and listen, okay. Liquidated damages. Liquidated damages means like uh, consideration on account of breach of contracts. So, yesterday we discussed consideration for tolerating an act, tolerating non-performance of a contract or breach of contract, etc. That is this. So, see this. First, what is liquidated damages means? When a contract has been broken, the party which suffers by such breach, the party which suffers by such breach is entitled to receive from the other party compensation for any loss or damage caused to him. That is known as liquidated damages. I entered into contract with you. You breach the contract. When you breach the contract, you pay me some compensation because I am having suffering the loss because of you. So that compensation is known as liquidated damages. Is it clear? So again, I am repeating. First, we enter into contract and the contract has been broken by either party. Any party can break the contract. The party which suffers the, that suffers by such breach, means which suffers the loss or which suffers the damage. So we'll receive a compensation from the other party who committed the breach, correct? So that compensation received for loss or damage is known as liquidated damages. Now, what is the treatment of this liquidated damages? This liquidated damages are divided into two. Mere compensation to compensate the loss or damage or injury and it is nowhere specified in the contract. It is nowhere specified in the contract, but so we have paid that compensation even though not specified in the contract. Then this compensation will not be treated as consideration because it is not arising out of contract, correct or not. So therefore, it is not treated as consideration and it will not be taxable. Example, so coal scam has happened in 1992. In that coal scam, what has happened? So first government has allocated the coal blocks to lot of people, these mining holders to extract the coal. But these were allocated at a very less rate. So Supreme Court gave order that all the coal blocks allocated should be called back. So because there are lot of issues in respect of this you know, allocation, so lot of scams has happened, so a lot of politicians are involved, so call back, government is at loss. Now all that got called back. And as a compensation, so government has paid some amount to the people to whom they already allocated the coal blocks. You understood? Is that compensation mentioned in the contract? No, not mentioned in the contract. They did not mention that. 
if we call back the coal blocks allocation, we will pay you compensation. Like that, they did not specify. So, which means that this compensation payable is mere loss, even though not specified. For example, one more example I will give you. Say, I floated one batch. So, CA final indirect tax regular batch. So, I collected fees from you. And what has happened? I cancelled the batch. And I returned the fees. Plus, I returned to every student 5,000 rupees extra. Why? Because I cancelled the batch and you would have made arrangement that so you will be attending these classes. So, therefore, I cancelled that batch. Then I gave that 5,000 rupees to you. You understood or not? Sir, why CA final? Hey, you will not come or what? You will come? No. You have intention to come? No. So, just a matter of time. So, this attempt you are going to qualify and next attempt onwards you will be into CA final. Simple. Okay. So, have the positivity part. Don't think always you know, whether I will clear or not like that. You will clear. Yeah? If not you, who will clear? Huh? Tell me. So, if not you, which idiot will be coming and sitting in this Mailapur Fine Arts Club from morning to evening? Only you will sit. So, only you will clear. You understood or not? So, therefore, uh, don't have the feeling. Daily morning when you get up, no. Do this. It will work out. That... This attempt I am going to clear at any cost. You believe in that first. So, only when you believe in that, you will be able to do the hard work. Okay. And your hard work also will be paid off. So, don't think, yo, this attempt will I clear or not. Okay, this attempt I will skip. So, next attempt I will write. Sitting in the exam hall, you will think, okay. So, this exam, okay, poche. So, tomorrow onwards, I will sit and prepare properly like that thought will come. No. So, why you have to clear? So, others are clearing, na? not that, you know, that uh, pass percentage is point something. Pass percentage is decent. That to May 23, November 23 is a stock clearance, okay? So, because May 24 is new syllabus. May 24, they don't want any kind of old stock to be continued in the new syllabus. So, they want to clear off the entire scrap. So, due to that reason, these two attempts are golden attempts. May 23, November 23. So, definitely you will be able to clear. Okay. So, have little bit of hard work. You won't believe. Trust me because I have seen two times this change in syllabus. Every time. That is from PCC to IPCC. IPCC to CA intermediate. Two times I have seen. Same thing happened. When a new syllabus is going to come, the last one or two attempts will be easy. And they will give 35%, 40% also pass percentage. It happened. It happened. So, therefore, you will be in that pass percentage. You are going to clear. Okay. So, therefore, little bit of effort only you need to put. Don't leave this attempt. May 23 attempt, you get fever or you get dickivali, whatever it may be. So, you have to write, you understood. You have to write this attempt and maybe you are splitting and writing one one group also, fine. But May 23 and November 23, you should never miss these attempts. You have to write, fine. So, believe in yourself, you are going to clear, okay. Now, so, this amount what I paid to you, 5,000 rupees for cancellation of the batch, will that be coming under compensation arising out of contract or not out of contract? Not out of contract. Where did I agree? I did not agree. But as a gratitude I have given. So, now in this case, will it be treated as consideration? No. It is not treated as consideration. Consequently, it will not be taxable. Suppose, if that liquidated damages or compensation is specified in the contract, specified in the contract, agreed between the parties, then whether these charges are in the nature of penalizing a person to discourage such act, then it is, again it is not treated as consideration and not taxable. Example, traffic fines. Traffic fine is whether it is as per the contract agreed between the parties? Yes, sir. 
the moment you take a driving license and you take a registration certificate for that vehicle you are agreeing to abide by the traffic rules so as you are agreed to abide by the traffic rules now in that case so you have breached the traffic rules when you breach the traffic rules so the traffic fine you are paying so it is like what nature discouraging a person encouraging a person discouraging a person so therefore it will not be treated as consideration same way so check dishonor charges check dishonor charges is also agreed between the bank and the account holder now this check dishonor charges is to discourage a person or to encourage the person discourage the person because they don't want that to happen then another example eb bill you did not pay on time for which they collected a late fee so this is usual not to discourage a person because they know that eb bill all of a sudden we will not be able to pay so therefore we will not have money so that's why they are giving a little extra time for which we have to pay late late fee so that late fee is other cases not to penalize or discourage a person but usually it is allowed so then that will be treated as consideration and taxability depends upon principal supply okay now so this we will see with the examples that are provided in the circular okay so this is actually given in the supplementary study material and even i have given this in uh, amendments material you see this first coal block scam coal block scam for what purpose pa coal block scam no where it is specified no where it is specified and this compensation has been given now where it will come is it read as consideration no why it is not read as consideration because it is mere compensation not arising out of contract so not read as consideration not taxable check dishonor or fine or penalty is it agreed between the parties yes but this is mainly to penalize a person or discourage a person correct or not so therefore again it is not treated as consideration and not taxable say this therefore check dishonor or fine or penalty is not a consideration for any service and not taxable then penalty imposed for violation of law where it will come again discourage a person or penalizing a person so therefore it will not be treated as consideration then per feature of salary or payment of bond amount in the event of an employee leaving the employment below, before the minimum agreed period notice you are not serving pa leaving the employment without serving notice you have to pay the money na to the employer now where it will come is it like penalizing a person and discouraging a person from not doing that activity yes because that should not set a bad precedence see not that employer is agreeing so employer don't want that to happen so again this is like discouraging a person or penalizing a person therefore such amounts recovered by employer are not taxable as consideration for the service of agreeing to tolerate an act then next one this see this cancellation charges cancellation charges train ticket cancellation charges train ticket cancellation charges whether the railways wanted to penalize or discourage a person or they are agreeing to this they are agreeing to this okay because that seat they are going to give it to other person you understood or not so this cancellation charges will be treated as value consideration yes and it will be included in the value of original supply and taxable accordingly what does it mean generally ac ticket is taxable so the cancellation charges for ac ticket is also taxable sleeper class ticket is exempted so the cancellation charges for sleeper class ticket is also exempted is it clear say this cancellation fee cancellation charges of railway ticket for a class would attract gst at the same rate applicable to the class of travel okay understood here so these are some examples which are given in uh, you know this uh, circular here so what you need to remember first liquidated damages 
arising out of contract not arising out of contract arising out of contract what is your answer not treated as consideration consequently it will not be taxable not arising out of contract okay arising out of contract specified in the contract agreed between the parties is it like penalizing a person to discourage such act yes then again it is not treated as consideration and non taxable other cases treated as consideration and taxability depends upon principal supply if the principal supply is taxable this liquidated damage is also taxable if the principal supply is exempted this liquidated damage is also exempted that's it so that is with respect to this circulars that we have the next one next area is government services so we have completed so far education services healthcare services and entry tickets and various circulars that we have okay banking agriculture also over now looking into government services concentrate pa we'll take break at 115 okay so listen only half an hour more concentrate one o'clock you need break ah okay 20 minutes concentrate listen so that is government services is divided into two broadly specified activities and other activities what are the four specified activities which are covered under supply department of post transportation of goods or passengers airport or port and services to business entities these four activities are covered under supply and all other activities of government is excluded from supply long back we discussed now concentrate on department of post there is one amendment previously what we have learnt is speed post express parcel post life insurance agency service is taxable and all other activities of department of post is exempted like that we would have studied but actually that is amended pa so now only three activities of department of post is exempted what are they postcard inland letter and envelope with less than 10 grams these three are only exempted all other activities of department of post is now taxable under fcm for example speed post speed post taxable express parcel post taxable money order taxable then we have even uh, registered post book post that is also taxable and then this aadhar card enrollment we have to pay some amount that is also taxable like that every other service provided by department of post apart from postcard inland letter and envelope less than 10 grams envelope less than 10 grams means only paper can be sent pa so nothing else so that alone is exempted all other cases taxable under fcm this three also they should have taxed it so simply we would have remembered everything is taxable then so transportation of goods or passengers we will discuss later after this then services to aircraft or vessel inside or outside the precincts of a port or airport is always taxable transportation service depends because government transportation service and private transportation service are treated on par so when we learn transportation that is common between government and private so that's why i am not discussing it here it will be later transportation service then airport or port service will always be taxable then services provided to business entity the services provided to business entity we have 14 specific exemptions and two general exemptions and other cases it will be taxable now we are discussing the 14 specific exemptions with respect to services provided by government to business entity so these are the 14 specified activities specific exemptions previously in this also there is an amendment pa previously we had one point services provided by so municipality or panchayat under article 243g or w of the constitution is exempted like that that point is omitted that is not there so we have only these 14 points concentrate first one charges collected under right to information act what is that you apply na your answer sheet you write the exam after exam you apply for your answer sheet through rti free yeah? you have to pay charges uh. pay charges those charges are exempted so under right to information act to get the information 
we pay some charges, that charges collected will be exempted. Then number two, interdepartmental services. For example, income tax department is going for a search or raid. Now, income tax department is going for a raid, they will definitely take the help of police department. So, state government police department is providing services to income tax department. That is known as interdepartmental services. So, one department of CGRSG to another department of CGRSG that is exempted. Now, sir, government will come under business entity, sir. Yes. If you <coughs> see business definition, the last point in business definition is government activities is also treated as business. Please check. Segment number 2 you take, in that segment number 2, business definition you see, section 2 class 17, general meaning and specified activities you can see, in that specified activities, so you have last activity, all activities of government is treated as business, can you find that? So therefore, government activities are treated as business, which means government is also a business entity, okay? Now, come back to this. So, interdepartmental services. Now, third point, assignment of right to use telecom spectrum. Telecom spectrum means radio frequency waves. This telecom spectrum is owned by government. Government will give the telecom spectrum like 2G, 3G, 4G, etc. to telecom operators. For that, they will be collecting one-time charges and annual royalty that one-time charges collected will be exempted and even annual royalty collected is also exempted provided the right that is the telecom right or telecom license is assigned before 1-4-2016. What if the telecom license is assigned after 1-4-2016? So, it will be taxable. So, telecom license should be given when? Before 1-4-2016. For that one-time charges or annual royalty may come even in 2023. Is it clear? Still they are using now 2G, 3G. What year? Mobile, if you go to outskirts of Chennai, so automatically in your mobile, EDGE, GPRS and all will come. Okay. So that is 2G service. So therefore, they will be downgrading the network. So still mobile networks, operators are using that network for which they will pay annual royalty. That annual royalty collected will be exempted. Provided the assignment of right is before 1-4-2016. Now you read third point and fourth point and tell me what is the difference. What is the difference between third and fourth point? Third point is telecom operator, uh, telecom spectrum. Then fourth point is natural resource. Next. Third point, both one-time charges and annual royalty exempted. But in fourth point... Only one-time charges. Assignment of right to use other natural resources. Example, coal mines, bauxite mines, or any other mineral reserves, extraction, crude oil, etc. Then, assignment, fourth point, fifth point, what is the difference? Fourth and fifth point. So, fourth point is any person. Fifth point is individual farmer. And fourth point assigned before 1-4-2016. Fifth point assigned any time. And in fifth point, both one-time charges and annual right, everything will be exempted. So, government owns land, agricultural land. That agricultural land, they will give it to the farmer for the purpose of cultivation. The farmer has to pay some royalty to the government. That royalty collected by the government is exempted. Then, next one, registration charges under any law. Can you give me an example of some registration charges? You incorporate a company, you have to pay registration charges. You buy a vehicle, you have to pay registration charges. You buy a property, you have to pay registration charges. All those registration charges are exempted. We don't have to pay GST on that. Then, safety certificate charges. Safety certificate charges means whenever there are some factories, educational institutions, hospitals, shopping complexes, malls, cinema theatres are dealing with public at large. They need to maintain necessary safety arrangements. For maintaining that safety arrangements, they need to get a certificate from a safety officer that they are maintaining that safety arrangements. 
for that safety officer will give a certificate so that safety certificate charges that safety officer will collect some charges that is safety certificate charges exempted okay then p for birth certificate death certificate driving license passport visa these are given to individuals na yes sir no death certificate birth certificate driving license passport visa are given to individuals but why is it coming under services to business entities because these are services provided to business entities on behalf of their employees a company is taking a key man insurance policy they need birth certificate of a person or claiming key man insurance policy they need death certificate of a person or a company is sending their employees outside india they need passport and visa services or a company is into transportation business and they have their employees as drivers for the drivers they are receiving the driving license etc so for that these are the services provided to whom to the business entity on behalf of their employees so what are the five certificates which are exempted for birth certificate death certificate driving license visa passport then consideration for tolerating an act this example already i told you that is tasmak audit state government you enter into doing the audit and you breach the contract for which you need to pay damages that is exempted so you enter into contract with the government when you enter into contract with the government so you have breached the contract for which you are paying the damages as per the contract so that money collected by them will be exempted then merchant overtime charges under customs customs department will be working on all days except on public holidays like gandhi jayanti independence day republic day like that except for public holidays all other days they will be working even on festive days also and sundays also as they are working on holidays and sundays so they will be paid extra charges to do the clearances because we need their services during sunday we can get their services customs department service means you imported the goods you want to clear the goods from the customs on sunday you can clear but for which you need to pay some extra charges what is that extra charges known as merchant overtime charges that charges collected by them is exempted then assignment of right to mine or explore petroleum crude or natural gas against consideration in the form of profit petroleum so there is a concept of profit petroleum and cost petroleum which you can see in the next page you can see in the next page cost petroleum and profit petroleum have a look into that what is this cost petroleum profit petroleum first government will form a joint venture with the lease holder for example reliance industries limited so they wanted to extract the petroleum crude or natural gas now central government will enter into contract will enter into joint venture with reliance industries limited and under this joint venture so reliance industries limited will invest for generation of petroleum crude or natural gas and they will sell it now they get some revenue out of that revenue they will recover their expenses that expenses what they recovered is known as cost petroleum again i am repeating so production sharing contract between government and lease holder right to extract petroleum crude or natural gas apart from royalty government receive a share of profit from joint venture so who forms the joint venture government and the lease holder so lease holder example here reliance industries limited now they are generating some petrol or diesel, petrol or gas okay crude oil or gas from the basin okay and this revenue so who is incurring the expenses lease holder that is reliance industries limited so they will recover that expenses so that recovery of expenses is known as what cost petroleum so they provide services to the joint venture they provide services to the joint venture by way of incurring the expenses and recover the expenses from the joint venture which is supply under 71aa you understood that is supply under 71aa any activity between a person other than individual and its members correct who is other than individual here joint venture who is the member of the joint venture lease holder 
So leaseholder provides the service to the joint venture and collects the money from the joint venture. So for his expenses, that is known as cost petroleum, even though it is supply under 71AA, but it is exempted. Clear? So this joint venture is exempted. So cost petroleum. Then next. So from revenue, we take out the cost petroleum. And what is the benefit government will get? Government will get two consideration. Number one, royalty. Number two, share of profit. First, they will take royalty. That royalty will be taxable. Why, sir, royalty is taxable? Please go to the above list and see fourth point. Assignment of right to use natural resources, even assigned before 1-4-2016. What is exempted? Only one-time charges is exempted. But annual royalty always taxable, correct or not? So, annual royalty will be taxable. So, government gets annual royalty that is taxable. Now, from revenue, if you take out annual royalty and cost petroleum, the balance is known as profit petroleum. In this profit petroleum, a percentage will go to the leaseholder and a percentage will go to the government. That percentage received by the leaseholder is not a supply because he is investing and taking the profit from the business. I told you, profit is not a supply. Is it clear? Then, whatever money received by the government, profit share is supply. Why? They are not investing. For who is investing here, Pa? Leaseholder is only investing. Then government is not investing. Then why are they getting profit share? Because they gave the right to extract crude oil. So for that, it is supply and it is exempted. So what you need to remember, you need to remember four points here. First, cost petroleum. What is cost petroleum means? Recovery of expenses by the leaseholder. Taxable exempted. Exempted. Super. Then, next, uh, annual royalty collected by the government. Taxable exempted. Taxable. Share of profit received by the leaseholder. Not a supply. Share of profit received by the government. Exempted. Okay, pa. Once again. Cost petroleum. Recovery of expenses. Exempted. Annual royalty collected by government. Taxable. Share of profit received by the leaseholder. Not a supply. Share of profit received by the government. Exempted. So that is what you need to remember here. So that is this point. So, assignment of right to mine or explore petroleum, crude or natural gas against consideration in the form of profit petroleum. Then, guarantee commission for guaranteeing the loans taken by public sector undertaking. So, public sector undertakings will take some loans. Those loans are guaranteed by government. As government is guaranteeing the loan taken by PSU, so, government will get some commission from the PSU. So, that commission received is known as guarantee commission, which is exempted. Then, services provided by state government to excess royalty collection contractor by way of assigning right to collect royalty. So, variable royalty is exempted. Sir, what is this excess royalty collection contractor, etc.? You can see in the next to next page, I have elaborated there in page number 119. GST implications on excess royalty collection contractor. Say this, state government of Andhra Pradesh has assigned the right to extract natural resources to measures Reddy Brothers. For that, what Reddy Brothers should pay? Royalty. How much is that royalty? 10,000 rupees per ton. Now, what is this royalty? Variable royalty. Why variable royalty? Suppose if they extract 100 tons, 100 into 10,000. If they extract 80 tons, 80 into 10,000. So, what is the type of royalty that they will pay? Variable royalty. Correct? Now, government needs fixed royalty. Government needs fixed royalty. So, they will appoint one person called as ERCC. Excess Royalty Collection Contractor. What this Excess Royalty Collection Contractor will do? They will collect variable royalty. They will collect variable royalty and they will pay fixed royalty to the government. Understood or not? So, for example, they collected variable royalty 50 lakhs 
and they paid fixed royalty 60 lakhs. Now, on this 50 lakhs, anyhow, Reddy Brothers will pay GST under RCM. Why? Services provided by government to business entity is covered under RCM. So, therefore, Reddy Brothers will pay GST under RCM on 50 lakhs. What is the total money government got? On that 50 lakhs already GST paid by Reddy Brothers. So, ERCC is required to pay GST on what? That is the point. ERCC, even though is paying 60 lakhs, but they need to pay GST only on 10 lakhs. Why they need to pay GST on 10 lakhs? Because on 50 lakhs, anyhow, the leaseholder is paying. Suppose, if the variable royalty is 65 lakhs and fixed royalty is 60 lakhs, then no GST payable by ERCC. Why? Because on 65 lakhs, already Reddy Brothers is paying GST. Is it clear? Sir, but 5 lakhs extra he paid, he will get refund. No, no refund. If it is shortfall, you pay. If it is excess, you will not get anything. Come on, we are dealing with government. You understood or not? If it is shortfall, you have to pay. If it is excess, you will not get any refund, okay? So, therefore, ERCC is exempted to what extent? ERCC is exempted to what extent? To the extent of variable royalty. So, only on the difference they need to pay GST. That is this. So, services provided by state government to excess royalty collection contractor, variable royalty is exempted. Then, national permit or state permit charges for vehicles. Like whenever a vehicle is going through a route, one state to another state, they need to get a national permit charge, permit. For that, they need to pay permit charges. So, that permit charges collected by government is exempted. Then, previously we had FSSA charges collected from food business operators like that. That point is not there now, which means it will be taxable. These are the 14 services which is exempted. Okay? Apart from these 14 services, if these 14 points are seen in the question, exempted, fully exempted. Apart from these 14 points, you need to see two general exemptions. If it is covered under these two general exemptions, then it is exempted. Otherwise, it will be taxable. Look into the first general exemption. Services provided to a business entity whose aggregate turnover during the previous year does not exceed 20 lakhs or 10 lakhs threshold limit, but this is not applicable in case of renting of immobile property. Concentrate, please. I have started one advertising agency this year. Please listen, Pa. I have started one advertising agency this year. This year only I have started. Now, I received services from government by allowing me to place the holdings on the roadside. Roadside and all, I can place the holdings. For that, I have to pay money to the government. Anywhere this holding charges is covered under the specific exemptions. Check, check. In those 14 points, anywhere it is covered. Permitting a person to place the holding, some money is collected anywhere covered under 14 exemptions. No. Now. Therefore, I need to refer general exemption. Now, what is my turnover during previous year? Zero. Because this year only I started business. So, the services provided to me will be exempted under first exemption. Is it clear? Services provided to business entity whose aggregate turnover during previous year does not exceed 20 lakhs or 10 lakhs. But this exemption is not applicable in case of renting of immobile property. Suppose if I take an immobile property on rent, this year only I started business. Whether this exemption is applicable? No. Now, second general exemption you see. If the value of supply does not exceed 5,000, for example, Taj Koramandal, so he is taking services of police department of Tamil Nadu for providing security in the weekends outside their hotel premises for which they need to pay 4,000 rupees per day. Okay. Now, so is the security services anywhere covered under 14 specific exemptions? No, not covered under 14 specific exemptions. Will it come under first general exemption? No, because Taj Koramandal turnover during the previous year, definitely it will cross that 20 lakhs and all. But it is covered under second general exemption. What is the value of supply? It does not exceed 5,000. How much I said? 4,000. It does not exceed 5,000. Therefore, it will be exempted. Clear yet? Whether both conditions should be satisfied or any one point is okay. Any one point is okay. Can you tell me what are the two general exemptions? Come on. Services provided to a business entity 
whose turnover during previous year does not exceed threshold limit for registration, but that is not applicable to services by way of renting of immobile property. Second general exemption, value of supply does not exceed 5000. Suppose if a service is not covered under specific exemptions or general exemptions, in balancing cases it will be taxable. Wherever it is taxable, it will be chargeable to GST under RCM. Correct? But one exception. What is that one exception? Renting of immovable property service to an unregistered person will come under FCM. Otherwise, everything will be RCM. Understood? So, that is with respect to this. And we have completed government services. Pa. Services provided by government. See that. So, this is illustrations with respect to services provided by government. So, whatever we have discussed before break, so related to that only these illustrations are. First point, state government of Tamil Nadu give immobile property on rent to flower vendor Mr. Rahim, whose aggregate turnover during previous year does not exceed threshold limit. And Mr. Rahim is unregistered even during current year. First, whether renting of immobile property is given under 14 specific exemptions? No. So, therefore, it is not covered under specific exemptions. Then, whether first general exemption is applicable in this case? No. Because for renting of immobile property, first general exemption is not applicable. Then, second general exemption is applicable. So, we do not have the information as to how much is the rent. If the rent does not exceed 5000, then second general exemption is applicable. So, first it is not covered under specified activities. Even though turnover during previous year does not exceed threshold limit, it is not exempted as the said exemption is not applicable for renting of immobile property. As invoice value is not available, so therefore second general exemption also not applicable. Therefore, the said service is taxable. Whenever it is taxable, in case of renting of immobile property, it will come under FCM if the recipient is unregistered during the current year. Check whether they are unregistered during the current year or registered. Unregistered. So, which means who will pay GST in this case? Government will pay GST under FCM. Therefore, the said service is taxable also as recipient is unregistered person. GST payable by government under FCM. Then, second question. State Government of Karnataka provides advertising services to an ad agency whose turnover during previous year exceeds threshold limit. Invoice value is 4500 and such ad agency is not registered during current year. First, is this services provided, advertising services provided to business entity covered anywhere in the specific exemptions? No, not covered under specific exemptions. Whether the first general exemption is applicable in this case, services provided to a business entity whose turnover during the previous year exceeded threshold limit. So, therefore, definitely first general exemption not applicable. What about the second general exemption? Value of supply does not exceed 5000. Yes. So, here invoice value is 4500. It does not exceed 5000. So, it is covered under second general exemption. Then, third, what will be your answer? In the above case, if the invoice value is 6000, then it is not covered under specific exemptions, not covered under general exemptions also, therefore it will be taxable. And who is liable to pay GST recipient? But the recipient is not registered, let it be. So they need to compulsorily register and pay GST. Because we studied now, whenever recipient is liable to pay GST under RCM, they need to compulsorily get registered and pay GST. So, these are the questions. Then, looking into the previous page, this is services provided to government. So far, what we have seen is services provided by government. This is service provided to government. Generally, government is required to do certain activities to general public or business entity as per Article 243G or 243W of the Constitution. Example, water supply, laying down roads, providing uh, you know, sanitation services, construction of roads and uh, providing some basic amenities, 
these are all the examples of services provided by government to business entities under article 243 g or w of the constitution and to provide these activities so government may not do this so government has to do but they will not do laying down road is their work but they will lay down road ah no they will outsource it to some private contractors same way solid waste management that is wastage garbage and all they need to clean but that is not that they will not do they will outsource it to one contractor like whatever work that government has to do they will outsource it to one contractor so one contractor is providing services to the government you understood what is the situation we are discussing government has to do certain activities to general public or business entities that job government did not do they outsourced it to one person so now one contractor is providing that service if it is a pure service then it is exempted example solid waste management that is cleaning this household waste garbage and all and it is a job of the government but what government did for example chennai municipal corporation chennai municipal corporation outsourced this activity to one private company called as arbazer so that arbazer company will bring their lorry will collect the waste from the household will dump it into the lorry take it to the outskirts and they will throw it there for doing this job they get some money from the government that money received by them will be exempted is it clear so pure service that is solid waste management what if it involves both goods and services composite supply of goods and services even then that activity will be exempted provided the value of goods does not exceed 25% of the total for example sanitation of streets sanitation of streets so involves both goods and service element what is a goods element chemicals chemicals used for sanitation and what is the service sanitization so they will take one equipment and they will put on the drainages and all spray na so therefore that will be coming under sanitation so goods element service element but the goods element does not exceed 25% of the total therefore this is exempted then laying down cement road in this activity of laying down cement road what is a goods element concrete cement is goods element what is the service element construction so definitely the goods element exceeds 25% of the total therefore the exemption is not available it will be taxable under fcm so three points you need to remember services provided to government in relation to the activity which government has to do as per the constitution if it is a pure service come on exempted if it is a composite supply of goods and service where the value of goods does not exceed 25% of the total if the value of goods exceeds 25% of the total taxable under fcm previously this exemption was applicable when the services was provided to government government entity or government authority but now that is omitted only when the service is provided to government exemption is available so with effect from 11 2022 exemption not available if some services are if such service are provided to government authority or government entity then when exemption is available only when service are provided to government when i say government i am referring to central government state government union territory or local authority then look into the next area that is renting services renting services there is an amendment already we discussed that amendment look into page number 122 renting divided into two broadly movable property immovable property immovable property already we completed while discussing tenancy premium can you revise it once immovable property divided into two residential property commercial property commercial property will be always taxable under fcm residential property divided into two residential purpose commercial purpose commercial purpose taxable under fcm residential purpose again divided into two to registered person to unregistered person to registered person it will be taxable under rcm to unregistered person it is exempted so this part we completed now in case of movable property we have four exemptions with respect to renting of motor vehicles look into that four exemptions exemption number 1 hiring of a means of transport i have a vehicle that can carry more than 12 passengers 
So 12 passengers means excluding driver seat or including driver seat? Excluding driver seat, passengers, passengers. Because in driver seat, if passenger is sitting, where driver will sit? Okay. So greater than 12 passengers. So I have a motor vehicle that can carry more than 12 passengers. This I am giving on hire to a state road transport corporation for which I will get some rent. That rent received will be exempted. So it is the first point, come on. Hiring of a motor vehicle that can carry more than 12 passengers. To whom it is given on rent? State Road Transport Corporation. Second motor vehicle is, I have a motor vehicle which can carry goods. So this motor vehicle I am giving on rent to a goods transport agency. Now I get that rent that is exempted. Now third motor vehicle. I have an electric motor vehicle. That electric motor vehicle can carry more than 12 passengers. That electric motor vehicle I am giving to a local authority. I get some rent. That rent will be exempted. So electric motor vehicle having a capacity to carry more than 12 passengers to a local authority. Then number four. I have a bus which I am giving on rent to a person who is providing transportation service to education institution up to 12th standard is category 1. For example, you are providing transportation service to category 1 education institution. Now you take that bus on rent from me. So you pay the rental charges to me, that rent is exempted. So what are the four renting of motor vehicles that is exempted? Hiring of motor vehicle, more than 12 passengers to a state road transport corporation. Hiring of motor vehicle that can carry goods to a GTA. Hiring of electric motor vehicle that can carry more than 12 passengers to a local authority. Hiring of bus to a person who is providing transportation service to educational institution up to 12th standard is category 1 educational institution. These only are exempted. All other renting of motor vehicles and other mobile property will be taxable. For example, I have a camera. That camera I am giving to you on rent. Taxable or exempted? Or taxable. So I have projector which I am giving to you on rent. Laptop giving to you on rent. Furniture giving to you on rent. All those mobile properties will be taxable. And it comes under FCM or RCM? FCM only. Anywhere we studied renting of furniture etc. is covered under RCM. But renting of motor vehicle will come under RCM. Provided three conditions are satisfied. What are they? Supplier should be other than body corporate, recipient should be body corporate, rate of GST should be 5%. If these three conditions are satisfied, it will come under RCM. Otherwise, it is FCM. Now, see this, there is one circular here. See the note below that, where the body corporate avails the passenger transportation service for specific journey or voyages and does not take the vehicle on rent for any particular period of time. So then it will not be treated as renting of motor vehicles, it will be treated as contract carriages. There is a basic difference between contract carriage and renting of motor vehicle. Uh, you are taking a motor vehicle on rent means, so you will be only driving it. So just the motor vehicle you took on rent, is it clear? Means self-driven cars. So you know that we can take self-driven cars on rent, zoom cars or lot of self-driven car rentals are there. You need to have a driving license. You should have a driving license. You need to submit the driving license, copy and you need to give some security deposit. They will give the car, any type of car you can take on rent and you have to pay rental per charges. That is only called as renting a motor vehicle. Now when you are traveling in Ola, Uber or some private travels, on a rental basis, not trip, rental basis. Rental basis means what? So one day for 300 kilometers or say for 50 kilometers like that, you pay some rental. So this will be coming under contract carriage. That is not renting of motor vehicles. Is it clear or not? So renting of motor vehicle means there is a motor vehicle which you are taking on rent. You are only driving it. So for a particular period of time, it will be with you like 15 days or 30 days like that, then it will be called as renting of motor vehicles. For a particular trip or for a particular kilometers, 
if you are taking the motor vehicle that will be called as what contract carriage why we need to understand this difference is contract carriage contract carriage services to body corporate will it come under rcm supplier is other than body corporate recipient is body corporate rate of gst 5% but it is not renting a motor vehicle it is contract carriage will it come under rcm no so only in case of renting a motor vehicle it will come under rcm so be careful in the exam in the exam only when they give renting of motor vehicle for a period of time then only it will be renting a motor vehicle otherwise it will be called as contract carriage contract carriage will never come under rcm it will be always fcm anywhere we studied in sir cg got salets contract carriage no so therefore that is this where the body corporate avails passenger transportation service for specific journey or voyage and does not take vehicle on rent for any particular period of time the service would fall under 9964 means what is the name of that service write down there contract carriage contract carriage and the body corporate shall not be liable to pay gst under rcm it is not renting of motor vehicle it is contract carriage rcm not applicable this is one amendment in the circular then next this one is old point only renting of precincts of a religious place meant for a general public there is a religious place like a temple or a mosque or a church etc there is a religious place that religious place is meant for general public now the precincts of that religious place is given on rent for what purpose it will be given on rent accommodation pilgrims who will be coming there for example tirumala you take tirumala is a religious place for general public yes the precincts of tirumala will be given on rent for stay accommodation for the pilgrims or devotees who are coming over there and how much should be the room charges per day so that it is exempted how much less than 1000 less than 1000 or equal to 1000 less than 1000 what if it is equal to 1000 what if it is equal to 1000 taxable more than 1000 entirely taxable you understood or not only when it is less than 1000 per day it is exempted then what other purpose they will give the precincts for marriage or any function correct or if it is for marriage function or any social functions etc if it is less than 10000 rupees per day 10000 rupees per day then it is exempted if it is greater than or equals to 10000 per day entirely taxable and what other purpose it will be given on rent shops so for shops they will give the precincts on rent if it is less than 10000 rupees per month for shop it should be taken as per month less than 10000 per month it is exempted greater than or equals to 10000 per month entirely taxable so what is this exemption can you tell me first there is a religious place and that religious place is meant for general public and that is given on rent that general that religious place is registered as a charitable trust or religious trust that is given on rent for accommodation when it will be exempted per day less than 1000 for halls hall purpose then less than 10000 per day then for shops less than 10000 per month that is the exemption remaining cases taxable then next one services by an unincorporated association or body to its members it is supply under 71 aa do you remember any service provided by a person other than individual and its members so it is supply under 71 aa if the unincorporated body or non profit entity is a trade union they will be collecting membership fees from the traders trade union means association of traders for example all jewelry shops in chennai will have one association and that jewelry shop association will be you know representing the jewelry shops with the government for example what has happened recently so in the budget so on making charges gst rate has been levied as 18% gold you know what is the gst on gold 3% including making charges 3% now so with effect from 1st april with effect from 1st april so what they did is that 
on gold 3%, weight of the gold 3%. And usually there is something called as making charges, which will be between somewhere 15% to 25% like that, making charges depending upon the jewelry. For example, necklace and all if you take 20-25%, bangles and all 15%, like that making charges is there. On that making charges, GST is levied at 18%, which means the gold price is going to increase. Then all the jewelry shops association, they have made a representation with the finance minister and requested her to reduce the rate and it has been now reduced to 8%. Okay, so like that, whenever there is some issue to the traders, they will form an association and that association will make a representation. So who are the members of that association? Traders. So each member has to pay some membership fees. That membership fee collected by the association is exempted, whatever may be the membership fee part, that is exempted. Then suppose if that service itself is exempted service, for example, COVID vaccination is exempted. If a hospital provide vaccination, it is exempted under GST. Now, the same COVID vaccine is provided by apartment owners association to their flat owners during COVID time. During COVID time, what many apartment owners association did, they purchased, they purchased the COVID vaccine and they provided the COVID vaccine to their flat owners because they could not go outside. So, this vaccination was provided. So, as the service itself is exempted, even if it is provided by an incorporated association to its members, that is also exempted. Okay. Then, resident welfare association. What is this resident welfare association? Apartment owners association. Generally, in an apartment, there will be some common expenses. Na? What are the examples of common expenses? Lift maintenance, then parking, then housekeeping, common area lighting, security, gardening, water supply, power backup, lot of common facilities will be provided. For all these facilities, how that association will get the money? In the form of maintenance charges. If the maintenance charges is up to 7,500 per month per member, then it is exempted. If the maintenance charge is beyond 7,500 per month per member, then it will be entirely taxable. Okay. So, how much should be the maintenance charges per month pa? 7,500 per month per member. For example, say one person is having two flats in an apartment and he paid 10,000 rupees as maintenance charges. What is the maintenance charge per flat? 5,000. So, it does not exceed, even though total exceeds 7,500, but per flat, here per flat is taken as per member, okay. Per flat it is how much? 5,000. It does not exceed 7,500, therefore it is exempted. Understood? Now, what if there are only 8 flats in that apartment? There are only 8 flats, pa. There are only 8 flats. And each flat, and these are luxury flats, each flat is collecting, they are collecting 10,000 rupees per month as maintenance charges. 10,000 rupees per month. Our rent itself will be 10,000 rupees per month. So, maintenance charges they are paying, like gated communities and all, usually, you know, they will provide all kind of amenities. Like inside that gated community, swimming pool they will provide, park they will provide, everything they will provide. That's why there the maintenance charges will be high, 10,000 rupees. Into 12 months, how much? 8 flats into 10,000 into 12. 9 lakh? It does not exceed 20 lakhs. You understood? So, yearly, how much will be the maintenance charges? 9 lakh 60. It does not exceed 20 lakhs. Therefore, they even though per month it exceeds 7,500, it is taxable, but they are not required to pay GST. Why they are not required to pay GST? Because the overall number is within 20 lakhs. Is it clear here? Yeah. I told you, na, first day the service becomes taxable. Thereafter, the person should be registered. Then only they will pay GST. Just because the service is taxable, they are not required to pay GST. Is this service taxable or exempted? Taxable. Why it is taxable? Because it exceeds 
7,500 per month. But why they are not required to pay GST? Because the overall aggregate turnover does not exceed 20 lakhs and they are not required to register. See that point below. If the amount charged by the Resident Welfare Association exceeds 7,500 per month, then entire amount is chargeable to GST provided their aggregate turnover has exceeded the threshold limit. Then, industrial or agricultural labor association. So, labor unions. Labor unions, who are the members of the labor union laborers? So, they will pay some membership fees. That membership fee collected from the laborers by the labor union is fully exempted. So, in case of this trade union and labor union, whatever may be the amount of membership fee that is exempted. But in case of resident welfare association, if it does not exceed 7,500 per month per member, it is exempted. Apart from these four, any other entity or association, if it is up to 1,000 rupees per month, sorry, 1,000 rupees per member per annum, it is exempted. For example, so there is one uh, club, social club, okay? One social club is there. In that social club, so you have joined as a member and the charges is 800 rupees per annum in that social club 800 rupees per annum is the membership fees taxable or exempted or exempted why up to 1000 rupees per member per annum it is not per month per annum what if it is 1500 rupees per annum entirely it will be taxable so any other association if the membership fees is up to 1000 rupees per annum then it is exempted understood so what are the five exemptions pa tell me trade union any amount collected exempted labor union any amount collected exempted then if that service itself is exempted even if it is provided by association to its members also exempted resident welfare association 7500 rupees per month per member exempted any other association 1000 rupees per annum per member is exempted. Then sports related services. So we have discussed sponsorship services and sponsorship services who is the supplier of service, organizer of event, who is the recipient, the one who pay the sponsorship money. Sponsorship of a recognized sporting event is exempted. Pa. Sponsorship of a recognized sporting event is exempted. For example, BCCI is a recognized sports body and if BCCI gets money from any person as sponsorship money that will be exempted. So let them receive sponsorship money from Vivo, example of body corporator firm or Duraply, an example of sole proprietor. So both this sponsorship money will be exempted. So what is the exemption that you need to remember? Sponsorship services provided by a recognized sports body is exempted. What if it is provided by unrecognized sports body, will it be exempted or taxable? Taxable. So, IPL is an example of unrecognized sports body. If they provide sponsorship services, it will be taxable. Who will pay GST? If the recipient is body corporate or firm, come on, RCM. If the recipient is other than body corporate or firm, it will be FCM. Understood or not? So, I am just connecting between the RCM and the exemptions. So, not all sponsorships are taxable. One sponsorship service is exempted. What is that? Sponsorship service by a recognized sports body is exempted. And sponsorship by other than recognized sports body will be taxable. Wherever it is taxable, if the recipient is body corporate or firm, it will come under RCM. Otherwise, it will be FCM. What is a recognized sports body? So, that is any body under National Sports Federation like BCCA, Indian Hockey Federation. So, these are all will come under. So, even Indian uh, sports like Indian Football League. So, these are all examples of any body or association under National Sports Federation. Then, inter-university sports board. They will conduct the sports between multiple universities. And Paralympic Committee, this is for the physically challenged people. Then Central Civil Services Cultural and Sports Board for government employees, those who work in the government, for them sports will be conducted by this board. Then Indian Olympic Association, which will conduct national games in India. Then Panchayat Sports Board at the rural level, village level, 
they will be conducting lot of sports and games like uh, kabaddi or volleyball etc so they will be coming under panchayat sports board so these are the six recognized the sports bodies if they earn money by way of sponsorship that is exempted so what are the six recognized sports bodies pa any body under national sports federation inter university sports board then paralympic committee the central civil services cultural and sports board then indian olympic association and panchayat sports board these are the six sports bodies then one more exemption we have with respect to services provided to recognized sports body that is services provided by player referee umpire coach or team manager these five people to a recognized sports body and they earn money from the recognized sports body that is exempted for the five people player referee umpire coach team manager if they get money from recognized sports body is exempted and what about others getting money from recognized sports body like selectors commentators curators etc so these other people receiving money from recognized sports body will be taxable also any person receiving money from unrecognized sports body will be taxable for example virat kohli getting money from bcci taxable or exempted ha exempted getting money from royal challengers bengaluru taxable then if you take an umpire so all umpires ipl umpires will be receiving money from mumbai indians franchise owner okay so therefore this umpires receiving money from mumbai indians team taxable or exempted ha taxable why not to a recognized the sports body it is to an unrecognized the sports body okay so then look into the next area import of services concentrate import of services already we discussed that it will come under rcm only in one case it will come under fcm what is that import of oidr services by non taxable online recipient is taxable under fcm otherwise it will be rcm same way one exemption also we have for import of service what is that exemption import of other than oidr services by non taxable recipient is exempted can you see that import of services other than oidr service by non taxable recipient is exempted who is a non taxable recipient individual trust government okay who are treated as non taxable recipient pa individual trust government correct no individuals will trust government only no yes sir no yaar individuals will trust whom government so these three people are covered under non taxable recipient who are they individual trust government for example i am an individual i am importing some services other than oidr services say some software microsoft office software service etc imported and as it is imported by individual for personal purpose it will be exempted like that okay so who is non taxable recipient individual they should be importing for what purpose personal purpose then trust trust should be importing for what purpose charitable activities then government government should be importing for what purpose that is other than business or commerce then they will be called as non taxable recipient you can see here non taxable recipient means individual trust or government okay trust or government and individual is importing for what purpose personal purpose government and trust is importing for other than business or commerce means what for charitable activities or other than business or commerce i'll give you one example you tell me whether it is covered under exemption or not okay so a limited imported facebook incorporation services facebook services marketing services so is it taxable or exempted taxable why facebook will come under oidr services oidr services always taxable is it clear then 
Suppose if it is imported by an individual, Mr. A imported Facebook services, then also it will be taxable. See, once it is OIDR service, pa, please concentrate, pa, everyone, don't sleep. Import of OIDR services will be always taxable. Whomsoever has imported, don't bother. But if it is imported by non-taxable online recipient, supplier will pay. What is the difference between non-taxable online recipient and non-taxable recipient? Non-taxable online recipient versus non-taxable recipient. Any unregistered person importing for other than business or commerce is non-taxable online recipient. And a non-taxable recipient is individual, trust, government, importing for other than business or commerce. You understood the difference? So when you need to apply NTOR, when you need to apply NTR? So in case of OIDR service, simple by NTOR ko NTR ko enna pa extra difference wo. That is what OIDR, you understood. Whenever there is OIDR service, we need to apply NTOR. Whenever it is other than OIDR service, we need to apply NTR. Okay. Now four points you need to remember. First, OIDR service by NTOR. What is the answer? Taxable under FCM. Okay. OIDR service by other than NTOR. Taxable under RCM. Other than OIDR service by non-taxable recipient. Exempted. Other than OIDR service by other than non-taxable recipient. Taxable under RCM. Clear? Now, OIDR service means what already we discussed. NTOR and non-taxable recipient. Now, wherever it is taxable under RCM, they need to compulsorily get registered and they need to pay GST. Even this supplier who is liable to pay GST under FCM in case of OIDR service is also compulsorily required to get registered. So when GST payable under RCM, they need to compulsorily get registered. Even supplier of OIDR service is also compulsorily required to get registered. You need to just remember four points. That is OIDR service always taxable. If it is imported by non-taxable online recipient, supplier will pay GST. If it is imported by other than non-taxable online recipient, recipient only will pay GST. If it is other than OIDR services, imported by non-taxable recipient, it is exempted. Other than non-taxable recipient will be taxable under RCM. Then, look into the next one, construction services. So, read the first point and second point in construction service and tell me the differences. What are the differences between first and second point? Construction of an individual house irrespective of the floor area or cost not as a part of complex is exempted. Whereas construction, repair, alteration, renovation, etc. following projects is exempted. Now, in the first case, what is exempted? Construction as well as repair, only construction. Only construction. But in the second point, what is exempted? Both construction as well as repair. Okay, both construction as well as repair, both are exempted. In the first case, what should be constructed? Individual house. In the second case, construction of rep or repair of project. What project? Housing for all mission or Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana. What is the meaning of an individual house? A house occupied by a single family. Say for example, I want a big bungla to be constructed. Now, that bungla contains eight floors. Now, whether this construction will be taxable or exempted, exempted, because this bungla is occupied by a single family. How do we know whether it is occupied by a single family? If there is only one kitchen, it will be called as house occupied by a single family. It's not the number of floors. It is one kitchen. So, if it is more than one family, automatically kitchen will differ. So, due to that reason, if there is only one kitchen, then it is called as an individual house. For construction of that individual house, if any amount is collected, that is exempted. But listen, please concentrate. Only construction service is exempted. Suppose if it is a works contract service, what is the difference between construction and works contract? In works contract, they will only buy material required for construction and they will provide the construction service. Then whether this exemption is available? No. Not applicable to works contract service. Only in case of construction, it is exempted, which means I should buy the material and they will provide me only construction service. Then only it is exempted. Is it clear? 
repairs of an individual house taxable exempted repairs of an individual house taxable repairs of housing for all mission or pradhan mantri awas yojana exempted then third point is related to tdr fsi and long term lease already we discussed that tdr fsi and long term lease is taxable under rcm do you remember i am a land owner you are a builder i am transferring tdr fsi and long term lease to you for which you will give me consideration and that consideration will be taxable under rcm but we have some exemption the exemption is to the extent of lower area of flats booked before completion certificate or first occupation whichever is earlier divided by total floor area of the project so have a look into this example there is a promoter or builder who is receiving tdr fsi and long term lease from a land owner for which the promoter or builder is paying a consideration of 10 lakhs now using this tdr fsi and long term lease the promoter is constructing commercial and residential units and some of the commercial units are booked before completion certificate some of the residential units are booked before completion certificate now i need the ratio of residential units booked before completion certificate divided by total units in the project what is the residential units booked before completion certificate what is the residential units booked before completion certificate 25 divided by total number of units in the project 100 which means 25 by 100 we will get exemption to that proportion we will get exemption on inward supply so what is the value of inward supply promoter or builder or inward supply value how much pa 10 lakhs on that 18% you apply how much 1 lakh 80000 now what will be the exemption in this 180000 into 25 by 100 is exempted what is 25 by 100 residential units booked before completion certificate divided by total number of units so to that extent it will be exempted so are they required to pay entire 180000 no they need to pay only 135000 can you tell me what is exempted come on value of inward supply With respect to TDR FSA long term lease into 18% into what by what numerator area of residential units booked before completion certificate divided by total number of units in the project or total area in the project. Suppose if they give square feet, you take square feet. Is it clear? Here it is given units, so we are taking units. If they give square feet, we will take square feet and arrive at the answer. then next one so in this long term lease it also includes so priority or preferential location charges for example sometimes what happens is that so on long term lease we pay extra amount for giving a preferential location so for the normal we will pay some lease charges but apart from that as there is a preferential location means near to airport near to metro station or near to you know highway like that some preferential location charges they collect for the preferential location charges also same treatment okay then next when value of flat includes the value of land fourth exemption we are discussing when value of flat is including the value of land when you buy a flat whether the land value is also included in that flat or not you pay only for the flat or including the land value including the land value that is known as uds undivided share of land for example there is 2500 square feet in that 2500 square feet we construct five flats means each flat will have a uds of 500 square feet which means whenever we buy the flat we get the proportionate share in the land means we are paying not only for the flat but we are also paying for the land but gst payable on land or gst not payable on land gst not payable on land so therefore they are giving one third reduction from the value of flat whenever value of flat includes value of land for example you purchase the flat including the land value for 75 lakhs from that 75 lakhs how much will be excluded towards land one third What is one third? Seventy-five. One third is twenty-five. 
which means you need to pay gst only on 50 lakhs let the land value be given separately or together we will follow the same method for example if value of land is 50000 and value of flat excluding value of land is 40000 then also we need to do the same what we need to do total it what is the total 90 lakhs in that 90 lakhs how much will be allowed as deduction only 30 lakhs one third so even though the land value actual land value is 50 lakhs but how much is allowed as deduction only 30 lakhs so remaining 60 lakhs will be taxable is it clear here so what is the fourth exemption that we have discussed whenever the value of flat includes the value of land towards land one third will be allowed as reduction and remaining amount will be chargeable to gst then next we have exemptions under igst act say this if both supplier of service and recipient of service is located outside india the said service is exempted supplier of service also outside india recipient of service also outside india both are outside india the service is exempted except one case what is that transportation of goods by vessel from outside india to india in that case liability to pay gst is on importer of such goods please concentrate listen so there is a transporter shipping company where is the shipping company located outside india and that shipping company is providing services to the exporter of goods where is exporter of goods located outside india but goods are transported from where to where outside india to india for which some freight will be collected now sir are you listening or sleeping here so where is the transporter located outside india where is the recipient located outside india but goods are transported from where to where outside india to india for that some freight will be collected correct huh? on that freight gst is payable who will pay sir sir where is supplier of service located outside india can indian government go and ask him to pay no and can they ask the recipient to pay no because both are outside india then who is there in india one importer of goods importing that goods you ask him to pay sir what if he is also not paying he will pay he is in india no he will definitely pay so therefore you collect gst from that person however this exemption is not available in case of transportation of goods by vessel from outside india to india in such case importer of such goods is liable to pay gst on transportation service clear then there is a tour operator this is an amendment for concentrate there is a tour operator where the tour operator is located india this tour operator is providing tour services to a foreign national in relation to tour conducted in india or outside india outside india then whatever money that tour operator collects will be exempted so there is an indian tour operator who is providing tour operator service to a foreign tourist in relation to tour wholly conducted outside india entire consideration received will be exempted what if the tour is partly in india partly outside india so for example a person is coming from us and they want to visit so singapore and india and they are asking a indian tour operator to provide the tour operator service so partly in india partly outside india now to what extent it is exempted tour conducted outside india is exempted so how to calculate that exemption so total consideration received into number of days tour conducted outside india divided by total number of days the tour is held so for example total number of days the tour is held is five days okay so tour consideration consideration is one lakh fifty thousand and number of days of tour number of days of tour is five days five days tour conducted outside india tour conducted outside india is three days tour conducted outside india three days now what will be the exemption one lakh fifty thousand into three by five what is one lakh fifty thousand into three by five ninety thousand or b 
total consideration into 50 percent what is total consideration 1 lakh 50 into 50 percent that is 75,000 whichever is higher or whichever is lower whichever is lower so therefore how much will be exempted 75,000 what if the number of days tour conducted is two days outside India two days then how much will be exempted so 2 by 5 60,000 so 2 by 5 60,000 so 60,000 or 75,000 whichever is lower 60,000 then there is one more point here while computing number of days tour less than 12 hours should be taken as half a day less than 12 hours so therefore suppose if the tour outside India tour outside India is 3 days 18 hours 3 days 18 hours tour in India tour in India is 4 days 6 hours ok now tell me what is the proportion total consideration 1,50,000 into what is the tour conducted outside India 3 days 18 hours, 3 days 18 hours will be taken as 4 days because more than 12 hours will be taken as full day, correct? Ah? Then divided by 4 days 6 hours, 4.5, so 4 plus 4.5, so total 8.5, so 8.5 equals to 1,50,000 into 4 by 8.5, 70,000. 588 or 1,50,000 into 50 percent that is 75,000 whichever is lower therefore 70,588 will be taken. So less than 12 hours should be taken as 12 hours or more than 12 hours will be taken as full day ok. Then this is an amendment definitely this will be tested mark my words. So, this point will be tested for forthcoming exam, this consideration, tour operator service. But when this will be applicable, this ratio will be applicable. If tour is partly in India, partly outside India, then services provided by an intermediary where location of both supplier of goods and recipient of goods outside India, that is there is a seller outside India, buyer outside India. I am connecting this seller outside India and buyer outside India. I am an intermediary, commission agent in India. Now I get some commission. That commission is exempted. Why is this commission is exempted? Because outside the country movement of goods is excluded from supply. Correct? Goods are not coming to India at all. Fully it is outside the India. On that, I earn some commission. That commission is exempted. Okay? So these are the four exemptions with respect to IGST Act. Then next one, advocate services. In relation to advocate services, so we have exemptions divided broadly into two. Individual advocate and firm of advocate, senior advocate and arbitrator. Who is an advocate? Who is an arbitrator? The one who settled the dispute through the court of law is known as advocate. The one who settled the dispute out of the court is known as arbitrator. Advocate can be individual advocate or firm of advocate. Means either they can practice as individual or they can practice as firm. If they practice as individual, again they will be called as a normal advocate or senior advocate. How they will be getting the seniority? So, High Court or Supreme Court will be giving them the designation called as a senior advocate. Okay. Now, the first exemption that we are discussing is to whom? Normal advocate and firm of advocates. Okay. Now, total four exemptions we have concentrate, very, very important area. So, November 22, May 22, they did not ask. So, chances are there on advocate services. Concentrate. So, total four exemptions are there for a normal advocate and a firm of advocate. What is that? If they are providing services to a person other than business entity, it is exempted. Means to whom they should provide services? Other than business entity means individual. Then it will be exempted. Then, if they provide service to Another individual advocate or firm of advocate, then also it will be exempted. 
if they provide services to government central government state government local authority or government agency then also it is exempted if they provide services to a business entity whose turnover during previous year does not exceed threshold limit even then it will be exempted in remaining cases it will be taxable wherever it is taxable liability to pay gst is on the business entity under rcm what are the four exemptions if they provide service to an individual other than business entity exempted if they provide service to another individual advocate or firm of advocate exempted if they provide service to central government state government local authority government agency exempted if they provide service to a business entity whose turnover during previous year does not exceed threshold limit exempted remaining cases it will be taxable wherever it is taxable it will be covered under rcm got it now compared to this for a senior advocate and arbitrator what are the exemptions that we have the first exemption third exemption and fourth exemption is there even for senior advocate and arbitrator can you see that which exemption is not there for senior advocate and arbitrator if they provide service to another individual advocate or firm of advocate then what we need to do when a senior advocate is providing service to another advocate or firm of advocate then in that case the individual advocate or firm of advocate is not treated as recipient but the ultimate litigant or applicant or petitioner shall be deemed to be recipient okay so it is not the individual advocate or firm of advocate that individual advocate firm of advocate in turn will provide service to one person na that recipient should be taken as the you know recipient for this purpose now let's try to understand this with the help of some examples kindly make note of this in your notebook illustrations on advocate services illustrations on advocate services see the first one mr arvin is a senior advocate mr arvin is a senior advocate and this mr arvin is providing services to so abc private limited abc private limited this abc private limited turnover during previous year during previous year is greater than threshold limit is greater than threshold limit what is your answer what is your answer so they provided some legal services taxable or exempted or taxable senior advocate providing services to a business entity that business entity turnover during the previous year exceeds threshold limit so therefore the answer is taxable and who is liable to pay gst abc private limited shall pay gst under rcm shall pay gst under rcm clear here understood this one next second one measures lmn and co form of advocates form of advocates they provided services legal services to measures save nature a government agency a government agency and that government agency turnover during previous year turnover during previous year exceeds threshold limit exceeds threshold limit then what is your answer taxable or exempted or exempted why firm of advocate providing services to central government state government local authority or a government agency will be exempted we don't have to check what is their turnover during the previous year therefore it is exempted 
नेक्स्ट नंबर थ्री मिस्टर मुकुंद ए सीनियर एडवोकेट ए सीनियर एडवोकेट इज प्रोवाइडिंग सर्विसेस टू मेजर्स ए बी सी एंड कंपनी फॉर्म ऑफ एडवोकेट्स फॉर्म ऑफ एडवोकेट्स नाउ दैट फॉर्म ऑफ एडवोकेट्स इज इन टर्न प्रोवाइडिंग सर्विसेस टू मिस्टर एक्स एंड इंडिविजुअल Mr. X and individual. Now, what is the treatment of service provided by Mr. Mukund? Whenever senior advocate is providing service to firm of advocate, who should be deemed as recipient? So, for Mr. Mukund, Mr. X is deemed as recipient. Correct? Deemed recipient. So, for Mr. Mukund. X is deemed recipient. Now, based on X, you interpret and tell me. Recipient is a senior advocate service. You see, pa senior advocate services provided to other than business entity is what exempted. So, senior advocate services, senior advocate services provided to provided to A person other than business entity, senior advocate services provided to a person other than business entity, other than business entity is exempted. Other than business entity is exempted. You understood here? Suppose in this example, what if ABC and company is providing service to X Limited, a business entity? Who turn over during previous year exceed threshold limit, then it will be taxable because X Limited will be treated as deemed recipient and X Limited turn over during previous year exceed threshold limit. Therefore, it will be taxable. And who will pay GST? X Limited will pay. Now, can we conclude that advocates will never pay GST to government? Yes, on their outward supply, some of the transactions are exempted, or wherever it is taxable, recipient will pay. <coughs> So advocates never pay GST to government. Then, what if arbitrator is providing service to individual advocate or firm of advocate? That is hypothetical, because arbitrator will do the settlement of dispute out of the court, and advocate will settle the dispute through the court. Why arbitrator will be providing service to advocate? Impossible. You understood. So only combination is. Senior advocate providing service to firm of advocates or individual advocate. We need to see the ultimate litigant, applicant, or petitioner as the recipient. Understood? That is this. And next one, transportation services. So we have transportation services, and thereafter, so miscellaneous exempted services. It is over. We are at the end. So please concentrate, pa. Transportation services divided into two: transportation of goods service and transportation of passenger service. Now, transportation of goods service by roadways. Transportation of goods service by roadways. Only two cases it will be taxable. That is GTA service and courier agency. All other cases it will be exempted. For example, in one Tata is. You are sending some goods from one location to another location. You will pay some three hundred rupees, four hundred rupees. Taxable or exempted? Or exempted. So any transportation of goods by road other than GTA or courier agency is taxable or exempted? Exempted. So the balancing figure for transportation of goods by road is exempted. Then railways. In case of railways, what is exempted? Transportation of specified goods by railways is exempted. Other goods will be taxable under FCM. What are those specified goods? You can see, you can see that specified goods. So we have that specified goods in three places. So specified goods in railways, correct? Ah. Then again, you can see specified goods transported in coastal waters exempted. Again, that specified goods transported by GTA is exempted. So, what is that specified goods? Here you write down. 
so the specified goods are specified goods so total six specified goods we have pa total six specified goods number 1 agricultural produce agricultural produce please write down what are those specified goods total six specified goods we have agricultural produce then number 2 food grains food grains including flours and pulses flours and pulses comma milk and salt food grains including flours flours means ah uh, that is maida aata gram flour so all those dry one because you don't think batter so batter is not flour okay so it is only the dry one only the dry ones or rice flour gram flour maida aata so that one then pulses milk and salt whether milk products are exempted transportation of milk products no only milk only milk then salt then number 3 organic manure organic manure so organic manure is used in the place of fertilizers and pesticides made up of cow dung organic manure then number 4 newspapers and magazines newspapers and magazines then number 5 relief materials relief materials so whenever there is some disasters natural calamities etc we send the relief materials na that relief materials then number 6 defense and military equipment defense and military equipment these are the six specified goods if transported by railways or coastal waters in a ship or gta goods transport agency it is exempted so what are the six specified goods pa agricultural produce food grains including flours pulses milk and salt organic manure newspapers and magazines relief materials then defense and military equipments previously one more was there that is railway equipment but that railway equipment is not exempted now so it will be taxable okay so these six specified goods transported by railways is exempted all other goods transported by railways will be taxable then water waste water waste we have domestic water waste and international water waste domestic water waste again divided into two inland waters and coastal waters inland water means river pa through river so river means so like uh, normal we have this kaveri river godavari river like that so through that river also goods can be transported but rarely it will be transported that will be exempted whereas domestic coastal waters that is using sea waste for example mumbai to surat chennai to mumbai through water waste the goods will be transported which waters coastal waters that is sea waste then in case of sea waste only specified goods will be exempted other goods will be taxable then international waters international waters means outside india to india india to outside india everything will be taxable okay outside india to india or india to outside india everything will be taxable so in case of international we don't have any exemption then airways airways domestic will be taxable and international only one is exempted what is that outside india to india suppose india to outside india taxable clear so in case of international waterways everything is taxable correct ah outside india to india india to outside india in case of airways outside india to india is exempted india to outside india is taxable only one is exempted that is outside india to india so these are the various transportation of goods which is exempted so now what are all exempted you need to remember please concentrate in case of roadways what is exempted other than gta or courier agency exempted super in case of railways what is exempted specified goods 
in case of water waste what is exempted inland waters or coastal waters between places in india specified goods okay then air waste what is exempted only outside india to india okay air now without seeing this tell me air waste what is exempted outside india to india exempted then water waste what is exempted inland waters coastal waters specified goods okay in case of railways what is exempted in case of roadways what is exempted easy so this way you need to remember so remaining and all taxable then gta in case of goods transport agency we have three exemptions previously we had 750 rupees 1500 rupees two points were there single carriage does not exceed 1500 single consignee does not exceed 750 those two points are omitted so which means now everything will be taxable only three are exempted specified goods if the recipient is individual huf ajp if they are not having factory and they are unregistered and third point is if the recipient is central government state government local authority which is registered only to deduct tds these three cases only exempted remaining cases gta service will be taxable and they have two options what are the two options fcm rcm fcm again they have two rates 12% with itc 5% without itc rcm always 5% so what are the three exemptions in case of gta come on specified goods recipient is individual huf ajp not having a factory and unregistered then recipient is central government state government local authority which is registered only to deduct tds then transportation of passenger service in case of water waste you see transportation of passenger service in case of water waste inland waters exempted pa inland waters exempted coastal waters also exempted if it is between india between places in india other than for tourism purpose for example in kerala people will be traveling by boats in river from one place one village to another village because road facility they don't have that much so therefore not every village they have a road facility so they travel by small small boats taxable are exempted are exempted because it will come under inland waters and say when we go to some tourist spots and all there will be some rivers there in the river boat will be provided okay so that will be taxable or exempted exempted so inland waters let it be for tourism purpose or public transportation it is exempted then if you have been to pondicherry there is one aro will beach and from the land to beach so the beach is like an island okay so we have to go by boat but that is what waters inland waters or coastal waters are coastal waters sea ways so that is for what purpose tourism purpose or public transportation tourism purpose therefore it will be taxable again in kanyakumari vivekananda rock and tiruvalluvar rock is there from the shore to the rock boat will be transporting the people that is what waters inland waters or coastal waters coastal waters for what purpose public transportation or tourism tourism therefore it will be taxable suppose from india to port blair so that is andaman and nicobar islands so daily one boat will be going transporting the passengers for public transport so that transportation is in what waters coastal waters for what purpose public transportation so that will be exempted now in case of waterways passenger waterways what are exempted inland waters coastal waters for what purpose public transportation super pa then airways in case of airways we have two exemptions if the starting point or ending point of the passenger is in northeastern states or bagdogra in west bengal what are northeastern states mmt and assam mmt and is manipur you can see below manipur mizoram tripura nag nagaland assam a for 
Assam. S for Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya. So, if the starting point or ending point of the passenger is in these states or Bagdogra in West Bengal, that is exempted. But this exemption is now applicable only with respect to economy class. Write down only with respect to economy class. Means what? If it is business class, taxable. If it is business class, taxable. Only if it is economy class, it is exempted. For example, I am going from Chennai to US and I am booking two tickets. Ticket number one from Chennai to Northeastern state. That ticket will be exempted because the ending point is in Northeastern state. Again from Northeastern state to outside India, that ticket is also exempted. Why it is exempted? Because the starting point is in Northeastern state. If I am travelling by business class, whether this exemption is available? No. So only in case of economy class. Then second one, amount received from government towards viability gap funding for a period of three years. That is, generally there are some airports which are called as regional connectivity airport. So whenever you are operating in that regional connectivity airport, you will get two considerations. First consideration you will get from the passenger and some amount you will receive from the government. That amount which you receive from the government is exempted. But whatever amount you receive from the passenger will be taxable. The amount received from the government is exempted for how many years? Three years. So there is a person who is into airline business and first three years for operating in regional connectivity airport, part of the consideration they get from government and part of the consideration they get from public. So part consideration received from government is exempted and part consideration received from public will be taxable. After three years also, they may receive part consideration from government, part consideration from public, entirely it will be taxable. So exemption is only for a period of three years. Now all other cases, airline will be taxable. Now what are the two exemptions for airways? Come on. Embarkation means starting point or Disembarkation means ending point is in northeastern states or Bagdogra in West Bengal. Which class? Economy class. Second exemption. Amount received from government towards viability gap funding for how many years? Three years. Then in case of railways, other than first class or AC is exempted. So what is taxable? First class or AC only taxable. First class can be AC or first class can be non-AC. Both are taxable. What is first class non-AC? Local train. First class non-AC is local train. So first class, let it be AC or non-AC taxable. Same way, AC, any class. It can be first class, two tire, three cl third class or it can be chair car. Any kind of AC compartment will be taxable. Now, what are others? Sleeper, exempted. General ticket, exempted. And second class sitting, reservation, exempted. Is it clear? Only first class or any AC coach will be taxable. What about metro, mono and tramway? Metro rail, mono rail and tramway. That is always exempted. AC, non-AC and all, don't check. Because metro by default will be AC. Okay. So, metro, mono rail means bullet train. Tramway means on the road itself they put the track, that is tramway, okay. So all these three will be exempted. So therefore in case of railways, what are exempted? Come on. Other than first class or AC, then metro, mono and tramway is exempted. Then when it comes to roadways, so GST implications on transportation of passengers by roadways, say that. So, metered cab or auto rickshaw, metered cab or auto rickshaw is exempted. Pa. What is metered cab? Taxi with a meter, huh? prepaid taxi, etc. with meter will be there. Na? That is metered cab or auto rickshaw exempted. Then, stage carriage, contract carriage. What is stage carriage which stops at every stage of its journey? Share auto, then local bus, this will be coming under stage carriage. Stage carriage, AC, non-AC. AC will be taxable, non-AC is exempted. 
So, in case of roadways, what are exempted so far? Metered cab, auto rickshaw. Number two, non-AC stage carriage. Then, contract carriage. Contract carriage means point to point travel. So, this contract carriage divided into two. AC always taxable pa. Non-AC, again, tourism or higher purpose taxable. So, other than tourism or higher means public transportation, it is exempted. So, what is the third point? Non-AC, contract carriage for public transport. So, all other transportation of passenger will be taxable. You understood? So, come on, tell me in case of roadways, what are the three exemption? Transportation of passenger by roadways, metered cab or auto rickshaw, stage carriage, non-AC stage carriage. Then, non-AC contract carriage for public transportation, okay? Other than tourism or hire. These three only exempted. Remaining transportation of passenger by roadways will be taxable. Now you tell me, ropeway, 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 transportation of passengers by ropeway, taxable or exempted? Anywhere in the exemptions? So, then transportation of passengers by cable car, taxable. Transportation of passengers by horse cart, Taxable. Balancing figure. Taxable. You understood or not? But if they register, they will pay GST. Otherwise, they will not pay GST. Transportation of passengers by rickshaw. Normal. Manual rickshaw. One person will be pulling it. Ah. Taxable or exempted? Ah. Taxable. Taxable, sir. It is not covered under exemption. Taxable. But if they register, they will pay GST. Definitely, they will not register and all. Because their aggregate turnover will not exceed 20 lakhs. But service-wise, if you see, it will be taxable. Then, aerial tramway, that is to the uphill, one tramway is laid down. Aerial tramway. Hey, exempted, pa. Metro, mono and tramway is exempted. Let it be aerial tramway or underground tramway. Tramway is exempted. You understood or not? So, tramway is exempted. Metro, mono and tramway is exempted. Understood? So, now, transportation of passengers. Come on, tell me. Transportation of passengers. First, roadways. What are exempted? Metered cab, auto rickshaw, non-AC stage carriage, non-AC contract carriage, other than tourism or hire. Waterways. Inland waters. Coastal waters for public transportation. Railways. Specified goods are the passengers, Swami. Ah. So, railways, other than first class or AC, metro, mono, and tramway. Airways. Starting point, ending point in northeastern states are Bagdogra and West Bengal. Economy class. Amount received from government towards viability gap funding for a period of three years. Okay? So, we remember what are the exemptions with respect to transportation of goods and transportation of passengers. And there is one very, 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 very important point which will definitely be tested this attempt. Last attempt they did not test it. Wherever we discuss transportation of passengers by roadways as exempted, if it is through e-commerce operator, it will be taxable and e-commerce operator shall pay GST. Example, Ola Auto and Uber Auto will be taxable. Generally, auto rickshaw is exempted. Huh? Generally, auto rickshaw is exempted. If it is through e-commerce operator, it will become taxable. Generally, stage carriage, non-AC stage carriage exempted. If it is through e-commerce operator, taxable. Same way, contract carriage generally exempted. Non-AC contract carriage for public transportation. If it is through e-commerce operator, taxable. Who will pay GST? E-commerce operator will pay. See this note. With effect from 1-1-2022, exemption not available if passengers are transported by metered cabs or auto rickshaw or stage carriage or contract carriage through an e-commerce operator. And these are the specified goods already we have written there. Then, miscellaneous exempted services, see this first one, services by way of transfer of a going concern as a whole or independent part thereof, that is, I have a business, 
that business as it is i am transferring to you now i get some sale consideration that will be exempted because transfer of business is not goods when it is not goods it will come under services so then they will ask us to pay gst that's why they have given exemption so in capital gains you would have studied something called a slump sale so that slump sale is exempted pa so as such lock stock barrel my business is transferred i get some money that money received by me is exempted then supply of services associated with transit cargo to nepal and bhutan nepal and bhutan are land locked countries so first goods will be unloaded in india thereafter it will go to nepal and bhutan so to that transit cargo if you provide any service like transportation loading unloading warehousing etc that will be exempted both to and from covered under exemption not only to nepal and bhutan from nepal and bhutan is also covered then services by way of collecting or providing news by independent journalist there will be some independent journalist who will not be working for a particular newspaper or channel they will be working for many newspapers and channels and they will gather the news and sell it to the newspapers or news channels they get some money that money earned by these independent journalist is exempted same way ha ah, fully exempted same way press trust of india or united news of india pti and uni pti and uni what they do is that they will collect the news from you and they will disseminate the news to all the newspapers so whenever you read in newspaper news article on the right side next to the news article they will give pti uni like that which means so the news channel did not go and collect the information or newspaper did not go and collect the information this information they got from press trust of india or united news of india and for dissemination of this information we need to pay some charges to pti and uni that charges collected by them is exempted then service of public libraries so public libraries what they will be doing they will be lending books for which they will collect some lending fees so in olden days there used to be public libraries where people used to go to public libraries take books on rent and that rent will be exempted but i don't know why it is given now also people go for libraries to read each other so then so point number 5 so services by an organizer to any person in respect of business exhibition held outside india that is where the organizer of business exhibition is in india but where the exhibition is held outside india because of held because of exhibition outside india what will happen we get export orders that's the reason why this service organizing a business exhibition outside india is exempted then service by way of public conveniences such as provision of facilities of bathroom washroom lavatories urinal or toilet so that 1 rupee 2 rupees we pay and use the toilet na that 1 rupee 2 rupees is exempted no need to pay gst on that okay then seven toll charges already this i told you toll charges is exempted including toll charges by way of annuity then services by performance artist in folk or classical art form of music or dance so they should be performing performance artist means what one who perform before the audience and in which genre they should perform either folk or classical okay and that to which art form either music or dance or theater for example bharatanatyam is a classical and dance classical dance therefore the performance artist who performs before the audience is exempted if the consideration per performance does not exceed 150000 however however if the consideration is received for promoting a brand that is acting as a brand ambassador then it will be fully taxable you understood only if they are acting so for the purpose of recreation okay for example this is one such club known for you know recreation purposes and here lot of people will be performing and they get some money for performances so that will be taxable or exempted exempted provided it does not exceed 150000 
for a product launch function, for a business meeting and all also, some Bharatanatyam dance performance will be given, for that some amount will be paid, that amount earned by the artist will be coming under taxable, whatever may be the amount. And here we need to see it as per performance, for a performance does not exceed 150. Suppose if an artist has given two performances, and received 2 lakh rupees, it is exempted. Why? Each performance it does not exceed 150,000. Then, satellite launch services supplied by Indian Space Research Organization, Anthrix Corporation or New Space India Limited. At present, in India, only these three people can provide satellite launch service. So, all these three people are exempted. So, what you need to remember, satellite launch service is exempted. Then, Service by way of axing road against toll charges, so this already we discussed, extra overloading charges is also exempted. What is overloading charges means? Generally, some trucks which are taking lots of goods, huge goods and all and going in a toll gate. So, apart from normal toll charges, they need to pay overloading charges. So, that is exempted. So, in relation to toll charges, what and all are exempted? Normal toll charges exempted. Toll charges by way of annuity exempted, overloading charges exempted, not having fast tag, extra charges collected is also exempted. With this, we completed exemptions fully part. See, this value of supply is actually a small topic. And we don't have that many provisions, just one section, section 15, with three subsections, 15, 1, 15, 2, and 53. But guaranteed one question will be there from this in exam so for five marks one question will be there if you are having a question paper without a question on value of supply that is not tax question paper that much guaranteed it is so therefore please be strong on the concept it's not about the number of problems it is about the concept you should be strong enough so kindly concentrate hardly we will take one hour so, we will complete this value of supply and do the problems and solutions on this, okay? So, please listen. Value of supply is given under section 15. Section 15 subsection 1 talks about the meaning of value of supply. What should be taken as the value of supply? Transaction value should be taken. What is transaction value? The price involved in the transaction. The price actually paid or payable. For example, I am selling to you a product for rupees 15,000, that 15,000 will be the transaction value. I am selling to you a product for 40,000, that 40,000 will be taken as the transaction value. So, transaction value means the price involved in the transaction or the price actually paid or payable, provided two conditions are satisfied. If two conditions are satisfied, the price involved in the transaction itself will be taken as the value of supply for payment of GST. What are the two conditions? Price must be the sole consideration. The supplier and recipient, that is buyer and seller, are not related. When they are related, already we studied related definition. That is total nine relationships we have seen now. Such persons are officers or directors of one another's business. They are legally recognized partners of a firm, employer, employee, then single shareholder holding 25% or more in two companies, or one person controlling the other, or they both are under the common control of a third person, together they control a third person, they are members of the same family, sole selling agent. In case of that related party transaction, we will not take transaction value. Then, in that case, what we will do? We will determine the value as per CGST rules, but we do not have that CGST rules. So, therefore, definitely we will take transaction value only, okay. But conditions alone you need to remember. What are the two conditions for transaction value? Price must be the sole consideration, means apart from price, there should not be any other consideration received by the supplier from the recipient. Then, second condition, supplier and recipient are not related. Now, look into this. There is a supplier who is making supply of goods or services to the recipient and the recipient will make some payment for this. This payment will be taken as the transaction value. Clear? This payment will be taken as the transaction value as per 15.1.
to this transaction value total 5 inclusions we need to make total 5 inclusions 15 2a 15 2a says any tax other than gst should be included in the value so as per 15 subsection on what will be taken as a value transaction value to the transaction value we need to make 5 inclusions so 15 2a so any taxes duties and says by whatever name called other than gst should be included in the value that's the reason why whenever we pay entertainment tax on the movie ticket or any other uh, you know stadium etc so for example you see this movie ticket price movie ticket price is 170 movie ticket price is 170 and on that there is something called as e tax what is this e tax entertainment tax who will levy this entertainment tax local authority will levy say if this entertainment tax is 15 percent then how much on 170 170 into 15 percent 170 into 15 percent how much 25.5 now, when it is GST, GST at 28 percent, while computing GST, whether entertainment tax should be included or not, yes, because as per section 15, subsection 2, class A, any tax, duties, and says by whatever name called other than GST should be included in the value due to that reason. So, GST will be computed on 170 plus 25.5, that is 195.5 on that 28 percent will be computed so therefore gst will be 54.74 will be taken as the gst so therefore while computing gst we need to include any tax duties and says by whatever name called that is this 15 2a understood pa then 15 2b 15 2b says any amount which is payable by the supplier but which is paid by the recipient on behalf of the supplier. So, supplier has to incur that liability, but who incurred it, recipient is incurring on behalf of supplier. Then it is an indirect consideration to supplier, will you agree with me? For example, say I am a finished goods manufacturer, I am, I am purchasing raw material from a raw material supplier. Actually, to that raw material supplier, I should pay. But I am asking you to pay means when you make the payment which I have to pay which is my indirect consideration will you agree with me. So any amount that the supplier is liable to pay but which is paid by the recipient is an indirect consideration to the supplier therefore it should be included in the value okay. So that is this recipient incurs the expenditure on behalf of supplier such expenditure should be included in the value. For example, so you can see here, so page number 56, page number 56, there is one illustration 3, have a look into this illustration 3, ABC Limited is a supplier and they are making supply of goods to Mr. X recipient and ABC Limited receives some design services from XYZ Limited and for the design service how much ABC should have paid 44,800 but this 44,800 who paid ABC paid ah no X has paid X has paid this 44,800 44,800 X has paid now in this case as per 15 to be that 44,800 should be included in the value why it should be included in the value? Any amount that the supplier is liable to pay, but which is paid by the recipient on behalf of the supplier should be included in the value. So, what will be taken as a transaction value? 1 lakh. 1 lakh is transaction value, price involved in the transaction. Plus, recipient incurring expenses on behalf of supplier 44,800. So, then total 1 lakh 44,800. On that 1,44,800 GST is computed. There is a mistake here. What is that mistake? So, there is double taxation. Why there is double taxation? 
sir, this 4,800 is tax. It is included in the value. On that, again, we are paying the tax. So, there is cascading effect of tax. Yes, that's how the provision is created. We can't do anything with respect to that. So, any amount that the recipient is making payment on behalf of supplier, that entire amount should be included. How much recipient paid? 40, uh, 44,800. Uh. So, that's why 44,800 we are included. What if you expire paid only 40,000? <laughs> only 40,000 will be included. So, recipient is incurring expenses on behalf of supplier, then entire amount will be included in the value. Okay. Any tax other than? Ah, that's why while taking transaction value, we did not add uh, 12,000. Whatever GST that he charged. Okay. So, okay, you mean to say in this 44,800 there is tax, but 15.2a says any tax duty says by whatever name called charge to the recipient. So, charge to the recipient should be included in the value other than GST. What is the GST charge to the recipient? 12,000. So, that we are not including. So, but any amount that the supplier is liable to pay but which is paid by the recipient should be included in the value. Full amount should be included in the value even if it is GST that should be taken. Understood or not? So, what are the two inclusions? Come on. 15 to A. Taxes, duties and says other than GST should be included in the value. 15 to B. Any amount that is expenditure incurred by recipient on behalf of supplier, recipient incurring an expenditure on behalf of supplier should be included in the value. Now, what if recipient is incurring the expenditure on his own account? Will it be included in the value? No. For example, I need to deliver the product at the gate. I delivered the product. You should take care of transportation and you paid the money for transportation. Will that be included in my value? No. Because expenditure incurred by recipient on his own account. That will not be included. Any amount that the supplier is liable to pay, but which is paid by the recipient, then it should be included in the value. Is it clear or not? Then 15 to C. 15 to C is expenditure incurred by the supplier and charged to recipient other than as a pure agent. Pure agent means what? That is, you need to pay that expenditure but I incurred that. For example, you are approaching me to file an income tax return. Now, I filed your income tax return and I paid your income tax also. Actually, who should pay income tax? Client. But who paid? So, supplier has paid. So, filed income tax return, tax also I have paid and recovered from you. Actually, that income tax paid on behalf of client will come under expenditure incurred as a pure agent. Why? Actually, whose expenditure it is? Recipient's expenditure. The supplier is incurring as a pure agent. That will not be included in the value. Is it clear or not? Then, suppose if it is not a pure agent, normal expenses like packing expenses, advertisement expenses, design and engineering, transportation, these are all some expenses incurred in the course of supply should be included in the value as per 15.2c. But this 15.2c has got some more elaboration. You can see that in page number 54. Page number 54 you can see. Expenses incurred by the supplier and recovered from the recipient as a pure agent to be excluded. Correct? As a pure agent to be excluded. This, but this will not be tested in exam. Don't worry. As a pure agent will not be tested in exam because that you don't have in syllabus. So that will not be tested. But this points will be tested. Now, remaining expenses, remaining expenses in the course of supply divided into two, that is incidental expenses, other expenses. What is incidental expenses? Without incurring that expenses, supply cannot be made, that is incidental expenses. Other expenses means even without incurring the expenses, the supply can be made, that is other expenses. Now, concentrate. You go to a restaurant. You order for dosa and they supply dosa, only dosa. How will you eat? 
you cannot eat you need chutney and sambar so chutney and sambar is an expenditure incurred by supplier incidental why incidental without the chutney sambar expenditure the product is not complete you understood or not whereas if you order for vada or vada curry etc medu vada or vada curry so that will be coming under other expenses even without vada curry the product dosa is complete but having vada curry it will add value to the product you understood or not so that will be coming under other expenses one more example pa you are attending the classes and for attending classes some fees is collected okay and you have to pay for the book also separately now in this case that book fees will be incidental other expenses why other expenses book is optional you want you pay otherwise you don't have to pay you can take it and go to one photocopy shop and you, you can get it photocopy at a price less than whatever the supplier is charging correct or not so many students will be doing that so i am not commenting on that it's okay fine ultimately so if you want to save that money you save it okay nothing wrong in that but that saved money should be really used for a productive purpose and here you will save in other place you will live okay that should not be there okay then therefore this will be coming under other expenses okay suppose if i say mandatory you have to pay this much as fees and you have to buy book also then that book fees will be coming under incidental is it clear here so incidental expenses means essential to make supply of goods or services and other expenses means not essential but adds value to supply of goods or services packing expenses where it will come incidental or other incidental ah primary packing only where it will come primary packing or secondary packing where it will come incidental for example i am selling toothpaste pa toothpaste you want to buy will you bring one bowl from your home and i will put the toothpaste there no na so tube box and all i will only supply so therefore it will be coming under incidental suppose packing as requested by the buyer gift wrap etc and all as requested by the buyer gift wrap so this gift wrap will be coming under incidental or other other so packing as requested by buyer will come under other expenses design and development charges design and development charges epdi pa design and development is for making the product na design and development is for making the product so it will come under incidental only then next uh, engineering charges again to make the product so therefore it will be coming under incidental then pre delivery inspection charges that is before delivery i will inspect the product for that i will collect some pre delivery inspection charges now incidental or others ha uh, huh? others pa because product is already complete and i sold the product also to you before handing over the product i am just checking it so it will come under other expenses weightment charges weightment i am weighing the product you purchase the product i am weighing the product and i am giving for that weightment charges are collected again it is not for the product so product is already sold but before delivery i will weigh and give that will be called as weightment charges then the transaction is door delivery contract door delivery contract i collect from you delivery charges or transportation charges incidental other stuff others not for the product it is for delivery of the product other charges now incidental versus other why we need to identify you know because incidental charges will always be included in the value let it be before the delivery of the product or after delivery of the product and before supply of service or after supply of service but but other expenses will be included in the value only when it is incurred and charged before delivery of the product for example you see this so packing charges 
is incidental and installation charges is also incidental you buy a ac so installation also i am providing means that is incidental na without installation how the ac will work you can connect outdoor unit indoor unit and you will go and sleep next to that ac no na so it has to be installed therefore installation is incidental but if you see packing is before delivery of the product but installation is after delivery of the product correct first the product will be delivered to you at your house there after installation is then as this is incidental as this is incidental as this is incidental let it be before delivery or after delivery of goods or before supply of service after supply of service it should always be included in the value understood so incidental expenses should be always include in the value don't see where it is incurred always it will be included in the value what is incidental means without incurring that expenses supply cannot be made that is known as incidental expenses okay but we have very few incidental expenses pa packing installation design and engineering charges so anything related to product making the product or supplying the service is only incidental okay next other expenses other expenses when it should be included in the value so if it is charged before delivery of goods then only it should be included in the value if it is charged after delivery of goods or after supply of service it should not be included it is to be excluded for example transportation charges example you buy something from amazon they collect some delivery charges also from you now the delivery charges is before delivery of the product or after delivery of the product before delivery of the product so whether the transportation charges will be included in the value yes whereas customization charges what is this customization charges you purchase the car or you purchase the two wheeler pa okay so you purchase the two wheeler which is in green color okay green color you purchased one two wheeler and you paid two and a half lakhs for purchasing the two wheeler okay but it is like green in color and you did not like that color after purchasing the two wheeler you wanted the color of the two wheeler to be changed yes now the automobile dealers for luxury bikes and all they will only change the color we can change the color so now you will give your bike to them they change the color of the bike say they changed it to black or red so whichever color you like now in this case this change in color they collect some money ah painting body painting they will collect some money na whether it is after delivery of goods or before delivery of goods so therefore it will not be included in the value of the two wheeler but that's a separate transaction not included means don't think no need to pay gst we have to pay gst you earn money you have to pay gst you understood unless otherwise exempted if you earn money you have to pay gst you understood or not you can give divorce to your spouse also but you cannot give divorce to gst you understood or not so every time whether you may give money so i may give money to my wife or not but i have to you know give money to gst department gst department is my first wife okay and my real wife is second wife only okay you understood what i am telling and i can give divorce to my second wife also first wife impossible pa till the time i am earning money so therefore don't think that if it is to be excluded means no need to pay gst i have to pay gst but only thing it will not be included in the value of this supply but it will be treated separately okay then so tell me what is this expenses point you need to remember expenses incurred by supplier and charge to recipient divided into two what are they incidental others incidental always to be included what is the meaning of incidental without incurring that expenses supply cannot be made that is incidental others even without incurring that expenses supply can be made so others when it should be included in the value before delivery of goods or before supply of services if it is after delivery of goods or after supply of service it will not be included now 
one more example you go to some electronic shop and you buy a tv ac etc now they will deliver the product to you at their place at their store now you ask them to deliver to your home now already sale is over you pay the money you prepare the invoice now they will ask okay which locality you are there and they will collect 200 rupees 300 rupees and deliver the product to you correct ah now is this transportation charges incidental or others others is it before delivery of goods or after delivery of goods after delivery of the goods because the sale is already over so in case of x factory sale or x depot sale etc there after if they incur any transportation charges and collect from you it will not be included in the value got it fine pa so we completed 15 to a 15 to b and 15 to c what is 15 to a taxes duties and cess other than gst should be included in the value then 15 to b recipient incurring expenses on behalf of supplier then 15 to c supplier incurring expenses and charge to recipient incidental or other expenses before delivery of goods or supply of services then 15 to d 15 to d is interest late fee or penalty for delay in receipt of consideration that is you have to pay money for me and you did not pay on time so i will collect some interest or late fee penalty from you that should be included in the value this already we discussed so interest is divided into two interest on loans advances deposits exempted interest on account of delay in receipt of consideration that will be included in the value so that is this interest point and related to this interest so there is one question have a look into this illustration 2 which is in page number 55 mr a supplied goods worth rupees 10000 plus gst of 1200 on 28 4 2021 with a credit period of 30 days non payment shall lead to interest at 24% per annum charged by a to b payment along with interest is paid by mr b on 39 2021 compute gst payable first what is the invoice value 10000 plus 1200 what is the invoice date 284 on 28 4 they need to pay gst to government 1200 is it clear understood now supplier has to receive the money from the recipient in 30 days so but supplier did not receive the money in 30 days when the money is received 39 2021 first you count what is the total number of days from 284 invoice date 284 pa from 294 you count 29 30 two days in april then 31 days in may and 30 days in june 31 days in july 31 days in august and 30 days in september please see how many number of days 155 days in the 155 days what is the period credit period given 30 days so minus 30 days 125 days so there is a delay by how many days for 125 days how much is the interest that supplier will be collecting from the recipient 24% per annum check the question properly check the question properly invoice date is 28 4 but the payment is made on 39 2021 so the number of days is 155 days and in that 155 days the credit period given is only 30 days so there is a delay by 125 days for this 125 days supplier will be collecting interest from the recipient how much is the rate of interest 24% that 24% is computed on what what is the amount that supplier should get from the recipient 11200 not 1200 it is not interest payable to government pa this is interest collected by the supplier from the recipient so definitely he will collect on the amount to due from the recipient what is the amount to due from the recipient 11200 so please take your calculator 11200 into 
24 percent into for how many days 125 days into 125 divided by 365 how much is the interest collected by supplier from recipient 921 rupees this 921 rupees is paid by recipient on which date 39 2021 so this 921 is taxable on receipt basis generally gst is payable on accrual basis but gst on interest is payable on receipt basis so when this 921 is received 39 2021 so to receive this 921 rupees is this 921 rupees mentioned in the invoice now how i will know that recipient will not make payment within 30 days i will be charging interest will i do a time travel go to 155 day ha payment not made again come back how practical it will work not possible so therefore and if I know that recipient is not going to pay within 30 days, first of all, I will not sell to them. Correct? So, practically at the time of preparing invoice, we will not know this interest. So, it will be known at a later point of time. For that, supplier should give one document to the recipient called as debit note. Is it increase in invoice value or decrease in invoice value? Pa? Increase in invoice value. Simple logic here. First, for this 11,200, what is the journal entry in the books of Mr. A? Recipient account debit. That is Mr. B account debit 11,200 to sales 10,000 to GST payable 1,200. Correct? Now, extra interest is received. For extra interest received, what is the journal entry in the books of supplier Mr. A? Again, B account debit to interest receivable interest receivable is income now so two interest receivable now b account is again getting debited correct so therefore what is the name of the document debit not if b account is credited what is the name of the document credit not so if the debtor is debited further if the debtor is credited so when we will debit the debtor increase in invoice value Decrease in invoice value, we will credit. So, increase in invoice value, name of the document. Decrease in invoice value, name of the document. Credit not. Understood or not. So, here, because of this interest or late fee, there is an increase in invoice value or decrease in invoice value. Or. So, therefore, a debit note to be given by supplier to recipient. What is the date on which debit note to be given? 39, 2021. And what will be taken as the value? 921 rupees into 100 by 112. Why? Because interest in the absence of information in the question should always be inclusive of GST. Generally, all amounts will be exclusive of GST. But interest will be assumed to be inclusive of GST. So, these are the points which I have given below. Debit not to be issued to recover the interest usually such interest should be considered as inclusive of gst and at what rate this interest will be taxable general rate 18 percent no at the rate this is included in the value pa include in the value means that value is taxable at what rate that value is taxable at what rate 12 percent so therefore inclusion in value also taxable at 12 percent so therefore we need to take the applicable rate of original supply. What is the rate of original supply? 12%. So, this 921 into 12 by 112 will be taken as the GST payable. Understood? So, what are the three points you need to remember for interest? Come on. First, debit not to be issued to recover the interest. And when interest will be taxable? Accrual basis or receipt basis? Or receipt basis. Second point. So, interest should be assumed as inclusive of GST or exclusive of GST. In the absence of information in the question, inclusive of GST. Third point. So, what is the rate of GST applicable to the interest? Original supply. Suppose if original supply is exempted, if this product is exempted, interest is also exempted. Because interest derives the rate of original supply. Now, we have seen 15 2D. 
So tell me what are the four inclusions we have seen 15 to A. Come on. Taxes, duties, sales, other than GST. Then 15 to B. Recipient incurring expenses on behalf of supplier. 15 to C. Supplier incurring the expenses and charge it to recipient. Okay. Then 15 to D. Interest late fee penalty for delay in receipt of consideration. One more inclusion is there that is subsidy. So, subsidy 15 to E. So, please check that in page number 56. Subsidy 15 to E. Subsidy is something which is actually confusing in exam. Okay. So, please concentrate. This is the place where many students are getting confused. Listen, please listen carefully. Pa. Subsidy is actually an income. So far what we have seen all those are expenses which we incur and collect it from the recipient. But subsidy is something which we will not get from recipient which we get from some other person. So it is like an income. Okay. Now subsidy is like a grant which we may get from central government or state government or others. First, we need to divide it into two. Directly linked to price, not directly linked to price. What is not directly linked to price means the subsidy is no way connected to the outward supply. Directly linked to the price means the subsidy received is for every product sold or every service rendered. So, directly linked to price means Subsidy is paid on the basis of every product sold or every service rendered. For example, for every product sold by me, I will receive 200 rupees as subsidy. This is known as directly linked to price. And I will receive a subsidy of 1 lakh rupees for setting up a recycling plant. This is what subsidy? Not directly linked to the price, general subsidy. Okay. Not directly linked to the price means it is not going to have any impact on the price. So, therefore, you have to ignore it for valuation. Is it clear? Not directly linked to the price means it is not going to have impact on the price. Therefore, such subsidy shall be ignored and not considered for value. Then what is the treatment of that subsidy? You treat it like a donation. So, donation already we discussed. Conditional donation, unconditional donation. Unconditional donation means not treated as consideration. Conditional donation means treated as consideration. Like that we will treat it separately. Which one? Which one? Subsidy not directly linked to price. If it is subsidy directly linked to the price, then again divide it into two. Subsidy from central government or state government. Actually, subsidy from CGSG not treated as consideration. Do you remember consideration definition? Check. So, consideration definition you check, which we discussed in segment 2. Consideration, so do not include. Consideration excludes subsidy from CGRSG and refundable security deposit. So, subsidy from CGSG not treated as consideration. As it is not treated as consideration, it will not be included in the value. Is it clear? Suppose if it is subsidy from others, that is recipient or any other person, such subsidy shall be included in the value. Just three points you need to remember for subsidy. Pa. Tell me what are those three points. Not directly linked to the price, ignore. Directly linked to the price from CGSG to be excluded. From other than CGSG, to be included. Once more, please. Subsidy not directly linked to the price. Ignore. Ignore. Don't include. Don't exclude. Ignore. 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 Okay. Don't include. Don't exclude. Ignore. So, when you see it, the moment you see it, di not directly linked to the price, forget that the point is given there in the question. Just to write a note. Not directly linked to the price. Ignore for value of supply. Okay, Pa? Please don't to be included, to be excluded, don't take. So, ignore. Then, other subsidy. Directly linked to the price. Divide into two. CGSG. To be excluded. Other than CGSG. To be included. Now, 
when it is to be included and it is already included what you will do as per provision you need to include it pa in the given price it is already included pa what you will do ignore you will not do anything suppose it is to be included in the given price it is not included what will you do add add and subsidy is to be excluded in the given price it is already excluded pa again you will not make any change subsidy is to be excluded in the given price it is not excluded so you will deduct you will deduct okay now see this question c limited owns a coaching institute in puri the institute charges 18000 per student for giving training in digital marketing however this training program is subsidized by different institutions as follows state government of orissa 500 per student pq charitable trust 200 per student and government of japan 100 from 100 per student now we got three subsidies what are the three subsidies 500 200 100 total how much subsidy we got 800 now there are two views which are possible in the question view 1 is price after considering the subsidy means the given price 18000 is after considering 800 which means let x be the price please remember pa this is only very very important concentrate let x be the price from that x we reduced 800 and we got 18000 this is which assumption price price after considering subsidy got it what is the meaning of price after considering subsidy there is some price from that we considered subsidy means we excluded subsidy then we got 18000 you understood what is this 18000 given price now the second assumption is price without considering the subsidy which means this x itself is 18000 means we have not reduced 800 got it whatever is the x without reducing subsidy that itself is the given price we have not reduced 800 so if subsidy is reduced from the given price subsidy is reduced to arrive at the given price that is known as price after considering subsidy if subsidy is not reduced in the given price to arrive at the given price it is price without considering the subsidy there are two views which are possible now in exam we need to check what view is given in the question if the question says the price is after considering the subsidy means what whatever subsidy that is given in the question is reduced to arrive at the given price clear ah suppose if the question says price is without considering the subsidy means to arrive at the given price they have not reduced any subsidy if the question is silent you follow first assumption only that is view 1 price after considering subsidy okay pa now if the question is silent we need to follow view 1 now we will do the answer for this first view 1 is what view 1 is what price after considering subsidy means let x be the price from that x we reduced 800 and we got 18000 so what is the transaction value 18000 correct now what is the first subsidy so state government of orissa first as per provision it is to be included or to be excluded by the per student per student means directly linked to the price so to be included or to be excluded to be and in the given price it is already so pa wow, super pa subsidy from state government of orissa as per provision it is to be excluded to arrive at this 18000 already we excluded it so ignore clear then next next second one second subsidy is what pq charitable trust again 200 per student means directly linked to the price from 
others as per provision included and in the given price it is excluded in the given price it is excluded so therefore we need to add so how much is that 200 then third one subsidy from government of japan provision wise it is to be included or to be excluded only subsidy from central government or state government to be excluded all other subsidies to be included so this is to be but in the given price it is so 100 therefore the value will be taken as 18300 understood everyone now suppose if you take view 2 view 2 what is view 2 without considering the subsidy means that x itself is 18000 you understood we have not reduced subsidy then what is the transaction value 18000 transaction value subsidy from state government of orissa to be included or to be excluded to be but in the given price not excluded so we need to deduct how much 500 we need to deduct then subsidy from trust to be included or to be excluded to be included in the given price it is already included we did not exclude already included so ignore then subsidy from government of japan to be included or to be excluded to be included in the given price it is we have not excluded means already included so so what will be taken as a value 17,500. Sir, answer will differ. Definitely answer will differ. It is not two alternatives. It is two views. So, answer will definitely differ. Now, you have to look out for the information in the question. So, depending upon question, we will take. Suppose if the question is silent, always follow view 1 by writing the assumption. So, in the given price, it is assumed that the price is after considering subsidy like that. Okay. Now, what are the five inclusions? Pa? Come on. So, these five inclusions you can remember with a keyword T R SIS. So, T Rajender, like that one person is there who is famous in Tamil Nadu, known for sister sentiment. Okay. So, T R sister. Okay. Now, section 15 to A. 15 to B because with, with class we need to write in exam. So, in exam when you are writing 15 to A, 15 to B like that and all, valuer will think for some student he is. So, he is writing with class and all. So, means he is a pro like that they will think. We only know how much extent we are pro. Okay. So, 15 to C, 15 to D, 15 to E. Now, so what is T? Tax, duties and sales other than GST or recipient incurring expenses on behalf of supplier. Yes, supplier incurring the expenses and charged it to recipient. Then I, interest late fee penalty for delay in receipt of consideration. Then yes, subsidy, subsidy from whom? other than CGRSG, directly linked to price. Clear here? So, these are the five inclusions that we have. And now, see this, some more points in related to inclusions. So, we have seen these inclusions. Look into page number 53, important notes. Only when taxes are charged to recipient, it should be included. For example, I am paying municipal tax, property tax. But that property tax I am not collecting from my tenant. Should it be included? Because as per 15 to A, any tax duties and says by whatever name called other than GST should be included. Then in that case, this municipal tax or property tax is other than GST. Should I include it? No. I should include it only when I am charging it to the recipient. If I am not charging to recipient, I should not include just because there is a tax. Okay. So, only when it is charged to recipient, it should be included. Example, municipal tax paid by property owner, 
but not charged to tenant, not required to be included in the rent. Then second point, as per rule 35, if price charged is inclusive of GST, then value shall be price inclusive of GST into 100 by 100 plus tax. So then what will be the GST? So 28 or 12 divided by 112. Simple pa, when the price is inclusive of GST, how will you calculate GST? 12 or 18 or 28 divided by 112 or 128 or 118 like that. For example, a trader charged 500 rupees for a product. GST not collected from the recipient separately. Then what will be taken as GST if the rate is 12 percent? Simple, 500 rupees into 12 by 112, that is 54 rupees. Then, next one, TCS under Income Tax Act. What is TCS under Income Tax Act? Who will collect from whom? Supplier will collect TCS from the recipient. Correct? Ah? For example, I am selling a car to you. When I am selling a car to you, I am a car dealer. I am selling a car to you. I will collect 1% of the price of the car from you as TCS and this TCS I will pay to GST department or income tax department, income tax department. Again you can take it as tax credit while computing your tax on total income. Is it clear? When you compute the tax on total income, so tax on total income minus rebate minus advanced tax, TCS, TDS, etc. So, remaining will be the tax that you will pay to government, income tax that you pay to government. Is it clear? Now, actually is this tax on your income or tax on your expenditure? I am collecting from you, Pa. Is the tax on your income or tax on your expenditure? You are buying a car. Means you are spending. On the time collecting, means it is not income tax. Because income tax is? Income tax is tax on income. Income tax, pa, means tax on income. You understood or not? So, this is tax on income or tax on expenditure. Tax on expenditure, which means it is not income tax. It is not having a character of tax. Due to that reason, it should not be included in the value. So, TCS collected under Income Tax Act is not required to be included in the value of supply. Actually, this is an exception. Exception to 15 2A. What does 15 2A says? Any tax, duty, and says by whatever name called other than GST should be included in the value. But TCS should not be included in the value as TCS is not a tax but an interim levy. Now, for example, purchase value of timber wood is 1 lakh and TCS is 2.5, rate of GST is 18%. So, amount before tax, 1 lakh. TCS will be computed on 1 lakh, 2500. Now, should we add 2500 while computing GST? No. So, GST also will be computed on 1 lakh only, that is 18,000 rupees. Then, this point already we discussed. Incidental expenses, whether incurred before or at the time of delivery or after supply to be included in the value. This example also I told you, installation, AC dealer charge 3000 towards installation of AC, such installation charges to be included in the value even though the same is incurred after supply. But sir, this installation, AC and installation you said as composite supply, mixed supply. Again you are telling in value of supply. The value of supply is different and rate of GST is different. Value of supply is installation you include. Now what should be the rate of GST? Now you see composite supply or mixed supply. So valuation is different from rate of GST. Is it clear? Only when we determine the rate of GST, we apply composite supply or mixed supply. Then, so illustration 1, page number 55. Admission to true theater is 90 rupees per ticket for a Tamil movie as well as for a Hindi movie. Plus entertainment tax 10% on Tamil movie and 20% on other languages. In the month of November, True Theatre sold 2000 tickets of Tamil movie. So, 2000 tickets, what is the price per ticket? 90 rupees. And on that, what is the entertainment tax? 10%. So, what should be taken as value for payment of GST? 
2000 into 90 plus 10 percent. So, please see how much 2000 into 90 plus 10 percent, 1,98,000. So, on that 1,98,000, we need to pay GST. Because while computing GST, we need to add all taxes, duties and says by whatever name called. Then, Hindi movie, 1,500 tickets. So, 1,500 tickets into 90 rupees per ticket plus 20 percent. 1,62,000 will be taken as value for payment of GST. Illustration to already discussed, 3 also already discussed, 4 also already discussed. Now, look into exclusions from the value of supply, last subsection, pa. section 15, subsection 3. 15, subsection 1 is what? Value equals to transaction value. 15, subsection 2 is what? Inclusions in the value. 15, subsection 3 is exclusion from the value. What is to be excluded from the value? Discount. Discount is divided into 3. See there. Discount given before or at the time of supply. What is the discount? Trade discount, quantity discount, not cash discount. Cash discount we give after supply. So, at the time of supply, before or at the time of supply. So, trade discount, then quantity discount. What is quantity discount means? You buy in bulk, so I will be giving a discount, okay, quantity discount and then regional discount. Regional discount means you are from a particular locality. So, for that I may give a discount, okay. So, that is say for example, I am also from Madurai, you are also from Madurai, so therefore you are from Madurai, so I will give a discount like that. Usually Madurai people will have very much attachment, okay. Like that they may give, that is example of regional discount, okay. So, before or at the time of supply, examples trade discount, regional discount or quantity discount, etc. Is this discount given before or at the time of supply? Yes. Means, no need to pay GST on that. For example, 10,000 rupees product price, 2,000 rupees discount. How much I am collecting? 8,000. So, GST payable on what? 8,000. So, is that 2,000 allowed as deduction? Yes. Suppose if the discount is given after supply, but the terms are agreed before or at the time of supply. Example, cash discount. Today I will invoice you and I will say, if you pay within 10 days, I will give you a discount of 3%. So, now what is a discount given after supply? But whether the terms are agreed before or at the time of supply? Yes. Terms are agreed before at the time of supply. Is it allowed as deduction? Yes. But invoice is already prepared. Then what is the document to be given by supplier to recipient to give the discount? Because of discount, there is a reduction in value or increase in value. So what is the name of the document? Credit note. Who will be giving it to whom? Supplier. Sir, in GST, debit notes and credit notes is given by supplier to recipient. Is it clear? So in GST, who will give debit notes and credit notes? Supplier to recipient. So increase in invoice value. Decrease in invoice value, because of credit not, what happens to supplier liability? Supplier liability will come down, okay? Supplier liability will come down. Because of debit not, what happens to supplier liability? Increases. Because of credit not, what happens to supplier liability? Come down. Now, listen, listen. I raised the invoice to you for 10,000 plus 1,200. Now, you would have averaged ITC on 1200, correct? Now, I will give a credit note for 5%, 560 rupees. Now, when I give a credit note for 560, 500 rupees plus 60 rupees tax component, now my liability will come down by 60 rupees, then your ITC also should come down by 60 rupees, correct or not? So, you need to reverse ITC. How much? 60 rupees, that is this. Allowed as deduction, credit note shall be issued and recipient should reverse proportionate ITC. Understood or not? Then, suppose if the discount is given after supply, but the terms are not agreed before or at the time of supply. Example, end of season sale discount. What will happen? Usually, this uh, footwear, garments, then even uh, some commodities, okay. 
like uh, watch, uh, sunglasses, etc. and all, usually manufacturer will make different, different experiments on the product. Because, you know, the style and the design, they keep on changing. Now, so in these industries, what they do, they will be supplying. For example, you take footwear. Footwear industry, Nike or Adidas or Skechers, etc. These brands, what they do, manufacturer will send some models to the dealer. Dealer will display it in the shop and they will be selling. Now, some of the models may not be interested. People may not like that. So, they will not buy. So, these models which are not at all sold is called as non-moving stock. This non-moving stock, what dealer will do, will return it to the manufacturer. Then what manufacturer can do with that? Manufacturer cannot do anything with that stock. So, manufacturer will give an offer to the dealer. Okay, I will give you 60% discount. Now, you offer the discount to your customers and somehow you sell it. So, therefore, now that shop will keep in you know, a flat 50% off, flat 60% off like that. You understood, pa? And then a person who wanted to buy an Adidas shoe and is not bothered about the model but is bothered about the price, so will definitely buy during this discount time. You understood or not? Now, now manufacturer to the dealer, it is a post supply discount, correct? Why? Already product has been sent and it is a post supply discount. Agreed before or at the time of supply? No. So, it is not allowed as deduction. Even though manufacturer gives a discount of 60%, but manufacturer should pay GST on the full amount collected from the dealer. Is it clear? Suppose if I am collecting 10,000 rupees from the dealer, even though I am giving a 60% discount, say I am collecting only 4,000, 10,000 rupees I raised invoice, I collect only 4,000 because I gave a discount of 60%, but I need to pay GST on 10,000, I have to pay GST on 10,000. Now, now, dealer to customer, dealer to customer, pre-supply discount or post-supply discount, pre-supply discount because they are attracting the customers by offering the discount. So, therefore, this discount is given before or at the time of supply. Is it allowed as deduction? Yes. So, that will be allowed as deduction because it is a pre-supply discount. Which means, suppose if you are buying a footwear, 2000 rupees, <coughs> 2000 rupees, you will not pay 2000. How much you will pay? Only 40 percent. How much 40 percent means? 800 you will pay. So, whether you need to pay GST on 800 or 2000 or 800, but many shopkeepers are cheating you, they are collecting GST on 2000. Please be careful. So, next time onwards you buy anything in the discount, so please verify because what they do is that 2000 they will charge GST and then they will give discount. Actually, GST should be computed on what? After discount, GST should be computed, correct, Papa? 2000 plus GST minus 60 percent, uh, illa 2000 minus 60 percent, then GST. Uh. 2000 minus 60 percent, and thereafter GST should be computed. Understood or not? So, this is about discount. Then look into this GST implications on debit note and credit note. So, who will give debit note and credit note to whom? So, supplier to recipient. When debit note will be given and when credit note will be given? Increase in invoice value, debit note. Decrease in invoice value, credit note. And debit note, what is the consequence of debit note to the supplier? Liability will increase. What is the consequence of debit note to the recipient? He will take ITC. I am charging some value plus GST to you, so you can take ITC. Now, where supplier has to report this debit note in GSTR 1 and in GSTR 3B. How you will take ITC? In GSTR 3B, you will take ITC. Already we discussed, ITC will be availed in one return called as GSTR 3B. Then, credit note. 
whenever credit note is given by supplier, what is the consequence to supplier? Increase in liability, a decrease in liability, a decrease in liability. Then what recipient should do? Reverse the ITC. So therefore, supplier should report it in GSTR 1 and GSTR 3B. Then what recipient has to do? Reverse the ITC. Where he will reverse the ITC? Aya, availment of ITC, reversal of ITC, utilization of ITC, all these things will happen in one return only. What is that one return? GSTR 3B. Availment means taking credit. Reversal means reducing the credit. And utilization means set off with the liability. All this we will do in which statement? GSTR 3B. Understood? What is the time limit for giving debit not? No time limit. Why no time limit? Because of debit not, what happened to the liability of supplier? Means income to government, loss to government. So no time limit. After 10 years also you give debit not, no issue. Credit not. Because of credit not, what happens to the liability of the supplier? Decreases. Income to government or loss to government? So time limit, you understood or not? What is that time limit? 30th November of the succeeding financial year. Remember, pa, this is an amendment. So what is the time limit to issue the credit note? 30th November of the succeeding financial year or date of filing annual return, whichever is earlier. Not only for this, but even there are total five situations for that the time limit is common. What are the five situations? Time limit for availment of ITC. So within what time we should take ITC, avail ITC. Then time limit for issuance of credit note. Time limit for rectification of GSTR 1. Time limit for rectification of GSTR 3B. And time limit for rectification of GSTR 8. So e-commerce operator return, TCS return. So these five cases, the time limit is same. What is the time limit? 30th. November of the succeeding financial year or date of filing annual return, whichever is earlier. So, what are the five cases? Come on. Time limit for availment of ITC. Then time limit for issuance of credit note. Then time limit for rectification of GSTR1, GSTR3B and GSTR8. For these five, the time limit is same. What is the time limit? 30th November of next financial year. Due date of return, actual date of filing annual return, actual date, they did not give due date. So, date of filing annual return, date of filing annual return means actual date of filing annual return, whichever is earlier or whichever is later, whichever is earlier, okay. Now, what is the due date of filing annual return, 31st December, they did not give that. So, you can file the annual return on September also. So, September or November, whichever is earlier, September. Suppose if you file annual return in December, November will be earlier, okay. Then see this illustration, this is how you may get a question on credit note. A limited GST registered supplier, manufacturer has supplied goods under cover of a tax invoice, 20,000 plus 5% GST. Tax invoice is dated 30th August 2020 and has been reported in written file for the month of August 2020. Sir, what is the financial year for this invoice? 30th August 2020 means financial year. For financial year 2021, what is the time limit for issuance of credit note? 30th November 2021. Next financial year, 30th November of next financial year, or date of filing annual return. We do not have the information, so we will take 31st December 2021, whichever is, which is earlier. So, therefore, for this financial year, by when the credit note should be given? 30th November. Look into the first situation. Goods are returned by the recipient in December 2020 and supplier returning the full amount of 21,000 to the recipient. First sales pa, sales returns, can we give credit not? Reduction in invoice value, increase in invoice value. Reduction in invoice value, so we can give a credit not. And what is the time limit to give credit not in this case? 30th November, but when the goods are returned, 
December 2020. So can we give the credit not? Yes or no? Yes. And whether we return full amount, how much amount collected? 21,000. Full amount we have written? Yes. So we can give a credit not. In which month we can give credit not? December 2020. Because of that, what will happen? Reduction in liability. To what extent? 1,000 rupees. In which month? December 2020. See the answer. In such case, supplier can issue credit note under section 34. He shall declare credit note in the return file for December 2020. He will get adjustment benefit. That is reduction in output tax liability of 1,000 rupees. Done. Second situation you see. Goods are returned by the recipient in December 2020. And supplier returning amount of 20,000 only to the recipient. But 21,000 I collected. Pa. I returned only 20,000. So now, will I get a reduction in liability? Why? Why? Why I will not get reduction in liability? Sir, if I have returned the full amount, then I have the incidence of tax. As I have the incidence of tax, I will get the refund. But I, when I return only 20,000, means already I collected 1,000 rupees from the customer. Correct. If I get again 1,000 rupees reduction in liability, means I am getting double benefit. Correct or not? So that is not agreeable. So only when you return full amount, we will get a reduction in liability. So can the credit not be issued? Yes. But not under section 34. Not under GST. A normal credit note can be given for 20,000 rupees. And this cannot be reported in the return. This will not lead to reduction in liability. Please see the answer. In such case, supplier can issue credit note. Is it under section 34? No, not under section 34. And whether he will declare that credit note in the return file for December 2020? No. No, he will not be able to declare that credit note. And will he get the adjustment benefit? No. Because the incidence of 1000 rupees has been passed on, to him, passed on by him to the recipient. Then, incidence means liability, burden. Burden he is not having. He already collected that from the recipient. Then next third one. Goods are returned by the recipient in Jan 2021 and supplier returning full amount of 21,000 to the recipient. In this case, pa. So whether there will be credit not possible, when it is to be issued? Jan 21. Because of which it will lead to reduction in liability. By how much? 1,000. In which month? January. Whether it is credit not under section 34? Yes. So credit note under 34, he shall declare credit note in the return for Jan and it will get a reduction in liability of 1000. Then fourth case, goods are returned by recipient in Jan 2022. Is it within the time limit? So time limit is November 21. So it is Jan 22. So even though full amount is returned by the supplier to recipient, credit note cannot be issued because the time limit to issue credit note is over. So therefore, he will declare the credit note or not declare the credit note, not declare the credit note as a maximum period for declaration is November 2021. So will he get the adjustment benefit or he will not get adjustment benefit? He will not get any adjustment benefit. Understood?